I'm 18 now, but from the ages of 3 to 11, my family and I lived in a large four-bedroom Victorian home. It wasn't really the location you would expect a haunted house to be in. We were right next to a busy street in a row of other houses, all very old though. The house had three floors, as the attic had been converted into two bedrooms, and a large walk-in storage cupboard separated the two rooms. I lived with my three older half-siblings, and so it was very common for us to swap rooms every few months. I had slept in every room, my parents' room quite often as I was terrified every night, the large room opposite theirs, and the two attic rooms. Each one seemed to have its own different type of horror. For the first few years, I was too terrified to sleep on my own. I barely slept, and when I did, I suffered from terrible nightmares, so I would sleep in a camp bed in my parents' room. That was where I had my first encounter with sleep paralysis. I couldn't have been older than six, but I still remember it vividly. A small boy with a paper bag over his head seemed to emerge from the wall next to my mother's side of the bed and slowly but surely walked around their bed toward me. I remember looking to my side and there was what I can only describe as a tall black stick figure, like one of those drawings, who was looking above me. I couldn't move, I was sweating profusely, but I knew that I was awake. The next thing I knew, he was crouching down to me, and the boy had reached the foot of my bed. It was at that moment that I managed to let out a scream. I have never had anything as vivid as that happen again, but I will never forget it. When I was seven or eight, I started wanting to have my own room. I did a lot of reading to distract myself from the fear, and often I would stay up until the early hours of the morning reading, too terrified to sleep waking up in the morning with my book still in my arms. I was given one of the attic rooms. By that point, my older sister had the room opposite mine, but she had gone off to university, so I was alone up there. I would never dare sleep without the light on, and to be honest, old habits never die, as even now I still sleep with a light on, unless I'm with my boyfriend. Most nights would be me reading in bed as long as I could, until I just had to close my eyes. It was then that the voices would start up, like there was a couple arguing in the hall. On some of the worst nights, I swore that I could hear breathing coming from under my bed. It got to a point where I was so scared, I had to have my dog and cat sleep in my room with me, but they couldn't settle. My dog would just keep crying and my cat was constantly spooked. They hated being in there so I had no choice but to remain alone. The night terrors continued. I'd wake up and I just couldn't stand to be in the room anymore. So I'd creep down to the second floor and sleep outside my parents' door. I don't know how I even functioned with so little sleep. Most times I couldn't have sleepovers as my friends would complain of being scared and hearing things. My siblings had similar experiences when my sister had her friends over, often her friend would recount waking up in the night, and my sister was sitting up in bed, still asleep, but talking to the dark corner of the room. My brother would have his covers pulled off of him at night, and my other sister recalled her toes being pinched while she slept. Everyone had their own experiences in that house, even non-believers. My dad recounted being locked out from the outside of the house when he went to the garden, even though he was the only one home, and seeing a dark shadow glide next to the door as he struggled to open it. There were times I would be sitting outside my parents' room at three in the morning, and I would hear the cutlery drawer downstairs being shaken, the TV being turned on for a split second, then turned off, even though I knew that everyone was asleep. I couldn't do anything in that house without the feeling that I was being watched. If I was alone in the house, I would stay out in the garden the whole time, but even then I felt extremely uneasy. I would sit on my trampoline and feel a pair of eyes watch me from the living room window that looked out onto the garden. 
Our elderly neighbor told my father the backstory of the house, when my dad would sometimes recount the strange occurrences going on. He told us years before we moved in, there lived a very reclusive middle-aged woman, known to be very cold and unwelcoming. She didn't leave often, only to go to work as a gym teacher. She was known to be sadistic. He mentioned something extremely chilling though, which was that she had confided in him once that she lived in fear of the house and that she refused to go into the attic because it terrified her. She died several years before we moved. One of the most chilling things was that once she passed, the house was completely renovated. The attics turned into rooms, as I mentioned. The flower beds that Mrs. Evans had taken so much pride in were torn up and everything changed. The work was mostly done by one man who had been hired to do so by the local council who inherited the house as Mrs. Evans had no family to speak of. Just days after he'd finished up the renovation, his daughter died in a freak lightning accident. I personally have no idea if it was related, but it's terribly unfortunate either way. But the neighbors seemed to think that whatever was in that house certainly did not take kindly to it being changed and decided to take revenge. That's just hearsay, mind you, but it's a little chilling nonetheless. I do believe that there were several entities in that house, including possibly Mrs. Evans herself, but the strongest resided in the attic. I felt things up there that I have never since encountered. A genuine feeling of something evil, something that wants to hurt you. I can't even recall how many times people were seemingly pushed when going down the stairs from the attic, or whenever my cat, who was usually the loveliest boy, was near those stairs, he would viciously attack you with no explanation for the outburst. The whole house had its moments. It was in a constant state of darkness and bitter cold. But the attic? I don't even have the words to describe what that was. We finally moved when I was 11, and as if by magic, the nightmares disappeared. I could finally sleep easily. We've moved several times since then, and I have never encountered a house like that again. Honestly, I haven't had any paranormal experiences at all that I can think of since being in that house, but that is fine with me. It was enough for a lifetime. I do think it will always be with me though. Sometimes I'll have the most vivid dreams that I'm back there and I'm so glad to be there. Almost as though the house in the attic is calling me back. I have so many stories of creepy things happening, so much so that I'd have to talk for hours to tell them all. But I think it's more than enough for now. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though and we bought the house. From the beginning it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold. Not to mention, it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated 
and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets, and after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room, and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom, at first, but this went on, back and forth, back and forth, for several minutes, and it was fast. It was a very brisk walk. Not to mention, next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening every night for a few weeks. And I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me, and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real, and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom, noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room, and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up, cautiously, and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, Every single covered door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence. 
and one night I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door all the way to a few feet from my bed with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, Don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mum screaming. Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed, just a few inches, and right there and then she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it. But even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it. And he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything. But I haven't. At least not yet. Is there such a thing as a good haunting? I think that's what's happening to me. I think my grandmother is haunting me, but in a good way. I don't know. I guess some backstory is required. I come from a very superstitious Irish Catholic family. So superstitious that my father would pitch a fit if somebody was sitting in his spot when the Steelers played on Sunday afternoons, or that my aunt would always throw a pinch of salt over her shoulder while cooking so as not to ruin the meal. All of this superstitious behavior was passed down from my grandmother, who all the grandkids affectionately called Nanny, and moreover from her father. Now, I never met my pop-pop Martin. He died long before I was born, but his stories have been told to me and the rest of my cousins by Nanny and our great aunts. Pop-pop Martin and Mom-mom Martin had seven daughters, my nanny being the oldest of which all were born in post-depression era Brooklyn, New York in a small apartment. Pop Pop Martin was an electrician in the Brooklyn Borough Local Union. Mom Mom Martin was a phone operator, one of those ladies who would have to connect any phone call you made by plugging holes with wires. Ask your grandparents, they'll understand. A blue collar family to say the least, where money was stretched thin to begin with all while having to wrestle seven daughters and their own plans. One of the daughters also had Down syndrome and her medical bills took a decent toll on the family as well. That being said, a story always rang true about Pop Pop Martin. He was always frugal with his money, growing up in the Roaring Twenties and being one of the millions who lived in extreme poverty during the Great Depression, along with having three daughters prior to the Second Great War. Not a penny was put out of place when it came to him. He would, however, make sure that whenever any of his daughters went on a date, whether they be in high school or long graduated college, he'd make sure to give them a dime or two, the toll for the use of a payphone in the city at that time, just in case they needed a ride home. He would always say, I won't ask questions, I won't complain about the drive, just tell me what corner you're on, and I'll be there in 10 minutes. He would say this with his voice ragged and coarse with years of cigar smoke. Since he passed, every time there was a family gathering, and the lights just so happened to flicker, my nanny or one of her sisters would pipe up with, Look, Dad came to the party too, or something like that. And nanny would always tell me that she would look where she walked, 
as if she stumbled across a dime she knew her dad was nearby, watching her. It made her feel safe in the times that she felt unsure of herself or needed guidance in any way. Nanny passed around Easter of 2018. The cause of her death was written as pneumonia, but I knew more. I obtained my CNA in high school and was the only one of my cousins with any medical experience when Nanny fell, breaking her hip right before Christmas in 2016. After a stay in a care facility for about a month, Nanny was sent home and I was put in charge by the family to help her heal. A familiar face to help her with recovery, along with a hospital-issued home nurse as well. Oh, how she would swear at the home nurse, telling her that she didn't need the help. Being a nurse herself for over 40 years and then a teacher for 15 after, Nanny always seemed to have a disdain for hospitals and other people taking care of her. That is, except for me. When I asked for her to do something that she had to do for healing, she would happily oblige. And, unfortunately for my college GPA, I stayed with Nanny, taking care of her and listening to her stories. Day after day, I helped her with her physical therapy, made her food as she could not move freely around the kitchen as she used to, and that actually helped me realize that I had a love for cooking. My favorite thing was just sitting on the couch across from her lazy boy, listening to the stories of 80 plus years of life, happily ignoring the fact that more often than not, her stories would repeat themselves. We would talk for hours about her life and what she experienced, all while briefly talking about her treatment. She was getting better, so I didn't harp on it too frequently. She was 82 and was all there mentally, and she was a fighter. That was until I noticed the days she forgot to take her medicine began to outweigh the days that she remembered, until finally she stopped taking her meds altogether. She knew that I knew. I filled her medicine box in front of her every Friday, but I didn't ask any questions. She was ready, and I knew that, and she knew that. She wasn't forgetting to take her meds. She was refusing. After 82 years of life, countless adventures, marriage to my pop pop for 61 years, five beautiful children, over 20 grandchildren, and five great grandchildren, she was ready to go. Once back in the hospital, Nanny deteriorated faster and faster and passed the moment that she was alone. Pop pop taking a phone call in the hallway and none of her sisters in the state anymore going back to their respective corner of the country that they made their families in. I was working at a diner at the time, training a slew of new hires how to properly close the kitchen, when I got the call from my mother about what had happened. The diner was only a mile from the hospital, but my father somehow beat me there. My father, Nanny's fourth of fifth, was the first person to get there, besides my pop-pop and one of my cousins, who had been down from Boston to give his final goodbyes who was driven to the hospital by Pop-Pop, so he couldn't leave with the old man. I followed my father in by a few minutes, giving him the biggest hug I ever have, before seeing the recently passed grandmother over her shoulder. She was so skinny. Thankfully, her eyes were closed, her cheeks were sunken in, and her skin was taut. Seeing someone who has recently passed is something I will never wish on my worst enemy, as I lost so much sleep, not being able to get that image out of my head. I stood over the hospital bed, saying my last goodbyes before the funeral that would follow the next week, when I noticed an odd sparkle on the bed sheets, something catching the fluorescent hospital lights. Sitting next to Nanny's limp, fragile arm was one singular dime. Since then, my father has decided that every spare dime he gets from change, he would collect and put in a jar. His were always grabbed from change he got from his cigarettes and coffee from the gas station before work. I always found my dimes in more interesting ways. More commonly, it would be in the parking lot of work where the shine would catch my eye, leading me to pick it up and add it to the collection when I returned home that night. Every so often, one would appear in a place where it really shouldn't, and there would be no way that someone could have accidentally dropped it there. I moved out of my parents' house in August of 2019. The apartment was cleaned thoroughly before I moved in, and sat empty for a few weeks. 
As I made my first steps into the apartment kitchen, setting a box down on the kitchen counter, everything sat cleanly and neatly. All except for the singular dime sitting directly in the center of the granite, as if it had been placed there intentionally. The small glass jar in my parents' house has been replaced with a five-gallon water jug, the type that would sit on top of the office water fountain. Not another coin or dollar fills the jug, only dimes. When asking my father about it a few days ago, he disclosed that he has put a dime in the jug since it switched over from a jar. And to my knowledge, I'm the only one who still adds to the collection. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy the story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. 
As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over, and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there, and my wife starts jogging at me, and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can, some coins, and keys from our truck, and zip-tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night, we heard no footsteps, and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today, and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary, and I noticed the clusters smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. I was 13, soon to be 14, when I moved into this house. I was always very connected to the spiritual world because my mom was a very strong believer, and I was very curious about this topic. 
Everything was quite normal when we moved in, even though I had a weird feeling about a corner in my parents' room. That corner gave me a feeling of fear. Whenever I came into my parents' room, I got this unwelcoming feeling and an urge to leave, but I didn't think too much of it until I started to feel like I was being watched whenever I was home alone. The first time I really thought about the house being haunted was when my mom told me that for a second, she had felt like time stopped and she heard a male voice asking for help. At first I thought she was just trying to scare me, but she was genuinely very concerned about it. Even though that was pretty scary, my mom and I decided not to pay attention. We thought that if we just ignored it, it would stop and go away. A few months passed and nothing happened, at least nothing like what my mom had experienced. I still felt like I was being watched and I just couldn't stay in my parents' room, but the energy was really off. I was really depressed and my mom and dad started to fight a lot. My mom and I started to fight too. My mom was also feeling depressed and our life just took a downhill turn since we moved. Everything got worse when one of my cats died. After my little buddy died, I started to feel the strong smell of cigarettes and men's perfume and a masculine energy around the house. It wasn't the perfume or cologne that my dad used. My mom came to me asking if I had started smoking, and I said no, of course not, but that I had smelled the same smells as well. Then my mom told me that she had started to have these weird dreams about a man. I have to admit that while I felt very afraid of what was going on, I also felt this weird excitement to know more, and I started to do more research about paranormal activity. Now I don't know if that triggered it to get worse or not, but boy did it. I was now constantly feeling observed and oppressed. Then one afternoon when I was home alone, I was talking to my friend on the phone when I suddenly heard a loud noise coming from the front door. My dog started barking like crazy, and I immediately thought that somebody was trying to break in. I slowly went there to see what was going on, and I quickly discovered that there was nobody outside. I really started to freak out. I went back into the living room and continued to talk to my friend to calm down. I hear another loud noise. The door of my parents' room had just closed itself. I opened it to see if the window was open, trying to find an excuse for what had just happened, but the window was closed. At this point, I was losing it. When my mom got home, I told her what had happened. She told me to just ignore it, that if there was something in the house, it was just trying to scare me, and that if it was bad, it would feed on my fear. I thought that what she said was just a little too Hollywood, honestly, but I still followed her advice and played it cool. A little bit after that, on another afternoon, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up with a loud A in my ear. It was the voice of my mom. And I swear to this day, I can still hear the voice of my mom in my head, crystal clear. I even thought that my mom was already at the house, but it turned out there was no one there. Then another cat died two years at the house and two of my cats had died. If I'm being honest, all I could think about was how in horror movies the pets always die. I was terrified of the house. I avoided it at all costs and I didn't like to be home alone. I just couldn't handle the fear at this point. I constantly felt watched. I couldn't even go to the bathroom at night. It's like I wasn't even living in my house. I just felt extremely unwelcomed there. Then my mom started to have dreams about all of us being dead, and we always died in the worst types of ways. I was also having very vivid dreams. Some of them I remember clearly to this day. My mom then decided to do a cleansing to the house and everything calmed down for a while. Then my mom told me that when she was trying to put my little sister to sleep, she made a gesture like she was offering her pacifier to someone. And when she asked her, she told her she was offering it to the lady. My mom completely froze and didn't say anything. I wasn't sure what to think anymore. And by now, those things just started to feel really normal. I was scared, but curious. 
and I wanted to see something, not just hear it or feel it. Through the whole time that this was going on, I felt excited to see something. Even though I wasn't sure how I would react, I still wanted it. Well, that day came when I was trying to sleep in my room. Everything was dark, and I was facing the ceiling just whispering the lyrics of a song to try to get to sleep. I wasn't thinking about anything paranormal. And the funny thing is, in the moment when things were happening, I was never even thinking about the paranormal as a cause either. But I saw this light come from the corner of my room. I quickly looked and faced it, and I felt it looking back. Even though it was just a light, I could feel some kind of presence in it. When I processed what it was, I gasped, and it moved fast to the left, then to the right, then disappeared. When I tell this, it seems like it lasted minutes, but the truth is it only lasted for a couple of seconds. It was super fast. I can't really explain what I saw. It was like a lantern, but alive. I don't really know. It was white, and unlike the other things that happened, this one actually didn't make me feel scared. I did a little Google search after that, and I found out that what I had seen is typically called an orb, and the color white meant protection. At this point, I was very confused, but I had this feeling that the thing that I had seen was not the thing that was scaring me. I thought of my uncle who passed away when I was seven. Maybe the orb was him protecting me from whatever was in the house. Maybe not. All I know is that after that, everything calmed down. This was the last event that I can remember, and it happened in the very last year that I lived in the house. Shortly after all this, I moved. But now and then I think about that home. Why could I never go into my parents' room? Who was the man that asked my mom to help and appeared in her dreams? Was it him that made everything smell like cigarettes and cologne? Who was the lady? I never got any answers to these questions. One month after I moved, I had a dream. I was in my bed and I knew I was sleeping, but I could see my room perfectly and I remember thinking that a bad entity was there. Then I saw a very bright light that covered my vision and I woke up feeling very protected. I think that was the last time that I felt like something was with me, at least at my house where I still live until this day. I have a lot of weird stories that have happened to me, but anyway, I moved to the haunted house when I was almost 14 and left when I was almost 18, and never for a second did I think I was crazy, even though nobody believed me other than my mom. And I get it, it sounds like scary movie stuff, but I hope you'll feel differently and actually believe my story, because it did happen, and I still really miss my cats. My mom bought a house when I was in the second grade. It was built in 1856 or 1857, I'm not entirely sure. The guy who built it was a prominent doctor. He had a few kids, but I don't know a whole lot about him. I do know that over the years, a couple of people died there, mostly him and his kids, but we got the house because the woman living there had lost her sister and she wanted to move into a nursing home. The house was not used to treat patients, so far as I know. There was a hospital built maybe 80 yards from us, where I'm fairly sure he did most of his work. I know that place is very haunted, but nothing malicious as far as I know. Anyway, I feel like that's enough background on the house. We lived there in the early 2000s. I was six or seven, and we moved out when I was 13. We didn't live there a very long time, the house just seemed to be bad luck. We had a dog named Snowball. He was an American Eskimo dog, 20 pounds, fluffy, and white as, well, snow. He would just stare in dark corners a lot, as would my cat. I'd hear my mom call for me a lot, but when I went to look for her, she wasn't even home from work yet, or hadn't called me. A few times, we would be in the kitchen or the living room, 
and we would hear something digging through my shoe boxes full of Polly Pockets. My bedroom was directly above the living room, and the floor was thin. When we would go upstairs to look for the cat or the dog, they were usually right there in the living room with us. The cat liked to stay under the couch, but when we would investigate, all my dolls and accessories would be thrown about my room, and the door was closed. Snowball liked to chew on my dolls, as he had a gum disease, and I guess it felt good. But he really didn't like being alone, and his favorite spot was on the green couch, where he would look out and watch the street. He was also old, and only went upstairs when it was cold. And we would all sleep in one room, because he liked the heater. Otherwise, he was downstairs. My cat did the same thing. She was often very close to us. She liked the spot on the red couch where she could watch TV. None of the pets liked going upstairs unless we were there. I spent a lot of time outside, but I also liked to sit in the office. I would play Neopets, RuneScape, and watch videos on various sites. I'd feel like somebody was watching me all the time. I'd turn around, but I was alone. Sometimes when I was outside, I know that my mom was still at work, but in her bedroom, through the window, I would see a man looking down at me. I don't remember being afraid of him, just kind of got used to seeing him. My mom would always say, oh, that's just Dr. Green. I would wave to him and he would just vanish. One night, I woke up and somebody was sitting on my bed and it was freezing as they were pulling my blanket down. I woke up mad and then panicked because pulling at my blanket was the man in the window. Then I could smell it. Something was burning. I woke my mom up and we found that the microwave was shorting out and had burnt through the cable and was on the verge of catching fire. After that, I made my grandmom take me to his grave and I'd leave flowers for him there all the time. Dr. Green was a nice ghost. He would just appear, and he only woke me that one time to warn us. Then there was Luke. Luke was malicious. He terrorized the pets. It's why they wouldn't really go upstairs. He always appeared in dark corners, and I could never bring myself to walk past him. It felt like if I did, something bad would happen. He was more active, too. Cabinets would fly open, things would fall off shelves, and he would throw things at us. In the dead of night, you could hear heavy boots slowly climbing the stairs. Sometimes the TV would randomly flip channels. You'd hear groans, and he actually attacked us. I regularly had nightmares, and I would wake up with strange bruises and cuts and scratches. This was also happening to my mom. We know his name is Luke because my mom used to record QVC and the sewing channel on the VCR. I think it was QVC and they were doing some craft thing, but they asked the caller what their name was and very clearly in a masculine voice, someone says, Luke. Then the woman who was actually the caller and was live on the show goes on to say her name and go on about the product. We were only guessing that the friendly ghost was Dr. Green as the man always appeared in similar clothing to the photos that we had of him, very nice suits and a hat. Luke was dressed in ratty looking clothing and he wore huge boots with spurs. I can still hear his boots clanging up those squeaky steps. Lastly, there was the ghost dog. I love animals, but I hated this dog. It was huge black and made me feel sick to my stomach whenever it would appear. And it appeared everywhere, outside the carport, downstairs, upstairs, and especially the cellar. I could hear its toenails clack on the hardwood and I would hide under my blankets. The hair on my arms and neck would raise and I could hear it sniffing me. It makes my skin crawl to think about that dog. If you looked at it, it would growl and vanish but I only saw it twice. I heard it all the time though. I would also have nightmares about this huge black dog following me around. It was a recurring dream that scared me so much as a kid. I'd be in the yard and there was a creek that ran through it. It went under the road 
and there were those huge steel cylinders that let the water pass. I could crouch and walk through them, but I'd see the dog there, and it was guarding what looked like a kid's body. It would immediately wake me up. I never thought to look up and see if a child had died there. I was a kid, and it scared me to even think about it, but I still see that dream vividly. I own a big black lab, Great Dane Mix, and sometimes he gives me flashbacks to that dog. I could go on and on about the odd things that happened. More happened to my mom, and she has weird pictures, videos, even called a priest to cleanse the house, but I don't think it ever helped. It may have, but the people who live there now have fixed up the house a lot. I've been tempted to knock on the door and ask them, but I feel like that would be weird. I drive past the house every time I go visit my grandparents. Also, stepping back on the property makes me feel uneasy. When we were moving out, I was packing my things. Something knocked over my corkboard, and I was frustrated because it broke. I told whatever it was to leave me alone, that I was leaving. I turned back to what I was packing, and then I heard a voice behind me very clearly say, if you come back, I'll kill you. I don't want to take my chances with the paranormal. With a threat like that, I don't want to mess with it, especially as this voice was very different from Luke's. It hissed. It made me feel sick and made the room very cold as well. Whatever this thing was, I don't want to get to know it. And I don't want to tempt fate. I live in California, and I have my whole life. As soon as I had my driver's license, I would save as much as I could so that I could go down to Disneyland at least once a year. It was a lot cheaper to do that back then, and I am a Disney freak. When this happened, I was almost 22, and I was living in my first apartment. It was in the South Bay area of the Silicon Valley. Earlier in the day, I had driven into North Central Valley to pick up my best friend at the time. We were going to Disneyland, and this was her first time. She was so ridiculously excited that I didn't even mind the fact I had to drive three hours north to go back down south again once I had her in tow. We were finally officially on our way at about 2100 so that we could avoid any traffic. We were going to make a quick stop by Isla Vista, where my partner was staying for school, to catch a nap and pack him up so we could all go together. I always took Highway 101 when I was driving down to Santa Barbara. It took longer than taking the I-5, but I honestly just preferred it. This trip was no exception. A few hours into the trip, as my friend and I were blasting Disney music to get us in the mood and singing along, we had passed through King City, and that's when I began to see strange shapes along the side of the road. I didn't really think much of it at the time, attributing it to the Tully fog beginning to settle onto the highway. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, there was a deer carcass right in front of us on the highway. Without enough time to avoid it, and probably going a little too fast, we ran right over the thing. Instantly, my car began to reek of decay. Honestly, it was horrific. Pulling over under the nearest street lamp to make sure that there was no damage to my car, we called animal control to report the corpse and pulled the putrid deer meat out of my front bumper and grill. Soon enough, and only a little nauseated, we were back on our way. I remember that I had started to feel off then, but I thought that it was just me feeling sick from the smell of the deer. At the time, I didn't even entertain how strange it was that there was a rotten deer carcass in the middle of a busy highway. Those are usually very promptly dealt with. About 20 minutes later, the strange white shapes moving, almost rolling along the side of the road, became much more prevalent. 
There was zero trace of fog at this point, and with the smell almost completely gone, the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach was only growing worse. I knew something was off, but I didn't want to say anything about it, because my friend was a little bit of a scaredy cat. Then I saw what looked like a body wrapped in gauze, rolled onto the shoulder from an embankment. But when I looked for it again in the rear view mirror, there was nothing there. I had slowed down considerably at this point, which tipped my friend off that there was something wrong. I could feel her nerves rising. When I finally pulled my eyes back onto the road in front of me, that's when I saw it, and my friend saw it too. On the side of the road, a man was standing beneath one of the sparsely placed street lamps. He was no ordinary man either. He was half as tall as the lamp, making him at least nine feet tall. This thing was wholly unclothed and emaciated to the point of almost being skeletal, but still managed to be standing perfectly straight. His hair was long, wispy like cobwebs, and his skin looked like white leather stretched over his bones. As we passed him, the only part of him that moved was his head, which turned and kept watching us. His eyes looked almost as if they were chrome metal. I kept my eye on him through the rear view mirror, watching him get farther and farther away until we crested over the hill and were no longer able to see him. In the passenger seat beside me, my friend was sobbing uncontrollably, which to me meant that she had seen him too. Not wanting to stop, all I could do was offer her my hand and floor it. I tried to get to my partner's house as fast as I could. We spent several minutes not saying a word. I wanted to say something, but I was trying to wrap my head around what I had just seen, and it left me speechless. At some point, the radio had been switched off, and the only sound in the car was her sobbing. What happened next all happened more or less at the same moment. Without even a shudder, my friend abruptly stopped crying and almost threw herself at the window control on her door with one hand, frantically trying to unbuckle her seatbelt with the other. Her belt had been on the entire ride, and she was very particular about seatbelt safety. Before she could even reach it, the window was already halfway down, and she was scrambling to keep it from lowering any further. She screamed something about not letting it take her, and eventually got the window to roll back up. At the moment that I saw her begin to move, I could hear the window was already going down. My hands were nowhere near the window controls on my side of the car. They had both been white knuckled on the steering wheel since we saw the man, except for when I offered my friend my hand. At the moment I heard the window going down, I heard a raspy, biting whisper in my ear that said, I'm gonna pull your friend out of that effing window. After hearing the voice, I slammed on my brakes and swerved onto the shoulder. By the time we stopped, the window was up and my friend was sitting back shock white and wide-eyed in her seat. I was livid. I turned to the seemingly empty back seat and in almost a growl, I spat out the words, get out of my car, you're not welcome here. I never thought that anything would answer me back but at that moment, both my friend and I heard it, the same voice that had whispered in my ear. Fine, was all it said, before we could both feel that something had changed. I floored it again, calling my partner as my friend began to sob again. I instructed him to do some warding things in his room before hanging up and desperately trying to build a protective bubble around the car. We still had an hour or so to go before we reached Isla Vista, and honestly, it was one of the longest hours of my life. Eventually, my friend became more lucid, and we talked about what happened to her. She told me that she didn't know why, but all of a sudden her seatbelt unbuckled, and she just knew something was going to try to pull her out the window. I told her what I had heard and confirmed that we both heard the response to my demand. 
We eventually made it to Isla Vista and decided to pack up with my partner and continue straight on down to Orange County. Nothing else happened on the trip down and we eventually got back to feeling the excitement for Disneyland. We all had an absolute blast, almost completely pushing what had happened from our minds. We took the same route back home as well, and we didn't see a single thing out of place. I have made that drive probably a hundred times between Disney and visiting friends and partners in Southern California, and to this day, that is the one and only experience I have ever had like that on that drive. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I have never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the 10 of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me, and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me, despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl, and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend, and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house, like it's my own, despite being there for only two days, almost 10 years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick or treat thing around the surrounding village. 
I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night, up to the old, bendy, spooky road you take up to the house, and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. This scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around but it still freaks me out to this very day. I am a part-time custodian for the town that I live in, and I only work when I'm needed. I have pretty much worked at every school in the district, including the middle school that I attended. It's a fairly old school, built in the early 60s, and is actually being torn down in about a year to make room for the new middle school that will be replacing it. I love that school, and I never want to see it go, but it's kind of a dump. But every time I get the opportunity to go back and work there again, I always accept it. I have always been a firm believer in ghosts, and I've had a handful of experiences but I've never experienced anything at that building before, until last winter. I was working a three-night stint at the old middle school on the second floor, from about 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Quite frankly, I didn't need seven hours to go about the nightly routine of cleaning, but I was fine with that. On the first night, I went about my business knowing I could pace myself, but I was still flying through my work. I'm not overly social when I work night shifts. I actually like them better because most people are gone by 5 p.m. and I can just have my headphones in and listen to music, podcasts, or whatever. It was probably about 5 p.m. when I was sweeping the classroom floors in the science wing. All of the doors were shut and locked, which is mandatory in the science wing, with the light shut off in the rooms, meaning that all the teachers had gone home for the night. Now this detail is important. I have a system when it comes to cleaning rooms, and it's very simple. When I've done everything that needs to be done in a room, I shut the lights off in that room. But when I know that I have to go back into a room for whatever reason, 
whether it be a stain on the floor that needs to be mopped or a rug that needs to be vacuumed, I leave the lights on in that room as a reminder to circle back at some point. There was one room in that wing that needed a wet mop pretty badly, so I left the lights on and the door open, and I figured that when I was cleaning the bathroom floors in that wing later on, I would make a stop in that room and give it a quick mop. At this point, it's probably about 7 p.m., and I've just finished taking a break with my coworker Jeff, who works on the first floor. I go upstairs to my closet and gather my bathroom cleaning supplies. About 30 minutes later, I make my way back to the science wing to clean the bathrooms and that classroom floor. When I get down to the classroom, I notice that not only is the door shut with the lights off, but the door is locked. Now I know this wasn't me. I never close the classroom doors until I go around to shut the hallway lights off at the very end of the night just in case I need to go back into a room. I'm also positive that no teachers were left in the building. I unlock the door and the lights are flipped in the off position, so I flip them back on. I immediately ran downstairs to ask Jeff if he had been in the science wing at all in the last hour, and he said no. I asked if there had been any teachers meeting in the main office or the teacher's lounge, and the answer was also no. I told him what happened, and he wasn't surprised at all, saying he thinks that building is haunted. We talked for another minute or two, and I went back upstairs to the classroom. And what do you know, the lights are off again. I always try to debunk every experience that I have, but I cannot for the life of me think of anything that would have caused these things to happen. It was the middle of December, and the building was always cold, so there were no windows open and I made sure of that. I have no explanations for the light flipping off twice, and no explanation for the door locking on its own. I walk around the entire upstairs, looking in every classroom, trying to find any sign that some teachers could have still been in the building, but I found nothing. I went back to mop the classroom floor and finish the rest of my work for the night. Night two was uneventful, but night three, in my opinion, was the most eventful. The whole night, I had this feeling of somebody watching me, and not your normal feeling of being watched, but more like I was being followed, especially once all of the faculty and students were gone. One could normally chalk this up to paranoia, but this feeling only worsened. I thought I heard footsteps around me a few times, not heavy footsteps. They were more like light shuffling. I ended up back at the science wing bathrooms. Now these bathrooms are faculty only, and the doors are always shut. They both open just simply by pushing on the door, no knobs or levers to turn. But the women's room on the left doesn't normally shut all the way. It stays propped open on its own about half an inch, unless you forcefully pull it all the way closed. I always start with the men's room on the right. I go in and out of the boys' room a few times to grab things off my cart. At one point, I open the boys' room door and take two or three steps in, when suddenly the door to the girls' room slams shut. It wasn't just a normal slam. This was loud to the point where I jumped, and I don't scare easily. I go back into the hall and the door is all the way shut. I open the door to the girls' room, certain that nobody's actually in there, but just to be safe, I do my normal, hello, is anyone in there? Custodial needs to come in, with the door just cracked open. No response. I open the door fully, and both stalls are open and there's nobody inside. I lean back into the hallway and I shout for Jeff, thinking that he's somehow pulling a prank on me, slamming the door and then running into a nearby classroom or something. But then it occurred to me, these bathrooms are pretty far removed from any classrooms in both directions. If it was Jeff or a kid or anybody playing a prank, I would have seen them. A few seconds after shouting to whoever may have been listening, I swear I heard faint whispers. The problem was, I couldn't tell which direction they were coming from. It was like they were all around me. I asked them to speak up, and they suddenly went silent. 
I must have spent 10 minutes playing with that door, trying to figure out what could have caused it to slam so hard. There are no windows that could have blown it shut, and the only vent in the room is on the other side of the room, and it doesn't blow hard enough to move the door with that kind of force, if at all. I quickly finished my work in the bathrooms, and I swept the hallway floors so I could finish up for the night. Once I was finished, I took one final walk around to shut off any classroom lights and lock any doors that might have been left open. I also went to shut off the hallway lights. While doing this, I made sure that I did not have my headphones in. If something wanted my attention, I was going to make sure they got it. Nothing happened while I made my final rounds upstairs, so I went downstairs to find Jeff. I asked him about the bathroom door slamming and where he was around that time. He told me he was in the sixth grade classrooms by the kitchen, which is on the first floor and on the opposite side of the building. He also said that he had never experienced the bathroom door do anything weird before, but then again, he never really worked in the upstairs wings before. I walked with Jeff talking to him about random stuff as he went around shutting off the lights. It's probably around 9.15 at this point. Yes, we were there a little late at this point, but we didn't really mind. As we made our way down near the music wing, something urged me to look back down the hall from which we'd come, so I did just that. I turned to look, and I still get chills and smile like a madman when I think about what I saw. I saw a dark gray transparent figure, shaped like a person, walking from left to right down the hall toward the gym. I immediately start running down the hall to try to see it again. But I played it off to Jeff like I thought I saw a real person and was going to direct them out of the building. But I know what I saw. There were no people in the building. There were no basketball practices, no extracurriculars going on that late. And there should have been absolutely nobody else in the building at all. I turn the corner and I don't see anybody. I check all the bathrooms and there's no one. I checked farther down the hall around the corner and there was nothing. I looked outside to the front plaza, but there wasn't a soul, no people, no cars, nothing. At this point, I honestly got teary eyed, but not because I was upset or scared, because I was happy. To that point in my life, those were the most intense experiences I had ever had with the paranormal. I firmly believed that someone was trying to contact me over those three days. Jeff and I finished up and went home. I have since been back to that school a handful of times, but unfortunately I have never had any truly great experiences like I did those three nights, other than the shadows that we all sometimes see out of the corners of our eyes, but who really knows for sure if those are spirits. They were nothing like the walking figure that I saw, so I chalked them up to my mind playing tricks on me. But like I said, who could be sure? The woman who normally works the upstairs wing of that school doesn't believe my stories. She's worked there for 11 years and says she's never experienced anything in that building before. But she's also one of the most closed-minded people I've ever met. She doesn't believe in ghosts and won't even ponder the idea of aliens or life outside of our planet. She says that I only saw what I wanted to see and that my experience was what I wanted to experience. Quite frankly, I think that's bold. My theory is that since I was clearly interested in what the spirit or spirits were doing, given that I would spend significant amounts of time trying to debunk my experiences, they tried to keep my attention. Almost like they were all starved for attention. I also think it's possible that since I was in a middle school, the spirit or spirits may have been those of middle school aged kids, and they were probably just doing juvenile pranks to mess with me. When I called for the voices I was hearing, they went silent. Kind of like how students sometimes do when they get yelled at for talking during a test or something. It's all a theory, but I think those ideas make sense, and I hope that they make sense to whoever's hearing this. I know these aren't the scariest encounters, but they're very near and dear to me. 
Like I said, I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had some smaller encounters with what I believe were ghosts. But up until that point in my life, those were the most intense encounters I'd ever had. I've had some more encounters recently, some at another school that I believe is haunted, and maybe I'll tell those stories sometime. But for now, I'll leave it here. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling, rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory anyway. One of the boys groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot well out of sight of the group on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck 
which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away, and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off, and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. But mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later, to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks and none of them went missing. And then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back. Only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. 
As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? It's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things it will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble, and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter, and I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. 
I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream, about a hundred yards, and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold, like really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp, but Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out, like it's out cold, and it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle? And I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek. Like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks. 
and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie. But she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off and that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. Ghost stories have always been a love-hate situation for me. I've always enjoyed the unexplained as entertainment, but as with street magic, I find myself focusing on figuring out the plausible explanations 
instead of enjoying the experience. I would hear stories from friends and family, and I would respond with skepticism, probing questions, and a look of disbelief. Today, I look back on this behavior with a moderate amount of shame, because decades after my mission trip to a small city in Florida, I question what happened to me, and I recognize that look of disbelief in the faces of listeners as they listen to my own story. I was not raised in a religious family. I like to think of myself as an analytical person, and I try to rely on evidence for most of my beliefs. Growing up in Midwestern Michigan, there was a time in my adolescence that I'm sure many people experience. A time when I was looking for some place to belong. While many teenagers drive their parents nuts by surrounding themselves with drinking and drugs, my rebellion was in the form of a church in my hometown. It had a pretty robust youth group and they accepted me quickly. It was a safe place, a community that acted like a family I could confide in. I threw myself into it and spent a few years being embroiled in everything they did. So much so that my parents questioned whether or not I was in a cult. This prolonged encounter with the church was an important step along my personal development journey and would also become the catalyst for one of the most frightening moments of my life. This was during a mission trip that we took to Sarasota, Florida in the summer of 1997. Sarasota is a small city with a population of little more than 50,000 people. The city was very socio-economically divided, being populated by the very rich and the very poor. The mission trip was located at a modest Baptist church within the city. The purpose was to conduct a vacation Bible school, or VBS, for the children that lived in the neighborhood, mostly economically disadvantaged youth. I knew nothing else about the church. We were given no information about the congregation or their beliefs ahead of time. The only background provided was that our youth pastor, David, made contact with this small church and agreed to donate our time to help coordinate the VBS program. I was relatively close with several of the people on the trip. However, we were joined by a student who was not a part of our youth group named Alvin. I don't remember exactly why he came, as I was never close to him, but I remember being told that Al's mother wanted him to be a Christian, in contrast to their heritage, an idea that at the time he seemed to be very disinterested in. A dry, straight-laced young man, he was almost an opposite personality of my friends and me, largely immature, outgoing goof-offs that were all looking for attention. Nevertheless, he attended the trip with the rest of us, we all loaded onto the bus and headed south. We arrived in Sarasota and got to work. The first part of the trip was pretty uneventful. Nothing seemed unusual. We worked, teaching certain classes ranging in topics that a normal, non-denominational Christian Sunday school would teach. It wasn't until the last couple of days where the trip started going off the rails. Close to dusk, the second to the last day of the trip, our group was outside, playing kickball with the children, while we waited for their parents to pick them up. It was a hot summer day in Florida, so many of us Michigan kids were not used to the humid, hot evenings that followed. I decided to go into the church and get a drink to cool down, escaping the large number of gnats that constantly accosted me whenever I stepped outside. The church itself was made out of white plaster, a common style for Florida. The exterior was peeling, but the inside seemed to have been cared for meticulously. The dark green carpet was everywhere except for the chapel, which itself was burgundy with gold designs. The building of the church was shaped like a T. You entered the double doors at the bottom of the T. The long hallway had an extended mirror, which was attached to one wall, and a sitting bench was on the other. There was wooden bedboard type paneling that went halfway up the wall to the mirror. As you continued down the hall at the T-junction, you could take a left and walk into the chapel, or you could go right and walk into a large dining room area that was filled with tables. I walked through the doors at the bottom of the T, 
and, as teenagers are wont to do, I glanced at the mirror to check my own reflection. Check the outfit, the hair, the overall appearance. Adolescence is a vain time. Anyway, as I looked in the mirror, I saw Alvin sitting in the bench opposite the mirror, just looking at me. I quickly questioned what he was doing inside away from everyone else. Hey Al, what are you doing man? Don't like kickball. And as I'm saying it, interrupting my sentence, he smiled in what felt like a disingenuous, menacing simper. He then raised his hand, formed a gun-shaped gesture, and winked while pointing it at me, clicking his tongue to make a sound. He was acting in a way that seemed uncharacteristic for who I knew Alvin to be. I chuckled and turned away from the mirror to speak to him, and as I did that, I realized there was nobody there. I looked back to the mirror to confirm that I was alone in the hallway. I didn't understand. I didn't just see him out of the corner of my eye. I mean, at first I did. But then I looked him right into the eyes, with the mirror simply acting as a conduit. I heard the sound of his tongue, making what would soon be a familiar clicking sound. When the images of Al disappeared, the fright washed over me in what seemed to be similar to a panic attack, a tingling that transformed my warm body into a shaky, nervous husk of who I usually was. I ran outside and grabbed the first person I came into contact with, my friend Ronnie. Ronnie and I were not extremely close, but we had fun together because we were both outgoing, obnoxious, overconfident males that focused more on fun than the purpose of our visit. When I approached him, I immediately saw in his eyes that he knew something was wrong. Dude, I don't know what's happening. I just saw something super weird. I feel like I'm losing my mind. What happened? Ronnie asked, starting to smile with some humor at how freaked out I seemed. I don't... I just... I walked inside and looked in the mirror to see Al just sitting there and smiling at me, but it wasn't Al. It, it looked like him, but when I started talking to him, he just stared at me and made this gesture. At this point, I showed him the finger-pointing, winking gesture. Something about the way that I had recreated the look seemed to take the smile off Ronnie's face. But then when I started talking to him, I, I turned around to continue the conversation. Al wasn't there. He wasn't there. As if we were thinking the exact same thing, we turned to look to find where Alvin was at that moment. Our eyes scanned the crowd in opposite directions, both arriving at the same point where Al sat watching the kickball game. He was not partaking, as I remember him to be a sober, pensive kid, not the kickball type, and definitely not one who would have given me some weird pointing gesture while winking. Al is all the way over there. So what was it? A ghost? Like a, a demon or something? Ronnie asked, shocked. Dude, how the crap should I know? We spoke in very strange, surfer-like dialect for two mid-Michigan boys, I know. And then I saw this look of what seemed to be understanding wash over Ronnie's face. Like it all made sense to him. He said, you know what this is, right? This is Satan. He's trying to distract you from doing God's work. He has no power here, let's go tell him. I followed Ronnie into the church like we were on some kind of mission. It was empty again, but I felt this cold, uneasy feeling as soon as we stepped inside. As I said, it was the middle of summer in Florida, and we were inside an old church with barely functioning AC. But I remember instantly being chilled, and that's when Ronnie starts yelling. Hey, Satan, you ain't got nothing on us. Bring it. You can't stop us. What you got? Did I mention we were overconfident? We waited in silence for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only 30 seconds. Nothing happened. We looked at each other, seeing what seemed to be a creeped out factor on each other's faces. We paused for a split second, and then just began laughing out loud at the ridiculousness of the situation. 
Maybe I just overreacted. Dramatic teenagers and whatnot. The evening ended after the last adult arrived to pick up their child. My youth group and I loaded the bus and headed back to the condo that we had rented. It was dark by this time, and I had calmed down a bit, momentarily forgetting what had happened. The bus ride took some time, so I usually would just sit there, looking out the window at the landscapes that were unusual to me, a boy from the north. We drove along the coast, passing interesting architecture surrounded by unfamiliar foliage common to the Florida ecosystem. As we rode, I looked out the window and saw a person sitting on a large stone sign for a different church, a Roman Catholic cathedral. I squinted to see him, as I was curious what this character was doing sitting on such a fancy-looking stone slab sign. As the bus got closer and closer, to my growing fright, I started to realize that the person sitting on the slab was somebody I knew. It was Alvin. He was sitting on the sign, looking down at his feet as he kicked them, his behavior resembling that of a much younger boy. As we passed this Alvin sitting on the sign, he looked up from his feet and looked directly at me. His eyes were not Alvin's eyes. They were different. Another, older, wiser man's eyes, piercing through the motion and distance. He looked at me and smirked with that menacing, threatening grin. As we began to pass, I turned my head to look at the front of the bus. Just a few seats ahead of me, Al sat, quietly doing what I had been doing a few moments before, looking at the water. I looked back out the window as we passed. The other Alvin raised his hand into the familiar gun-pointing gesture and pointed at me. What was even stranger, I could hear the clicking sound in my head, and I'm not sure how to explain this, but it wasn't coming from me. It wasn't my common inner monologue. It was someone else. It was something else. He winked. For lack of a better phrase, I began to freak out. I shouted and drew attention from some of my friends, my assistant youth pastor Jason, and my pastor David. I remember thinking that I was losing my mind. The intensity of Faux Alvin's eyes and the click of his tongue playing on repeat in my brain, and nobody seemed to understand my panic. David said we would talk once we got settled back at our condo and that I should just take a breath. We arrived at the condo. It was lavish accommodations to a small town kid causing me to wonder how one would arrange payment for such a place, especially for a gaggle of teenagers. It had tall vaulted ceilings, and the decor was designed in the early 90s, so it was fitted with brass lighting fixtures and lightly stained oak finishings. Exiting the bus, my knees were shaking. A fog of embarrassment settled over me as other kids gazed with an obvious wonder that only children with a lack of decorum would show. My youth pastors took me into a back bedroom away from the other kids, gave me a pint of haagen coffee ice cream, which assisted in calming my nerves, and settled me. Once settled, they proceeded to talk to me about what they thought was happening. David gave his version of what he believed was transpiring. There's a war happening, he said. A war between heaven and hell where angels and demons are in a battle for the souls and sanity of God's followers. And what you and Ronnie did was incredibly stupid. You challenged Satan to a battle that you cannot win. He's too powerful. That was his foothold. You need to be careful. This did very little to calm my nerves. It seemed uncharacteristically morose of David to be that blunt, especially with a teenager, but he continued. Do not do that again. If you keep doing the right thing, God will protect you. But you cannot tell anyone else that this happened. It spreads fear that Satan thrives on. Being a naive young Christian at the time, I believed him. 
I thought that this war could seem possible, but I also trusted a mentor that I shouldn't share my story, and I would follow that advice for years. I went to bed early that night, trying to move past this experience, Alvin's face and the clicking gesture continuing to haunt my thoughts. It didn't work. The next day was our last at the church. We were done coordinating the VBS program, but the leaders of the church wanted to treat us to a dinner as a way of saying thanks. I didn't think about it at the time, but it was very strange that we hadn't yet met the pastor of the church until this dinner. Beforehand, we had packed up all of our belongings and were prepared to leave once we had finished dinner. We all sat in the east side of the church, in the dining area with all the tables, eating the spaghetti dinner that they had provided us. It was a happy scene. I looked around at everyone enjoying the meal, laughing and joking around the tables. Suddenly, the back door of the church opened and a cold gust of wind rushed past me bizarre for a Florida summer afternoon, followed by the entrance of a tall elderly man and two slightly younger women behind him. As with all members of the youth group, I had never met this man before. He was introduced to us as the pastor, but none of us recall ever hearing his first or last name. And all I could focus on were his eyes. They seemed familiar to me, although I couldn't place them. They weren't kind eyes, although I couldn't articulate that in my mind at the time. He spoke a short sentence or two of thanks to the group, and then proceeded to move past the tables, sharing short statements of small talk, referring to my friends as guy, ladies, or in the case of Ronnie, who was sitting next to me, young man. As he slowly approached me, I continued to eat spaghetti, because free food. The pastor moved deliberately behind me until I could feel his bony hand touch my right shoulder. I turned around to look and saw the pastor glaring straight into my eyes. Not a polite stranger's glance, but a deep, disturbing stare. Those eyes, I had seen those before. He took his hand off my shoulder and spoke. Hey, how's it going? He addressed me by name. Something was wrong, and it was immediately obvious to me. No one had met this pastor, and he didn't know any of us from Adam. He referred to everyone as such, with generic titles like Son and Darlin, but he knew my name. He looked at me like he knew me, and then he did it. He smiled in that familiar, menacing way, lifted his hand, made the pointing gesture while winking, and closed it out with the tongue click. I shot up and backed up quickly, clamoring for my footing as I knocked over some empty chairs, and I ran out of the dining hall. I ran to the adjacent chapel and did the only thing that came to mind at the time. I sat in a pew and cried. My pastor and my pastor's wife, Kathy, followed me shortly after. I expected to hear their voice of reassurance, the kind people that had been mentors to me for years, but that is not what followed. What are you doing? That was the rudest thing I've ever seen. What's wrong with you? David shouted. You're acting like a baby, Kathy exclaimed. This was extremely uncharacteristic for both of them, so I knew something was wrong. They were usually very calm, kind people in public. So I ran from them. I ran out of the chapel, down the long hallway, past the mirror where I had originally seen who I thought was Alvin, and out the front doors. Following directly after me, Kathy stepped out the door before the door even closed. I turned to see her expression transform from an angry hunter into a concerned caregiver. What's wrong, honey? Why are you crying? I knew immediately why the anger had left her. She had left the church. She was outside. Something was wrong with that place. After discussing what I felt had happened, I never went into that church again. I waited outside for the rest of my group to finish eating. Afterward, 
David, with a small group of us, did some kind of weird ritual where we anointed the church and its door with oil. He read some scriptures that were unfamiliar to me and we boarded the bus and left. I haven't spoken with David or Kathy in decades, but directly after this happened, Kathy, while coming short of saying that I was lying, disagreed with the sequence of events. She seemed to believe that she heard me making a ruckus outside, so she followed me directly out there, concerned for my well-being. David remembers being angry at me, and while he seemed more docile out of the building, he just treated me differently afterward. The church itself seems to have been disbanded. I can't find any mention of the church on the internet, and members of the youth group that I've kept in touch with have gone to Sarasota and have never been able to find the location, even though we took the same route several times a day. One particular friend said that there's just a field where that building used to be, as if this whole thing never happened. Because David had told me that I shouldn't talk about what had happened, I didn't discuss this experience with any of my church friends, at least not for a long while after. A few years later, I spoke about these events with friends that I made outside of the church, and my story is often met with a mixture of interest and skepticism that I often felt myself before I experienced this. I have since left my church, and I think I've personally arrived at a certain level of agnosticism. I like to think that I do not believe in ghosts or demons, but I also can't deny that which happened to me in the summer of 97. I don't have an explanation, and there are just too many things that don't make sense. I'm just hoping that I had a kind of mental break of sorts, because the alternative is far too frightening. My grandmother, or tutu as we say in Hawaii, was the center of our entire family. She has always been the center of my life, and there's not a single day that goes by that I don't think of her, even 17 years after her death. She was of pure Hawaiian descent, and growing up with her as a child was supernatural in the biggest sense. I have many stories to share, all of them entirely true, and I will tell them to the best of my ability. All of them are deeply rooted in Hawaiian culture and spiritual beliefs, so please read this with an open mind. If you are not Kanaka Maoli. I have contemplated whether it was right to share this, but I find that this is my opportunity to share her with the world. She has had many experiences in her lifetime, which I have been gathering from my family members but these are stories that I have had the honor to experience. I'll do my best to keep them short. Story number one, a fireball visits our home. In the year 1991, when I was just five years old, an akualele, or fireball, visited our home. Being so young at the time, I can only remember bits and pieces, but they have been validated by other family members who were there that night. My tutu and I were sitting in the living room watching television. This also served as her bedroom. There were beds all over the house, as from time to time, relatives would come to stay or sleep for the night. One of those dial switch TVs with only seven channels was our television. My older cousin was in his bedroom, which was near the living room. All of a sudden, I heard my cousin yelling for my grandma. He runs into the living room. Toot, what is that? He points out the window, which was just behind the TV. I sat up and went to the window and peeked in between the jalouses. What I saw, I could never forget. A ball of fire was moving above the mango trees in our backyard. It was literally gliding over the trees and toward the windows. I remember how bright it was. It had a long black tail trailing behind it, with sparks of red flickering around it. It was big, and it was loud. I have never seen something like this before. I thought it had come from the sky. 
As it got closer, I felt the hands of my grandma wrap around my chest as she pulled me away from the window. Her voice was filled with raspiness, and she shouts, Akualele. She yells to my cousin, Grab the salt. Go now. My cousin runs to the kitchen and grabs a big bag of Hawaiian salt and begins throwing it out of the bag. I remember feeling the big rocks hitting the back of my legs. I slid behind my grandma as the fireball began ducking back and forth between the two windows, as if it was trying to get a look at us. The next thing I remember is her cursing at the thing in Hawaiian. She shouts louder and louder and louder, until the thing stops and explodes right in front of my eyes. It was just one loud pop, and then it was gone. Years later, as my cousin and I were recalling the story, he explains to me that the Akualele was sent to us from another Hawaiian family who lived farther down the road. The grandmother of their family was jealous of my grandmother, as we had recently obtained more land to expand our coffee farm. What I didn't remember was that I fell deathly ill for the next two days, and my grandmother only left my side once to go talk to the family so they could come to an agreement. After giving offerings and sharing each other's breath, she returned home to find her granddaughter alive and well, as if I had never been sick at all. Story number two, the Aumakua that saved my uncle. This happened in the year 1995, when I was just nine years old. The best thing about where I lived which was in Captain Cook, South Kona, was that many of my family lived on the same road. I had a girl cousin who lived a five minute walk from our home, past my uncle and auntie's house and through a grove of banana trees and thick elephant grass. Yeah, ouch. I would spend the night there a lot. She was like my best friend. One night I arrived there as the sun was going down. She was outside on her front porch, crying. Her sister was draped over her body and they were consoling each other over something. I ran up to her and asked what was wrong. She says, it's my dad, he's sick. I went up the stairs and was about to enter the living room when my aunt peeked her head out of the bedroom door, warning me to stay outside. I began to cry, as any child my age would do in an unknown situation like that. I asked what was wrong, but could already hear the moans and wails coming out of my uncle's lips. His father was a Filipino man, and he was sitting on his usual rocking chair, this time holding a bowl in his two hands, hovering over it, examining it. I went to him to examine it myself. As I passed the walkway into the living room, I peeked into my uncle's room. My auntie was wringing out a towel over his head. The bed sheets were covered in his sweat. He wasn't moving and he was barely breathing. His father was holding a bowl of water. In the bottom of the bowl was a thin layer of raw white rice. He points to the two flecks of rice floating at the top of the water. Oh no, no good, no can help my boy he says in his constant broken English. He looks up to finally notice that I was there. He grabs my arm tightly as if to show me that I need to listen now with the utmost importance. Go to your tutu, bring her now. My boy going make. I ran back to our house and I remember the feeling of my lungs just ripping out of my chest. I ran into the living room and called out to my grandma Tutu, come, it's Uncle Dickie, which was short for Richard. I ran back outside as my grandmother got up. She took a machete and chopped down a bundle of tea leaves. My grandmother starts up the work truck and we take off toward my cousin's house. My grandmother goes into the living room. My Filipino uncle stays silent. I remember sitting outside with my cousins, trying to console them in their grief. We sat on the side of the porch, our legs dangling between the railings. I could hear my uncle muttering in tongues as my grandmother prayed for Almakua to come. Almakua stands for spiritual guardian, which are usually manifested into animals. 
Every person of Hawaiian descent knows which Aumakua relates to their bloodline. And I'm sure many have a story to tell of when they have come to provide aid. Yes, it's true. And it would become true to me now. As we were wiping the tears from our eyes, just a moment to breathe back the sobs, I heard a screech. In front of her house was the unpaved road. There was just one street light over the telephone wires running down the side of the road. I looked toward the direction of the screech and could see a small shadow flying toward the telephone wires. I tapped on my cousin's shoulder and begged her to look. It was a Hawaiian owl, a pueo. It perched up on the wire and just looked at us. All three of us were caught in a trance and a feeling of calm swept over me. That's when another one came and perched right beside the first one. Well, that's odd. They spend their lives in solitude. Maybe they were a pair. Just as soon as the second one came, there came another and then another, two sets of two. What a sight to see, I thought. In the midst of what was happening at the moment, we found happiness. My cousin begins to giggle a little as she gets up to tell her mom what was happening. Just as soon as she gets up to turn around, she lets out a small sigh. We look up to see that her head had bumped into her father's chest. He holds his daughter in his arms as she begins to scream. Baby, what is it? What are you all staring at? We stared at him, our eyes as big as a mempachi fish. As we turned around to look back at the telephone wire, the owls were gone. My uncle says to us, don't worry, I saw them too. But how? Just a half an hour ago, we thought he was doomed for death. He tells his family, I saw them in my dream. Up there on the telephone wire, yeah? I looked deep into the eyes of one, and that's when I woke up. What is it? Why are you all staring at me? Story number three. My grandmother's funeral. I apologize in advance for bringing out two great stories just to hit you with the inevitable fact that my grandmother's life came to an end. It was the biggest tragedy in my life, and for some reason I can't come to grips with it. Maybe it's because she's still with me. She was the caretaker and kahuna figure of my family, and that didn't end in her death if that makes you feel any better. Or maybe it confuses you. Well. It was the year 1999 in the month of March when my tutu had passed. My grandfather had died just two months earlier. She died of a broken heart, no reason to live anymore. Her funeral service was held at our local church in Keala Kekua. I spent the whole time next to her open coffin, just waiting for her to move, to say something. Please wake up, tutu, I still need you, I say. The church was packed to the ceiling. So many relatives, so many friends. She meant everything to everyone. The only one I noticed that wasn't there was my uncle, my father's brother. It was just the two of them with a string of Hanai or adopted brothers and sisters who would carry out the coffin at the end of the ceremony. We were trapped in eternity during the service, but I begged it not to stop. The casket was finally closed and all the Hawaiian aunts and uncles wept, as it was custom to cry loud enough for the heavens to hear. The men in the family all took their places at the coffin and lifted my grandmother off the frame, all with one spot left vacant. They walked down the small stairs and through the short walkway to the hearse. My father was at the back. My mother, sister, brother, and I were right behind at the front of the line. As soon as his foot left the sacred area of the chapel, I saw my uncles buckle as they dropped the coffin to the ground. They began looking at each other, finding a time to laugh, saying, Come on, brah, no get weak on me now. They stooped back down to pick the coffin up. I literally watched five of the strongest men in my entire family struggling to pick my grandmother up. Cries and whispers start floating around the chapel as they attempt over and over to raise her coffin off the ground. It would not move. They could not move her. 
My father explained that the coffin was heavier than blue rock. My father and my uncle lean down at the front of the coffin and peek open the door that was to be forever closed. I could hear my father talking to his mother. Ma, it's time to go. What are you waiting for? As they continued pleading with my dead grandmother, I heard the rumbling of an engine racing up the driveway of the church. It was my uncle, late as usual, even to his own mother's funeral. Real Hawaiian time, as we would say. He puts on his white gloves and kneels in front of the pastor, apologizing for his tardiness. Why he was late, I don't know. But as he took his place at the coffin, across from my father, they lifted the coffin once again. My grandmother's coffin floated off the ground, light as a feather, they said. They walked another 15 steps or so to the hearse. They said it was like my grandmother floated to the car. Even in her death, she was still as strong as ever, refusing to leave this world without her two boys by her side to lead her to the next. Story number four. Grandmother and grandfather hear my father's plea for help. Yes, there is a story number four. How, you may ask? As I said before, her guardianship does not end in her death. How comforting, yeah? This took place two years after my grandparents had passed. This one involves my father and mother, and every time he tells the story, the facts never change. My parents had gone to Hilo for the weekend, on the other side of the island. We have family in Keakaha that they would visit from time to time. Now, geez, that's another chapter right there. But anyway, my father and mother decide to spend the night at Hilo Seaside Hotel, right down the road. My father himself, being half Hawaiian and half Filipino, always had a sick sense, and sometimes it was a nightmare as it started that way that night. It was around 2.30 in the morning and they were sleeping in room number 102, queen size bed. The room was small and the door to the room was real close to the bed. If you open the door and walk to the right, it leads you down a flight of stairs, across a small garden area, through a swinging gate and into the parking lot. My father was being visited once again by a choking ghost. This has happened to him on many occasions in his life, but as he tells me to this day, it was one of his last encounters. As the clock reads 2.36 a.m., he is woken up by a feeling of fear in the pit of his stomach. He could see a shadow forming at the foot of the door. The shadow leaks under the crack of the door and up the door onto the ceiling. He began rubbing his eyes to adjust to the darkness, the tint of yellow light coming through the sliding glass door on the other side of the bed. My mother was sound asleep. He thought for a second of waking her. As he looked closer and closer at the shadow, it began to take the shape of a womanly form. Only now the shape was that of a gecko crawling on the wall, the arms and legs bent out and away from the center of the body. He was disgusted as this thing begins crawling on the ceiling, making its way above the bed. As soon as it is hovering over my father, it drops from the ceiling and lands on his chest. This womanly creature had a face, he said, a horrible face with a slithering tongue. It wraps its legs around my father's stomach, and the hands grasp his arms, holding him down on the bed. He was frozen in fear as he attempted to wake my mother from her sleep. My mother is of Caucasian descent, so she was usually not as affected by these things as my father was. The womanly creature stares directly into his eyes. He says it was just grinning at him as he began to feel his throat tighten and his esophagus lock up. He was gasping for breath as he tried his best to get this thing off. The creature began shrieking as he was slipping in and out of consciousness. He said he felt as if he was taking his last breath when all of a sudden the door swings open. There was another shadow standing inside the frame of the door. As it walked into the room, the yellow light hit the face, the face of my grandmother. He hears his mother shout, Aole mamake, you cannot have my son. She begins cursing at the thing. 
Even though the thing was still on my father's chest, he was bewildered at the fact that his dead mother was standing in front of him, as if her flesh were still real. There was a bright light coming from behind her. As my grandmother continued to curse and curse at the thing in Hawaiian, it finally let off and scampered off, dissipating into the sliding glass door. My father could not take his eyes off his mother, but she doesn't say a word to him, just stares at him for a few seconds, smiling. She turns around and walks out of the room and out the door of their hotel room. This is when my mother wakes up. Even if you were to put my parents into separate rooms, they would still recall the same story. My mother joins my father at the door, asking him what's going on. My dad was staring down the corridor where the stairs were. That's when my mother's eyes focused on my grandmother, who was still walking. She walked down the steps and past the garden. She looked as alive as ever. No more limping. No more pain as she walked. She walks out the swinging gate into the parking lot. That's when they realized that she was walking to a parked car at the corner, facing out toward the front street of the hotel. The brake lights were glowing red, but he could make out the blue bumper of his father's 62 Mazda. In the reflection of the rear view mirror, he could see his father's face. He was right there, sitting in the driver's seat of the car. They watched as my grandmother approached the car, saying to him, Okay, Papa, we go now. Our boy is okay. She gets into the passenger seat. They remember watching the glowing of the brake lights as the car disappeared into the darkness. So, there you have it. I hope this gave you an ounce of insight into the wonderful woman that my grandmother is. And for you, Kanaka Maoli, an insight into the wonderful people that all of our Tutuhine and Tutukane are. And if you still have the fortune of having them here in this world right now, don't take another second for granted. Because with them, they take our past, our tradition, and our inherent right to be proud of who we are. Please take this chance to ask them as much as you can, jot it down, and share it with the rest of the world before it's gone. I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this post is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this post is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can, soon. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky county comprised of old coal mining towns that at one time had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible, natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county, in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. We are always looking for somewhere neat to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask some of his work buddies if they knew of any rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we'll call the Old Lake, and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken wildlife management area, about 10 miles outside of town toward the state line, at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. 
The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains, past the wildlife management area boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance, nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs. But he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him, as he put it. He quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me that I had been told something similar years ago. This story too implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs, as well as, quote, something like what a preacher puts his Bible on, a pulpit I think is what he meant. Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge with their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to have me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their predominantly Scots-Irish ancestors who emigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the backside of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dockside where families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had long abandoned this wildlife management area. We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the wildlife management area, about a half mile in, we decided it was wise to go no farther. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that wraps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends to set out to the old lake. Two of us came with firearms and the other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with large jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous jagged pieces seemed to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge, above which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed, now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of a steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small scattered stones lain upon by long fallen trees, all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. 
From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash at the trailhead, this high up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we wound through thick growth made of a tree I'd never seen. Low hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk, appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Beside that, there were quite a few other types of foliage that I had also never seen before. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the whole path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, this wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. We assessed that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. Google Maps showed that we were near a rock crawling and ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the other side. The place was old for sure. Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon tunnel and descend before dark but we didn't make it there in time before having to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness. Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit would certainly breed desolation of the soul. Yesterday, I rang up a lady we'll call Marla, whom I've known for quite a long time. Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake, I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I didn't expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, through their family cemetery and up a long dirt path. One day, Marla received a call from her father, asking her to tell her father-in-law, who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son into the mountains that He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned, because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain, but that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shook his head and declined to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police had run off the loitering creeps. 
She claimed to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site and a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she has no photo evidence. The next weird experience to befall Marla didn't come for almost six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else she's told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, then age seven, on a walk to the old lake to check out the creek, catch salamanders and find rocks as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up toward the initial incline and past the Mark Wildlife Management Area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices farther into the woods. As she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered toward Mason's crown. A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent like that of a typical Southern preacher. The voice spoke rapidly and was periodically answered by a group of voices which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from high atop the ridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead, fearing that whomever had gathered there had seen her and was warding her off. Like the others, she's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed in an amount of time they described as unusually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years after the incident her father described, two fish and wildlife officials showed up at her house in the middle of basically nowhere the men admitted that they had no clue where they were. They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise very familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marla noted that both were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept almost 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences and those of her family, but has found few. The only presumption she's gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad, benign covens of witches yet existent within unbroken bloodlines, wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through the infliction of suffering, old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with the coal country's prosperous towns dotted across all of rural Appalachia. There is much to be uncovered and there's even more that should be altogether left alone. If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature an isolated mountain range with an ancient soul, wherein you can find whatever old secrets you might be looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There's much more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties as well. I fully intend on going back to follow the stream of Lonesome Creek itself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time we will find the path to get there. Marla and I are supposed to meet in person 
so that I can write some of her stories down for good detail. I look forward to that. And I will continue to share with you whatever I'm able. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, Everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn. So instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. 
We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while, we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious, and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied, and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled, and that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us. And that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. 
Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree, I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches, was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridal path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two-minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal, rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in the search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're gonna find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. 
He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. So, I just want to start out by saying that I'm some ways a skeptic. I generally call myself agnostic when it comes to not just religion, but anything supernatural or paranormal. For me, this means that I've vacillated at different points in my life all over the spectrum of belief, from times where I basically was willing to believe in anything, to being about as hardcore of a skeptic as you can get. These days, I'm in a weird place somewhere in between. I still feel like I live in the mundane material world, but there's something so much bigger and weird peeking right over the horizon. The main thing that keeps me from having a 100% skeptical outlook is that I've had my share of very weird experiences. Not as weird as some people's, but weird enough that they have me questioning what is real. I should note that I'm not the most mentally stable person, so some of it can be chalked up to that. And at times, thinking I'm just crazy is actually the most comfortable option. But also, I've had plenty of experiences that I have shared with others as well, and those are a lot harder to dismiss. I know shared delusions or hallucinations are possible, but they're exceedingly rare from my understanding and mostly limited to just two people who are extremely close, like siblings or spouses. Some of my experiences have been backed up by as many as four witnesses. This is one such experience. A number of years back, I acquired a house through my family. I won't bore you with the details, but it was through some pretty weird and convoluted circumstances. The house itself is very strange looking inside. I'd best describe it as something out of Alice in Wonderland meets Black Lodge from Twin Peaks. Lots of weird angles, oddly sized rooms with no clear purpose, and decorating that looked like it came from someone who had only read about humans in a book. More spiritually oriented folks who visit would variously claim that it had a vaguely sinister or dark feel to it, while others would say it had a light and inviting energy. I'm not sure I put much stock in any of that, but I suppose it's worth noting. The really weird stuff started early on. Within the first couple of months, my housemate and I kept finding weird bits of writing all over the place. First, it was seemingly just names, all kinds of random personal names. Although the handwriting was neat, we figured it must have come from the kids of the family who lived there before us. But maybe it's worth noting that most of it probably wasn't them. At least they weren't writing their own names, as the family that had lived there spoke Spanish. Most of these were decidedly not family names of theirs. For instance, there were names like Gertrude and Siobhan, and we know that they don't have any of those in their family. We found about 15 of these names, at least, and only seven people lived in the house before us. So, even by that count, some of them couldn't have been theirs. 
I suppose it's possible that the kids might have just been scrawling random names that they knew for some reason. But then we started finding other stuff, like whole sentences tucked away under countertops or on baseboards. And eventually, even on our furniture, stuff that wasn't even in the house before we got there. The sentences were never really threatening or anything. They were just strange and mostly nonsensical. Sometimes they looked like song lyrics, but they never came up as anything when I tried to Google them. Also, to be clear, the fact that we kept finding these random scrawlings made zero sense, because sometimes we would swear that they had shown up in places we'd already looked before. Almost like more of them were being made, and yet they all looked very similar in handwriting. A little wavy and childlike, but overall neat, neutral, and legible. This was starting to feel more and more like the beginning of some stereotypical horror movie, but it still wasn't weird enough to really freak us out. Yet. We also had lots of stuff go missing, usually only to turn up later in really strange places that we were sure neither of us had left it. But again, nothing too out there. There were some minor poltergeist-like activity early on, too objects that seemed to jump off of fixtures on their own. There were pretty consistent electrical issues as well, including a microwave that we had to keep unplugged because it had this habit of turning itself on. But probably just faulty wiring in an old house, right? No. You see, things really began to ramp up about a year after we moved in. I had gone on a road trip for about a week, and I didn't get back until nearly 4 a.m. When I did, I was greeted by a strange little nest of dried grass with three roughly equally sized but differently colored stones sitting in front of my front door. This was weird, but I assumed it was something one of my roommates had put there for some reason or another, and I didn't think too far into it. The friend that I had been traveling with noticed it too when she was helping with bags, and found it odd, but just like me, didn't think much of it. So the next day, I casually asked my housemates what was up with the little bed of grass and the rocks, and they were all confused. Each of them had assumed that I had put it there. At this point, I assumed either my roommates or a friend of mine was playing a prank on me. A really strange prank, but a prank nonetheless. With this assumption, I did the whole Okay, nice one, you got me, assuming that at least one of them would confess to their not-so-clever prank. But all of them insisted earnestly that they had no part in it, and they continued to insist this for the rest of the time that I knew them. I'm inclined to believe them, as none were really the pranking type. They would definitely have admitted it under duress. After all, it was about as harmless a prank as you could get. Any of my friends that I confronted said the same exact thing and never let up. Really the only friend I could easily imagine coming up with such an odd abstract prank was the one that I had been on a road trip with, so there was no way she had done it. I am absolutely certain that it was not there when I left, and all of my roommates said that it wasn't even there the day before I got back. So really, that just left the possibility of it being the work of some random prankster in the neighborhood. But there are problems with that too, such as the fact that these stones got moved and put back exactly the same way on multiple occasions, until the whole thing creeped me out enough that I finally took them inside. This did stop them from being put back again and again, but maybe it was a mistake if you believe that they were perhaps tied to something. Who knows, I guess. On top of that, I asked our incredibly nosy next door neighbor about it once, like if she'd seen anybody on our porch. She said no, but she'd keep an eye out. To be clear, she was retired and kept an eye on things at all hours that she was awake. And she was a light sleeper. So this prankster would have to be continually coming back in the middle of the night to set these rocks up with cat burglar-like stealth over and over again, immediately after they were disturbed. Unlikely. But it gets even weirder. The poltergeist-type activity ramped up, 
and eventually it led to stuff like the bathtub turning itself on in the middle of the night when I was the only one home. I have no history of sleepwalking or anything like that. Then, both me and at least one of the other roommates started getting woken up in the night by mice. Except, both of us swear by all things holy, that when we occasionally caught glimpses of these critters, they were weird. Like, really weird. They were incredibly pale, hairless, bipedal, and tailless. But granted, we only ever caught brief glimpses of them, because they were incredibly fast. Faster than typical mice. And seemed to make great effort to stay out of the light or out of the open. We also both suffered strange, vivid nightmares and heard voices. And while for me this wasn't completely unusual and could even be chalked up to mental illness, my roommate had no history of anything more severe than depression, had never taken any substances beyond weed and alcohol and was hardly into those, and was completely sober during these experiences. Yet she apparently suffered so much from them that she eventually moved out. There was some other stuff, like the house getting a lock mysteriously put on it by a property firm who didn't own it. Like I said, my family owned it. Nobody at the property company had any knowledge of who might have done it, and whoever did it apparently did so in the dead of night. Because, again, my neighbors hadn't seen anybody do it while they were awake. Maybe it was just professional incompetence. Who knows? Other things started showing up on our porch over time, like bundles of twigs and a sprouting sweet potato, rotting fruit, I'm reasonably sure that it was not the work of anyone I knew. And after all of that, my neighbors surely would have seen at least one of these instances. Anyhow, I no longer live at this house, but I've been thinking about all the odd experiences that I had there lately. And while they're maybe not the weirdest or hardest to explain, they always struck me as both oddly personal somehow, as well as oddly senseless. The only reason that I've ever thought they could be the fey folk or fairies isn't because of the conclusion that I personally came to, but because I spoke to a friend of mine who's way more into esoterica and paranormal stuff than I am. She immediately assumed it was old school trickster fairies. This friend did have a bit of a personal connection to the whole fey realm. She actually claimed to have been abducted by them when she was little, but that whole thing is not my story to tell and we don't have time. I will say though, although this girl held some metaphysical beliefs that I'm not quite on board with, she never struck me as an out and out liar. She certainly experienced something strange and traumatic when she was young and never even wanted to talk about it with most people. Still, she was right about the fact that certain aspects of the whole thing really do seem to evoke the weird and fickle nature of mythological fae. Maybe we even glimpsed them, but who knows? Anyway, if you have any idea as to what this could have been, or if you agree that it was the fae, let me know. I'd love to hear some ideas. To this day, it was just the most bizarre experience, and I've never come up with a good explanation. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to live right at the edge of a very large nature preserve. The area was not open to the public, but thanks to the location of my neighborhood, there were several lesser known entrances that I could use to gain access and explore to my heart's content. Countless days of my childhood were spent hiking, swimming, and playing pretend with my best friend in these woods. The woods became like a second home to me. I felt like I knew every shortcut and secret cave, and I always felt at peace except for one very unusual instance, which is the subject of this story. My best friend and neighbor, who I'll refer to as Jacob, knew these woods just as well as I did. We had several choice spots that we liked hiking to, 
and a couple of makeshift forts that we made out of sticks and such. Keep in mind that things were simpler back then, and our parents felt little need to worry about us. They were accustomed to us disappearing for hours on end while we explored the woods. This was also before cell phones were a thing. One more important thing to note is that these woods were once home to Native Americans, more specifically the Comanche tribe. Oftentimes, we would find arrowheads left behind by the native tribes, or ancient cans and bits of supplies, presumably left by the settlers who eventually found the area and took it for themselves. We found this bit of history fascinating, and going in the woods sometimes felt like taking a step away from the modern world and going back to a different time. One afternoon, Jacob and I packed up some water and snacks and set out into the woods like we had many times before. Usually, we would stick to the trails or the creek so that we would be able to find our way back home easily. But today, we had an urge to explore even deeper than we had gone before. We headed off the trail and into the uncharted areas of the preserve that even our parents hadn't taken us to before. Things were fine, at first, but soon we realized that the trees had gotten incredibly dense. It became increasingly difficult to walk, as dead tree branches seemed to reach and claw at us every step of the way. We both found ourselves a sturdy stick and used this as a makeshift machete, chopping and carving ourselves a path through the trees. There was no longer any trail to be found, but we didn't care. We were invincible kids who knew these woods well. What was the worst that could happen? We had been proceeding like this for probably about 15 to 20 minutes when we got a horrible feeling. That horrible feeling that we were being watched. Jacob and I looked at each other at practically the same moment, and he said, Dude, do you feel that? Yeah, I said. I feel it. We both agreed that something felt very wrong. We couldn't describe why, but we both had the same feeling of dread that someone or something was watching us. We quickly agreed that it was time to head back. We turned around and started making our way back but after several minutes, we started having doubts that we knew where we were. The woods were dense here, denser than any part of the preserve we had seen, and it was nearly impossible to move. We were getting tired from hacking away tree branches and decided to stop for a break and try to get our bearings. That's when we noticed something else that was wrong. It was completely silent save for our labored breathing. These woods, normally teeming with life, were absolutely still. To this day, I haven't experienced anything like it. We couldn't hear a single bug or a bird or even the rushing water of the creek. It was suddenly dead. These comfortable woods that were so familiar to us suddenly felt alien and hostile and we still had that feeling of being watched, although stalked might be a better word for it. Jacob and I were absolutely done with the adventure by this point. We were completely turned around, and we couldn't even tell if we were heading back the way we'd come at this point. He tried to climb a tree to see where we were, but it was too difficult. He would have to break dozens of branches just to get a couple of feet off the ground. And these trees were tall. The branches were so thick that they blocked out the sun at times. When climbing the tree failed, we both started yelling in hopes that someone might hear us. But the only reply we received was the oppressive silence of the woods. It was at this moment of desperation that we spotted something through the trees probably about 20 or so yards away. 
Out of the corner of our eyes, we clearly saw an adult-sized figure, which quickly moved behind a tree once we spotted it. Jacob and I traded one brief and panicked look at each other and bolted in the opposite direction of the figure. We sprinted like human wrecking balls through the branches, no longer taking care to carve ourselves a nice safe path. Branches clawed and scraped at our legs, arms, and faces as our flight instinct kicked into overdrive. My lungs burned, but I didn't care. At one point, Jacob, who was wearing our backpack full of water and snacks, got snagged on a particularly large branch. I stopped to help untangle him as fast as I could, and we kept sprinting, not daring to look back behind us. A few times, I thought I heard something breaking branches as it followed us, but I can't be certain. We continued running for what felt like ages. In reality, we ran for what was probably 15 to 20 minutes. When we finally broke through the tree line and into a clearing, I was so relieved I could have cried. I wish that the story ended here so that I could chalk it up to the overactive imagination of two stupid lost kids, but I can't. Because it turns out this clearing was essentially the backyard of a very large and very old two-story house. A house that we didn't know existed until that moment. Decades old blue paint peeled off the exterior. The roof was missing several shingles, many of which were lying in the overgrown grass below. The house had several large windows that were caked with grime. A single dirt road made its way from the front of the house and up a small hill, and we couldn't see where it led. It was obvious that this house wasn't part of our neighborhood, or any neighborhood that we had been to before, for that matter. Jacob and I were halfway terrified and halfway in awe at our discovery. This house felt like our own personal discovery after a perilous quest. A bit of our fear from the woods evaporated as we summoned the courage to investigate. We walked up to the side of the house that was on our left and peered through the dirty window into the strange home. The first floor seemed to consist of mainly one large room. Along the wall opposite us was a wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The first floor was completely devoid of any furniture. No tables, no chairs, no couches or anything just dozens upon dozens of broken bottles. Shards of glass covered almost the entirety of the first floor, as well as a few yellowed books and magazines that were sprawled open, some with pages clearly ripped out and laying next to them. In the center of the room was a single sleeping bag, filthy from what we could see, with an unlit candlestick standing next to it. What are y'all doing? I nearly shat myself in horror. We immediately pulled away from the window and saw that a man had walked around from the right side of the building and was now standing about 15 feet away from us. He was wearing nothing except for some dirty denim overalls. He had scarred skin that looked like rough leather. And his eyes, well, neither of his eyes were looking in the same direction and neither one was looking directly at us. Everything about this man looked wrong, and not just because of his physical appearance. You know how some people, you can just feel their energy? It's hard to describe, but this guy just felt so wrong in every way. We were frozen in place, surprised and terrified by his appearance there. We stared at him for a moment until Jacob found words to speak. We're, uh, 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 just checking out the house, he said sheepishly. The stranger seemed to take a moment to digest his response before gesturing to the woods and saying, you should head back the way you came. You never know. And he just let that last sentence hang in the air. You never know. 
Jacob, God bless him, quickly thought of something to say, while I still stared in absolute terror. Well, actually, we need to head to the road. Our parents will be expecting us soon. The man did not reply. He just stood there, with his mouth slightly open, his eyes dancing off in different directions. It seemed like he was thinking hard about something. We didn't waste another second getting out of there. We walked as quickly as we could toward the front of the house and made our way up the dirt driveway, for lack of a better term, trying not to appear panicked. I say driveway because there were no cars at the house, not even a garage. The front of the house consisted of a porch, which was also littered with old cans, broken bottles, and yellowed pages from old magazines. We felt the man's gaze boring into our backs as we trudged up the driveway. It was rather long, and once we rounded the first corner and were out of sight of the house, we started running again. Eventually, we reached a paved road. There was no mailbox or address that we could see. We followed this paved road for quite some time, felt like ages before we could begin to recognize where we were again. It turns out that we had gone through the entire nature preserve and were on the complete opposite side from where our neighborhood was. It took the rest of the afternoon to walk back home, but we made it safe and sound without incident. We didn't tell our parents what had happened because we were afraid that they would restrict our freedom and not let us go into the woods again. And we didn't go into the woods again for a few weeks. When we did go back, we rarely left the trails, and we never went into that area again. To this day, Jacob is convinced that something paranormal is going on there, that we found ourselves in the midst of things both unfathomable and dangerous. We're both usually pretty realistic and grounded people, but I'm inclined to agree with him. I'm still not sure if the feelings of dread or spookiness in the woods and the house and the man are related in any way. I doubt I'll ever know. It all happened back in April of 2016. I was 28 years old and I was traveling with my parents and my younger brother to visit relatives in Hong Kong. We always stayed in this area called Sha Tin as it was easy for us to navigate the public transport to all the places that my relatives lived from there. Mum found a really good deal for a 10 day stay at a hotel in the area. It was a hotel that we had stayed at years ago and while it was not as convenient as our usual place, it was a ridiculously good value for a four-star hotel. We arrived in the late afternoon or evening and checked in as normal. The first thing I noticed when we walked into the room was it was a little bit shabbier than I had expected for a four-star hotel. When you walk in, on your left is one of those closets where you can hang up your coats and stuff. About two steps ahead, on the right, is the bathroom, and opposite that is a little nook where there's a teapot, tea and coffee, and the mini fridge, things like that. From there, the room opens up to a double bed and two single beds, plus a TV, a typical setup of a slightly larger hotel room. As soon as I walked in, I noticed the closet light kept flickering on and off, even while the closet door was closed. I didn't really think much of it because the room looked pretty old and I figured it was just badly maintained. So having gotten off a long flight, I really needed to pee, so I headed straight for the bathroom. When I stepped in, I was shocked to discover that the lighting in the bathroom had this horrible greenish tinge. The bathroom was a bit worse for wear, but not unusable. The corners were all dark and grimy, like they hadn't been cleaned for a while and there was a slate loose in the ceiling that looked like somebody had kicked it in. With the greenish light, it had a really strong horror movie vibe about it. To top it off, as I did my business and while washing my hands, 
I had this distinct feeling of being watched. Not just watched from a distance, but it felt as if somebody was standing really close behind me, with their head next to mine. Being tired, I told myself that I was just imagining things. I finished up and I walked out. It felt so creepy though. I found myself literally shaking it off as I walked out. My brother went in after me, and he came out shortly after. And when he did, he gave me a look that said, What the hell? Realizing he was as creeped out as I was, I nodded and simply said, I know, right? We both decided there was something off about the bathroom. But considering that our parents seemed fine with it, and we were only going to be there for a few days, we just shrugged it off. Yes, it felt a little creepy, but I figured that if we left it, whatever it was, alone, then it would leave us alone. How bad could it be? The next few days were okay. Outside of the bathroom, everything felt normal. My plan was pee as quickly as possible, shower as quickly as possible, and stay the hell away from the bathroom unless absolutely necessary. The worst thing was really that the bathroom had this huge mirror that ran all the way from the entrance to the bathtub and shower. You could see yourself in the mirror at all times. Every time I washed my hands or showered, I just had this overwhelming feeling that something invisible was staring back at me through the mirror. I can't explain it, but I just felt like if I didn't keep my guard up, at some point if I looked away and looked back, I would see something that might scare the life out of me. One day, after we came back from shopping for gifts, I was super excited because we had shopped for baby clothes for my cousin's daughter who was about to be born. We were taking photos of all the clothes and toys we had bought, and then I realized I needed to use the bathroom. As usual, I threw open the door and walked in, but I was practically floored because the green lighting was gone. The bathroom looked and felt super normal. I wasn't scared and I didn't feel creeped out. The mirror, everything felt fine. It was totally normal. I thought, oh my gosh, I really am nuts. Did I imagine everything the whole time? It was great. I finished up and went back outside to fuss over the presents some more. At some point, my brother was peering at the air conditioner control. He said, um, did you change the temperature? Confused, I responded, no. Mom? Dad? He asked. They both shook their heads. He called us over, and startled, we noticed that somehow, the temperature had been set to something ridiculously low, like 11 or 13 degrees Celsius. My mom brushed it off as faulty, and set it back up to 18 again. The key point here, though, is that I have really bad asthma, which is triggered by cold temperatures and dry air, so we never set the air conditioning that low. My brother and I exchanged looks again, but we didn't say anything. On the way out to dinner that night, we were on the train, and my brother and I finally decided to tell our parents. But horrifyingly, the situation was much worse than I expected. Turns out that while I had just been feeling creeped out, my brother had had an entirely different experience. He said that on the first day, yes, he felt the same as me like he was being watched. But on top of that, while he was showering, he thought he heard me call him by his nickname. Only our family calls him that. He actually answered, what? And when I didn't respond, he felt scared and semi-clarified, what? And used my name. Nothing. When he told us this, I vehemently denied ever calling out to him when he was showering. He said it sounded like I was just on the other side of the door. I told him my entire plan there was to stay away from that bathroom at all times. I didn't even hover at the kettle area, simply because it freaked me out so much to even be close to it. So there was no way I was going to stand outside and call to him. Then, the next day, he saw what looked like muddy, dark, bare feet footprints next to the toilet. It freaked him out. 
But as we had decided to just sort of live with it for the next few days, he didn't say anything. Finally, the night before, he was showering. And when he glanced away, and then back at the mirror, he saw a young woman with long dark hair standing right next to the toilet in the mirror. He reflexively shut his eyes and said something to the effect of, please stop that, it's really scaring me. He opened his eyes and it was gone. He also explained that he had this strong feeling that the woman had once hidden under the space in the bathroom bench, which gave both of us the creeps. In retrospect, my parents and I started realizing a lot of weird things about the room and the behavior of the staff all around us. Realization number one, everyone knew but us. For example, one day we were pretty tired and we decided to just chill at the hotel until late afternoon. The cleaner came by and we mentioned that we were happy for her to just collect the used towels and leave new ones in the bathroom. This lovely middle-aged lady walked in and was friendly enough, albeit a little shy. We were all within view, but because the bathroom door was closed, mom said to her, oh, it's okay, there's no one in there. The cleaner nodded and weirdly, despite hearing my mom explain this already, she knocked on the door before entering. My parents and brother and I looked at each other, a little confused. Language was definitely not an issue. We speak the same language and had spoken with her previously. She left after giving us our daily bottled water refills and towels, and that was that. The daily bottle refreshes and the housekeeping was also weird. The bed always looked like they were made up really quickly, not with the usual type of care that you would get at these hotels. The refilled bottles were never set on the bedside tables like they are usually, but just dumped near the kettle closer to the door. At the time, we figured it was because the room was so cheap. Every morning when we left the room, any staff nearby would stare weirdly at us and smile awkwardly. This is pretty weird for Hong Kong hotels because we don't look different. Usually they just kind of ignored you and it's not like we were staying in some VIP room or anything. I always thought we were just giving off heavy foreign born Chinese vibes or something. But thinking back, I think they were looking to see if we were acting funny because they knew the room was dodgy. Realization number two, it was listening to us. When it called out to my brother, it wasn't by his real name. It was by the nickname we call him. Literally nobody else calls him that. Also, we had mentioned a few times in the conversations we had about how we had to make sure the air conditioning wasn't too low because of my asthma. It was summer in Hong Kong and incredibly humid. So my brother had joked a few times about how setting the air conditioning super low would feel better but might kill me. Realization number three, defying technology. The hotel air conditioning control does not go below 17 degrees Celsius. Most air conditioners don't in our experience. So when we saw the setting in the room, it made no sense. My brother said the reason he walked over there was because when I went into the bathroom, he swore he saw out of the corner of his eye a white mist hover near the air conditioning controls. When he walked over and noticed the incredibly low setting, that's when he asked us about it. After listening to us, my mom went white as a sheet. She and dad decided that we would ask for a room switch immediately. It was the calling out to my brother and the air conditioning that freaked her out the most. In Chinese folklore, there are legends about ghosts wanting company, and they would lure people to accidental deaths by scaring them or calling out to them. She was afraid that the ghost was trying to latch on to my brother, considering he was the only one who saw or heard her. Mom also had a theory that given that I'm super protective of my family, it may have decided that I was in the way or that I had pissed it off somehow. We figured that unknowingly, my excitedness and cheerfulness had offset some of the energy in the bathroom that day, knocking it out of its territory, which was why I suddenly felt like everything was normal in the bathroom. I had accidentally knocked her out of it or something. So because I pissed it off, it turned down the air conditioning as an attempt to mess with me. 
When we went back and told the front desk we wanted to switch rooms, the young man at the desk looked slightly uncomfortable. Mom just explained, we're just very uncomfortable with the room. Look, we'd really like to change rooms now. We're only here for a few more days, so if we can't, we're happy to just check out now. The guy didn't even look surprised. Weirdly, without asking another question, he told us he would change our rooms. He would give us a new key to a different room on a different level. And he explained that once we were cleared out of our old room, to just come back and give him the key. To us, that was super weird, especially because he didn't even question it, nor did he offer to come up with us or check or anything. But we didn't care. We went upstairs and packed up all of our stuff. By this stage, I was freaking out inside a little bit, because the gravity of what my brother had told us was sinking in. I told my parents to leave anything that didn't belong to us in the room. I'd watched enough movies to know that these things attach themselves to objects, right? So I was like, leave the water bottles, leave the toiletries, we can get new ones. I even left my personal toothbrush in there. I wanted nothing that had stayed in that bathroom for a prolonged period of time with it. We checked into the room upstairs, and we were shocked to realize that everything we suspected seemed to be true. This room was exactly the same structure, but it was so much neater. The bathroom lighting was normal, still old and a little dirty, but not creepy at all. The refill water bottles were neatly placed on the bedside tables, with the hotel cardboard tags attached. The other room had none of these nice finishes. The beds were made properly tucked in corners and everything. We realized that the other room must have been known as a haunted room, so the cleaners would just rush to tidy up, dump whatever they needed to dump, and leave as quickly as possible. It also explained why the cleaner insisted on knocking on the door to our bathroom first before entering. In Chinese folklore, it's polite to announce yourself before you walk into a ghost's territory by knocking on the door first. The theory is that if they don't want to mess with you, they'll have the opportunity to leave or hide. Horrifyingly, Mum realized that she had accidentally left one of the drinking bottles from the other room in her handbag. Calmly, she wrapped it up in some Buddhist beads she carried with her everywhere and explained, we'll throw it out tomorrow somewhere, don't worry. I was still a little scared, but my brother was just happy we had left our other room. That night, while we slept, for no reason at all, I woke up. I had my back to the entry hallway of the room. I could see my brother in the bed next to mine, and I could hear both of my parents breathing and snoring in their sleep in the bed behind me. Despite this, I could feel someone watching me from the hallway. I was wide awake and so scared out of my mind I could barely move. I remember being very aware of my own breathing. I told myself I was just traumatized and that if I just turned around, I would see that there was nothing there and that there would be nothing to be afraid of. So, I lifted myself off the bed a bit and turned. There, standing in the darkness, I saw a silhouette of a person, medium height, standing right next to my mom's handbag where the bottle was. I turned quickly around and pulled my covers up over my shoulders and slammed my eyes shut. I don't know how, but somehow I fell asleep. When we woke up in the morning, we went out for breakfast. Mom threw the bottle out in one of the shopping center bins, and after that, nothing weird happened. This was one of the most frightening things I've ever experienced, and the residual effect of this meant that I kept running into all these weird things for the next two years. Luckily, never something as bad as that again, though. For reference, this place was called the Regal Riverside Hotel. I think we were on level 8, and after we were moved to 9. Neither of us remembers the exact room number. I think a big part of me blocked it out. A lesson we learned from this was that the cliché is true. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There was a very good reason why that room was so cheap. I'd rather pay more money than ever have this happen again, and it's the last time I will ever stay silent about a creepy hotel room. Any sign of weirdness and I will change rooms immediately.
I grew up in a household that rarely attended church. Sometimes, when visiting our grandparents, my two brothers and I would be forced to go to worship services, but those moments were few and far between. Even so, it's almost impossible to avoid running across Christian symbols in books, movies, and television shows. Thus, it's likely most Americans have at least a basic understanding of such Christian symbols as the cross and angelic beings. So, when my youngest brother Parker, of around three years old, began telling us that he saw angels, my parents saw no immediate cause for concern, nor were they at all surprised. From what I can remember, all of the adults in the family and in our friend circles thought it was cute. I must admit, I was a bit more skeptical than the grown-ups. Quite frankly, I could not shake an unsettling feeling deep in my gut that something about it just wasn't right. Some time later, my brothers and I were spending a summer day at our babysitter's mind-numbingly boring home when my youngest brother called out for someone to come and look at a picture he had just finished. Now, being all of three years old, abstract shapes and outrageous color schemes constituted the bulk of my brother's artwork up until this point. At least, this is the level of work we were all used to and fully expected to see. As it happens, I was the first to arrive on the scene and lay eyes on the drawing. The first thing I noticed, to my astonishment, was the lack of color. In fact, the entire drawing consisted of various shades of black, which was completely out of character in my brother's case. Before I was even aware of what I had laid my eyes upon, a cold chill was creeping up my spine, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. The next thing I could not avoid being struck by was the seemingly miraculous leap forward in this three-year-old boy's artistic ability. I could actually make out the discernible details of a figure, demonstrating ability well beyond his years. Without regard to the figure on the page, I immediately felt something scandalous must be afoot. I marched over to our middle brother, Christian, fully intent upon drawing a confession out of him. He must have sketched the figure and conspired to have a little fun at my expense. I was not laughing. I couldn't shake this feeling of being disturbed, much like the one I would get from creepy pictures or statues that seemed to stare directly into my soul. When he pled his innocence, I quickly dragged Christian over to the table and demanded that he end his charade. However, the moment his eyes met the figure, I recognized the look on his face. I imagined it must have been exactly as I had looked upon viewing the figure only moments before. Tears began to stream from his eyes as I released his arm and watched him race over to the secure arms of his favorite teddy bear. He always had that bear with him, but I had not seen him act as he did in that moment in years. He was three all over again. I was beginning to feel sweat beating up on my forehead and the back of my neck. I turned to Parker, who had not moved from his spot at the table throughout the entirety of the commotion, his face displaying a confused look. As the oldest, not wanting to leave the responsibility to our babysitter, I decided that I would inquire about the figure. The figure? Up to this point, I hadn't even considered what exactly my brother had drawn. All I knew was that it was chilling me to the bone and I couldn't understand why, but I would soon have my answer. Before launching into my interrogation, I glanced back at the shadowy figure on the paper. Why had I not spent a moment to figure out what he had drawn? Was it my subconscious attempting to protect me from identifying it? These questions ran through my brain, and still do every time I lie awake in bed at night, some twenty plus years later, wary of what may be waiting for me in the darkest corners of my room, behind the door and under the bed. Some things just stick with you and tend to rear their ugly head at the worst moments. What I saw on the paper haunts me to this day. The drawing was of a dark, shadowy figure, partly veiled in what appeared to be smoke or possibly mist. The body was nude, and the limbs and torso were contorted in grotesquely unnatural fashions. Tears were welling up in my eyes as I scanned the figure, slowly drifting up toward its face. This face was something indescribably sinister and horrid. It had no business even being a figment of imagination, 
much less being sketched by a three-year-old. I cannot, after all of these years, find something even remotely like it to compare it with. It didn't exactly have eyes, but you felt like it was staring right through you, like it knew you. I felt like it knew more about me than I knew myself, yet there was something oddly familiar about the figure. What I suppose could possibly pass for a mouth stretched from the middle of its lopsided egg-shaped head all the way to the very bottom of its face. Impossible as it may seem, the figure appeared to be smiling and whispering at the same time. For some reason, I felt like it was asking me to remember. Remember what? Looking up at my three-year-old brother with his blue eyes and innocent expression, I could not believe such a vision of utter darkness and cruelty could spring forth from his young and inexperienced mind. Was this something he thought about often? Had he dreamt it and felt compelled to put it down on paper? If he was at all frightened by the image, as Christian and I clearly were, he wasn't showing the slightest sign. I could only bring myself to ask him a single question. Why? Just then, Christian accidentally knocked the television remote to the floor, momentarily snapping me out of the dramatic heaviness of the moment. He still looked mortified. I turned to the three-year-old behind me, realizing there might just be some mystery about to be revealed, and heard the words I immediately realized were the cause of my unease with the figure. When I asked him why, he simply smiled and said, I see him every day. He's my angel. Upon hearing this, something seemed to break inside me. It was as if some switch flipped and an impossibly dim light flickered to life in a dark and distant room. A faded memory from as far back as I can remember began to take shape. On the couch behind me, Christian began sobbing loudly. He was definitely his three-year-old self, squeezing his teddy bear and moaning that he wanted our mother. Something from within compelled me to go over to him. It was not a voice, but it was definitely a feeling. I was out of my element. We needed mom and dad. The babysitter was not going to be enough. Something was seriously wrong, and we did not have any answers. The moment I sank into the couch, my brother threw his teddy bear and wrapped his arms around me. This was certainly new. We loved each other, about as much as two young brothers can hope to love one another, but the only times we ever hugged were for family pictures. And yet, I could tell that it was the most appropriate thing the two of us could do in that moment. He needed it. I needed it. Without looking up at me, through alternating sobs and snivels, he began to speak. He told me he wished he had never looked at the figure. He asked me why I had made him do it, which drove a hot dagger right through my little heart. I began to cry once again, telling him that I was sorry in my own whimpering voice. After we sat there crying for what seemed like an hour, though it was likely mere minutes, my brother once again spoke. This time he seemed oddly calm, almost as if he had not been crying and shaking with fear for the past several minutes. While he spoke, my attention was fading in and out, as he recounted the various houses we had lived in and the rooms we shared over the years. I had no idea why he was bringing any of this up at this particular moment. He continued in this manner, and I began to just be able to make out the memory that had moments before been triggered at the table and was slowly coming into focus. It was a series of short scenes, mostly in an apartment my parents rented when I was around three or four years old. Some of them were of places I could not quite make out, but I assumed they represented my grandparents' old house and the daycare center I once attended. They were old memories of old places. Before I could make these images more concrete and begin to try to remember their significance, I was ripped from my trance-like state by something my brother said. He was asking me if I remembered his imaginary friend. He said he used to think it was his guardian angel. I, myself, was around nine when he used to talk about this imaginary friend, and I tended to just ignore him when he spoke about it. I did remember, however, a time when I awoke to the sound of my brother whispering. I remember rolling over so that I could smack him and tell him to go to sleep, 
but immediately being startled by the sound of a deep, raspy voice that seemed to be responding to him. I must have blocked it out, but at that moment I could suddenly recall that night. I ran straight into our parents' room, waking them up and going on and on about a man in our room. Unfortunately, when my parents finally got up and went to investigate, my brother was sound asleep, and nothing was amiss. The window was closed and locked, the bed was clear underneath, and our closet only housed a few sweatshirts and board games. As this was all coming back to me, my own memory began to sharpen and reveal itself. It was as if a movie was being played on fast-forward of select moments from my early childhood. As an only child for the first few years of my life, it was not uncommon for me to have to settle on entertaining myself. Strangely enough, though, in the images streaming through my brain, a figure began to materialize. Frame by frame, as the scenes repeated themselves over and over again, a growing dark mist or smoke was taking shape. Christian had lost his temporary state of calmness and returned to sobbing uncontrollably, but the images continued to hold my attention. What was that thing in each of the scenes with me? Why did I feel some connection to it? The sobs of my brother grew into full-on wailing. Still, I could not be brought out of my current state. I had to know what my memory was trying to show me. At some point, my curiosity began to change to an all-too-familiar feeling of dread. I was coming to the realization that I knew exactly what was in those rooms with me. I had always known. I did not want to see it in its full form, but I could not look away. The images were in my head, not in front of my eyes. I could feel tears streaming once again down my cold, clammy face. I was sweating profusely and shivering uncontrollably, like one continuous chill running up and down my spine. It started with that unmistakable stench. It seemed to roll off of him like the smoke that surrounded his presence. Then I saw that hideously familiar naked body, with all of its twists and inhuman angles. I could hear a faint noise rising from somewhere in the background. No, it was welling up from inside me. I was screaming. The last thing I remembered before blacking out was that ungodly face, crooked and ghastly, somehow smiling without a mouth and seeing right into my soul with non-existent eyes. And to think, I now can vividly remember that three-year-old me used to be comforted by this hideous creature. He was, after all, my guardian angel. I have always enjoyed the paranormal for entertainment, but kept with me a healthy dose of skepticism when it came to real life stories. Growing up, my mother was very much into the supernatural or anything paranormal. Psychics, ghosts, the afterlife, you name it. This instilled in me from a very young age, a skeptical outlook on things of this nature. Instead, I would learn how psychic and paranormal experts fake evidence or cold read and things of this nature to basically debunk my mom, although I was always entertained by her stories on some level. She would always tell me stories about my supposed gift to communicate with ghosts from a very young age, and how my family members refused to babysit me because I creeped them out too much. I also have a lot of memories of being young and strange, unexplainable and downright creepy things happening to me all the time. But I would cope with it by justifying how there must be some logical explanation, such as sleepwalking or just my overactive child's mind or something. There is one experience though that always stuck with me that I witnessed as an adult. I wouldn't say it changed my mind, but there is something about this I cannot let go of or rationalize away. I even get a little bit emotional and start to tear up a little when I think about it today, which is unlike me. I am now 28 years old, but when I was 21, I worked in a four-star hotel and spa named Earth Castle in Scotland, located just outside of Stirling, 
where many of the bloody and violent wars Scotland is historically known for took place. This is a real place and already has a reputation for being haunted. I want to tell you my experiences of working in this hotel and the strange events I experienced while working there. To give context, the hotel is made up of two main buildings. The first is a new building, a typical hotel where the guests stay with luxury dining and spa, etc. The other building is the castle itself, which is mainly only used for weddings and one time Sean Penn stayed with us while filming a movie. That was pretty cool. I worked as a kitchen porter. My job was to wash dishes, clean up, basically all the kitchen duties which didn't involve cooking to allow the chef to focus on preparing the food. Whenever there was a wedding that needed to be catered for, some of us would be sent up to the castle to work there. Eventually, I refused to work in the castle. Of course, the staff there knew about the castle's reputation and would tell each other stories about what they had heard. In my skeptical mind, I simply rationalized it as local entertainment and just got on with my work. One of the most frequent occurrences that would be reported is that whenever guests would stay in the castle, they would phone the front desk in the main building and tell us that they could hear children playing and running around and ask if we could send somebody up to deal with the children. There never were any children in the building. The castle was always reserved for the bride and groom to have the place to themselves. I cannot stress how common this complaint was. Almost everyone who stayed in the castle reported the same story of being disturbed by the sounds of children playing in the hallways. Sometimes, late at night, I could hear the running coming from the upstairs balcony in the central room of the castle. If I was ever brave enough to go investigate, it would stop. The basement floor of the castle has been turned into a few guest rooms and a storage space for the staff to use. It looks like any other floor of a hotel, not the creepy basement of a castle that you might expect. There are reports that this floor is haunted by a groundskeeper, and I also have a few stories about people telling me about a phantom dog they could hear barking. I never encountered either of these spirits, but the reason that I'm mentioning it is that the basement floor of this castle especially terrified me. Every time I was there, I felt the most uncomfortable feeling, like when people tell you that they feel like someone's watching them. That entire floor gave me the most uneasy feeling, as if I could feel someone breathing down my neck or I was surrounded by something. I was never able to go down there without feeling stiff and having the most horrible feeling of dread come over me. It's hard to put into words. I hated going down there. If you stand outside the castle facing it, there's a dining room just to the left of the entrance on the ground floor. In this room, there's an enormous painting of a woman. I forget who she is, a wife of the commander or something who lived there. This painting was also especially creepy. She has such a stern look on her face which I guess was common for that era and style, very regal looking. There were a lot of unexplained noises that came from the area this painting is located in, like knocking, banging, things like that. One time, a group of us were standing in that room commenting on how depressing the painting looked, only to be interrupted by a slow scratching noise that went all the way from the top to the bottom of the 10 foot high wall that the painting was hanging on. Old castles like this do not have hollow walls, not like a loose piece of stone could have been falling inside, which was my first thought. We could never figure out where this noise came from. The most frightening moment inside that castle happened one night during a wedding. The chefs had finished with their jobs and had taken everything back down to the main building. I was left in the kitchen to finish washing up and cleaning. The guests had left and the bride and groom were, well, it's not my business what they were up to, but they were off in their suite. The only other people in the castle were a few remaining waitstaff also finishing tidying up. I went out the side door to the castle to have a cigarette. The southwest corner of the kitchen was the entrance to the kitchen. The southeast corner was the washing up area where I was working 
In the northeast corner was a passageway to a small room where we kept plates, cutlery, and a walk-in fridge. When I came back into the kitchen after finishing my cigarette, I could hear someone working in the back room, moving cutlery around and stacking plates. The normal sounds of someone else working, so I paid no attention to it and got back to washing dishes. After a few minutes, I heard the working sounds from the other room stop, and the room fell silent for a while. It sounded like nobody was moving, which I thought was strange. Another piece of information that you need to know is that another one of the girls I worked with and I would play this game where we would try to creep up on each other and scare the other person. When the sounds of the working stopped, there was an unusual silence. So I figured, aha, this is that girl and she's about to try to scare me. My plan was to continue working like normal. And then when she jumped out to try to scare me, I would be just as cool as a cucumber and be like, Nice try. I waited for a full minute, and she never jumped out. I waited for a second minute, still nothing. Thinking she was just really committed to this joke, I went to investigate. I walked into this room, and nobody was there. I cannot describe how hard my heart jumped when I walked into the room to find it empty. I started questioning my own sanity and kind of freaking out. I definitely heard someone working back there for a good 30 to 60 seconds before it stopped. The workstations the chefs used formed kind of an alley you had to walk through to get out of the kitchen. Nobody could have left that kitchen without walking directly by me washing dishes. And since I was on high alert, I definitely would have noticed somebody leaving. The incident really freaked me out. I had to leave the building for a while and I really didn't want to go back in to finish my shift. Another time, I was working in the same kitchen, and the night security guy came through looking confused and told me to follow him. This security guy also had more than his fair share of creepy stories while walking around this building at night, but back to that in a minute. He took me through to a room at the back, which had a small bar and was used to entertain the wedding guests sometimes. This room was not in use that night. He asked me to tell him if I could smell anything. Upon stepping into the room, I immediately was hit with an overwhelming smell of cigar smoke. He insisted that nobody had been using this room and the guests had left a while ago. Apparently, this room was previously used as the aforementioned commander's study where he would draw up battle plans and spend time alone. Since I was normally working quite late, I knew this night security guy pretty well. We talked about all the creepy stuff that we had both encountered in the castle, and he was insistent that it was not just stories. He began telling me of all his stories and just how commonly they occurred. After all, he was the guy who had to go check the castle out every time a guest complained about the children running around. He told me that his encounters were so frequent and impossible to ignore that he had begun to do deep research into the history of the castle and its previous inhabitants. Apparently, there were two children who had died in a fire there once, the children of the woman in the painting in the dining room. Their nanny had run back into the building to try to save them and was also killed in the fire. The night security guy told me that he had personally taken a photograph of the castle and in one of the upstairs rooms, slightly left of the entrance, you could clearly see a nanny with two children standing in front of her, looking out the window at him. Although shaken from other strange experiences, my rational, skeptical mind was still there. He was a tall, slim man in his 40s, spent a lot of time alone, walking around a castle, investigating disturbances constantly. I figured he might have been exaggerating or making it up just for a good ghost story. But the next day, he brought in the photo and showed me. In the upstairs window, just like he said, were two children and their nanny looking directly out the window, clear as day. I don't know if that man still works there or not, but he owns a picture that will give you the creeps. He doesn't seem to have put it online anywhere. I looked. 
If anyone from Earth Castle reads this, and a man matching that description still works there as a night security guard, tell him I'm looking for that picture. Once he showed me this photo, that was the last time I was ever in that castle. Every time a wedding was happening, I would refuse to go cater for it. I'm not going, send someone else, I would say. Eventually, I was fired from that job because the manager and I would frequently fall out over this. But honestly, I don't care. I never wanted to go near that place again. Despite keeping my skepticism, I admit there was something about that place that just wasn't right. I will remember that job and that castle until the day I die. Just thinking about being back in that building gives me the creeps. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25-mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40-pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. 
I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. 
He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. Before I get into the story, there are a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs, two German short-haired pointers and two dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa is that it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, like a maid or a gardener. The average family usually employs them. It's not just for wealthy people. For the story, our domestic worker is Ellie and our gardener is Vince. So this happened in 2007, when I was nine years old. My older brother, who was 10, and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad surprised us after work. 
You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyway, it's an important piece of information for later. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night for security reasons, but I remember that it was a hot summer night, so, of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room, setting up our new cell phones all excited. Ellie's daughter, Anne, who's like a sister to us, she was 18, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs wouldn't shut up and how annoying it was. And that's when I noticed it too. I mean, sure, they would bark, but it was usually the dachshunds that yapped. The bigger dogs just chilled out. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes and then they'd get over it. Something was different that night. Even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dog's incessant barking, and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head, and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either, because my brother asked to investigate with him and my dad agreed. I was obviously way too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow, when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling, and going nuts at a dark corner behind our swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that the garden beyond the pool hits like a slight decline, so we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad noticed how that lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it was just working. Either way, my dad said that he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of all of this, and just because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called them, and usually they would come running, but tonight they all seemed to just look at him, then turn back around and continue going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a flashlight sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come with him because of this feeling he had. When my brother went back inside to get the torch, my dad was slowly approaching the steps. He noticed how the dog seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched toward the steps, and as he put two and two together, it was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four other men in balaclavas, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was, that he saw my dad come outside with my brother, but that my brother went back into the house. Why? My dad said something came over him, and before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, He's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. He assumed that my dad couldn't understand, because it's not common for white people to speak it. But my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said in Zulu, Shit, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this effer, grab what we can, and go. The other seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge. He continued saying how he can't go back to jail, and they need to get out of there before the cops show up, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English and pretending not to understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drive in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller, scared guys started freaking out all the other guys, saying they had to leave right away or they'd be caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence, 
until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves, their plan slowly turning to crap. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they all started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto the crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn and dart into the house. As luck would have it, my dad ran into the veranda door. My oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arms mid-run, sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, I know, but I think he was just thinking about getting my brother inside. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything when my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slammed it shut, and told us to go upstairs to the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs, now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel not too far behind. We sat there in the darkness in silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed, saying she didn't have a phone. Neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it in than right now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, they asked where we lived. We explained, and they said it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only absolutely shitting ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes. Damn. He didn't close the veranda door. And what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic, and tells us that whatever we hear, we are not to come downstairs, to stay hidden no matter what. I'm now sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he says he has to go get Ellie and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there are even more tears, because reality hits that there are two other people still in danger. Anne is understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears, and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they said they'd be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They said to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or something indicating those men are in our house, but there was just silence. The only sound was the dogs barking outside. After what seemed like hours, but was most likely a couple of minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs, and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and just praying that it was my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while and nobody dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was the security company. And sure enough, it was. He opened up, and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees just buckling from the adrenaline my body had just endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed right over. We got an electric fence shortly after that. So there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad, and it's sickeningly common for torture and other things to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time, I didn't know the horrors of the world, and I was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel gives me chills to this day. The cops said that the fact that there were so many guys, instead of like one to three, indicated that these guys possibly had very sinister intentions. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family, 
and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night, our dogs. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened that night had it not been for our incredible dogs. From that day forward, my dad always gives them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. Rest in peace to all of you. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved just for you angels. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six or so years of my life. It's been a long time, so I don't really truly remember it. But I know I used to live in an apartment complex near a mire. Well, we ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and there were some disturbances I remember at my young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room so that my mother and I could use it as our room. I was really afraid to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had had separate rooms, so my grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. Well, one day we were taking a break from cleaning out the room, and we were laughing out in my grandma's room. I can't remember exactly why but my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something she had forgotten. It might have been a drink. Anyway, as I'm walking toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I've ever heard in my life. It almost sounded like something straight out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. A typical answer that a child would get from adults after telling a story like that and my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. On occasion, I would hear stuff. I would see shadows. I would sense that somebody was watching me, but I was never really truly bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that stuff was happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and keep me up some nights. But it was always interesting to me because I truly believed my house was haunted. I liked to pretend that it wasn't though, so I could sleep at night. My mom died on November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird and the feelings of being watched and noises and shadows increased, but nothing super significant. I always thought it was due to the fact that my grandma had like six cats. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid. I mean, they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep and before that I closed my bedroom door because one of the cats would come into the room all the time and wake us up by licking plastic stuff for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I was drawn to look at the bedroom door and it slowly opens. An almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room and stays close to the ceiling. As this is happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, No! Stop! And at this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, eeriest feeling that I've ever had in my life. I was so scared, but also simultaneously so tired that I covered my face with my blanket and eventually just passed out. I woke up the next day and everything seemed normal. I asked my friend about last night, and he said that he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. But when I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild, 
because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. He seemed to remember them all. There were other things that I can't remember. My dad said one night he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs and grab some food out of the fridge. When he says he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and he kind of stumbled back and looked, but then nobody was there. From his face when he tells this story, you can tell how sobering of an experience this had to have been. All of us, however, would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us when she hadn't. And, personally, I would just freeze and look in every direction to try to find where it had come from, but sometimes she wasn't even in the house. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly, until she finally called 911 and went into the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer, almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what I think was like a month, she ended up passing away. And ever since that day, the house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from like level 20 to 100. Stuff was being knocked over, voices were echoing from the hallways in the basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right into your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement, the list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house that always told me that when he went downstairs to take a shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. He was still trying to figure out how I was doing it. Until one day he realized that I wasn't because I had another friend of mine come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair black. I was in that phase already, so I helped him. He went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing a video game. He walks in and says, how the hell did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were really puzzled until he told us that somebody had kept shaking the door handle. My friend went pale, and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all scared and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my house again. Between hearing doors in the basement, seeing shadows, stuff like that, my dad kept telling me how when he was home by himself, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house which drove him back to alcoholism. Then one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat that we had had died. That was shortly before we moved out. When I say these encounters intensified, I mean it. All of my friends that came over just said that the house didn't feel right. It wasn't welcoming. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though at that point all the cats had passed and nobody would be there. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I'd get home, I'd go check and find that pretty much all of them were closed when nobody could have possibly been in the house. And this is just all my perspective. My friends, and my roommate especially, had their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I moved out into a new apartment, now a trailer, I haven't experienced anything else. It's been a nice change of pace, and I hope to never experience anything of that kind ever again. My family never really had money. My mom was a cleaning lady for the majority of my life and occasionally cut hair on the side in our basement. My dad was the get-rich-quick type who never wanted someone like a boss to answer to, and his ego, unfortunately, got in the way of making a living. At times, he did make some big money, but it was always in lump sums, which he spent as quickly as he got. In 1998, he invented and patented this newly engineered golf club 
and partnered with a few investors, and money was coming in frequently. He was even doing interviews on the local news about it. It caught some major buzz locally, and then nationally within a couple of years. Finally, he was bringing an income into the household. We always rented. I lived in three houses I know of by the time I was eight years old. Around my 10th birthday in 2001, my mom and dad told us they were looking for houses in a nicer area to buy. About a week later, my mom brought my brother, two sisters and I to see a house not far from the house that my parents rented. We pulled up and it was huge. Well, huge for us. We walked into the front room and it was wallpapered with, well, the only thing I could use for reference would be Snozberry's wallpaper from the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. The carpet was mint green and had two white French doors going into the dining room. The previous owner's son, who was a middle-aged graying man, didn't exactly greet us with a smile. He almost looked frustrated, like we were late, but we weren't. My siblings and I looked at each other as if my mom was crazy for wanting this weird-ass house. Then we saw it. He showed us into the kitchen. The kitchen was huge, with high ceilings. It was half of the first floor, and all knotty pine. The walls, the cupboards, the walk-in pantry, shelves that rounded the entire kitchen. That was the selling point. It was beautiful and something you don't see much of in humble old colonial homes. Two small bedrooms upstairs with barely a hallway, both naughty pine as well, a little overkill, and also creepy for a bedroom that isn't in a cottage, but hey. My parents opted to make the whole semi-finished basement into their master bedroom. My mom was dead set on buying it and persuaded my dad. We still talk about how all of us felt this pull into this house. We moved in a couple of months later at the end of summer. My job that afternoon was to attempt to put mine and my brother's bed frames together with the headboard. I didn't know what I was doing, so I started stacking all the nuts and bolts to see how high I could get them before my dad finally came in to do it for me. My mom promised my sisters, who were directly across the hall from me and my brothers, that if they got the smaller room, they could paint it. So my brother and I got the bigger room, with one built-in dresser and a little small door that went into a huge attic, which was another room in itself. I haven't dared to go into the attic, or even wanted to open the door, though. The door looked like it was meant for children, though almost like an entrance to a treehouse, or a door for a Keebler elf's hut, like on those cookies. I didn't like that, and I definitely didn't like that I had to sleep next to it. As I'm sitting there stacking nuts and bolts, I hear a woman clearly say, no. I look into my sister's room thinking that it's one of them, or my mom, but it wasn't. I would have heard somebody coming up the stairs and hit the hallway. So I turn around in my sister's doorway, and I feel the air get thick. Like, I could almost feel the body heat from someone standing too close. I can only explain the feeling as almost like that feeling when you can't focus, because someone keeps fidgeting and moving around. I ran down the stairs and out the back door, where my mom was smoking a cigarette, talking to our new neighbors. To them, I just looked like some kid running around the new house but I was terrified. Fast forward to winter and we're all settled in. My godparents came over to give me a gift a couple of weeks before Christmas. I opened it and it was a lime green comforter that had football helmets of every NFL team. Cool, if I ever cared about football at all. It was big and warm, so it quickly became my favorite thing in the world. They left late, and we were told since it's Saturday we can watch TV in our rooms until whenever. So I brought my new comforter to bed and turned on a nick at night, quickly falling asleep. I wake up, and the TV is still on. Mind you, mine and my brother's twin beds are right next to each other, and both are against a wall with a gap in the middle to get out. I look over at my brother, and his back was to me. Then I go to look at the TV 
which is directly in front of us on the built-in dresser, and I adjust my eyes. I see a woman sitting on the edge of my brother's bed, dark long hair, what looks like a dark purple cardigan, and a dark floral skirt. The only light source was from the TV, and it was illuminating her features. I couldn't put into words or reference how she looked until recently when I watched the movie The Knowing, which is a horrible Nicolas Cage movie. But in the movie, you couldn't quite see all of the alien's face, just a silhouette of the light and darkness. That's the best way I could describe it. I see a ring that appears to be catching light on her finger. I have no clue if it was on her finger or if she was holding it. She just sat there on the edge of my brother's bed, head down, and admiring this ring that was catching the light off of my television screen. She didn't seem to notice me. I tried to sink into my mattress and slip my head under my new comforter, and I just laid there, in shock. I waited until I heard my mom start the coffee pot to run to the kitchen and tell her what had happened. I even drew her a picture. She believed me. My dad, not so much. Almost the exact same experience happened again two years later, with my sister, when we switched rooms, because two teenage girls obviously need a bigger space. There was nothing paranormal that we noticed happening in between those experiences. It happened, and we would never bring it up. My dad's new and improved golf club had one little problem. There was a defect. The head was flying off left and right on numerous orders. My dad was back to being broke. You'd think a mortgage, a wife, and four kids would give him a little pep in his step to get a steady job, at least in the interim, but nope. Back to the drawing boards, and back to us kids helping clean banks with my mom on the weekends for extra money. The fighting started. The divorce happened. Dad moved out, and Mom stayed in the house with us. By this time, I'm 14, my first year of high school, and finally I could go out with my friends, even the ones who had cars. My mom started drinking heavily on the weekends around this time, and would frequently call whatever friend I was with that had a cell phone and spout out her Taco Bell order because she knew we would end up there at some point before I came home. My sisters worked doubles together at an Italian restaurant every weekend, so my mom would always be home by herself having a pity party and getting drunk. My mom calls my friend and I tell her not to answer. I told her that I would just get the regular Supreme burrito with no beans that she always orders. I get home and she's in the living room and she starts telling me about a man she was talking to. He looked like a young Elvis, she said, and he sat in the chair across from where she laid on the love seat. She was drunk. I didn't pay it any attention. She was just rambling about a dream, I was sure. The next day, the friend who my mom had called came over and told me that she wanted to play the voicemail that my mom had left her when she called the day before. My mom had said, Hey, I just wanted to see what you guys were up to, and if you go to Taco Bell, could you get me the regular thing I ask for? Then the phone stays connected. She never hangs up. At first, you hear nothing then a conversation between her and a man. At points, she interrupts him, wondering who he is. You can't really tell what he's saying, only bits and pieces, but my mom's voice is clear. Then he told her at the end, as clear as day, please lay on your side just in case you get ill. I got instant chills. My friend was visibly disturbed, even after already hearing it, and I felt sick. We played it for everyone, and they all had the same reaction. My mom remembers none of it. She doesn't remember telling me about the man, and she doesn't remember the incident. We forgot about it, and we never talked about it anymore. My dad got sick of living with his own mother, and the house was in his name, so he legally kicked my mom out, and at this point my older sister moved in with her fiancé, and my other sister moved with mom to a house that they rented a few minutes away. My brother and I stayed behind because my mom got a job as a caregiver for that winter in Florida. As soon as my dad moved back in, things took a turn. He did not believe in ghosts. He was a huge skeptic. Until around 2007. 
He sat up in bed late at night and was smoking a cigarette. He had a big, solid oak sleigh bed, and it had a huge headboard. He started hearing knocks and felt the vibration on the headboard because his back was resting on it as he sat up. He stood up and it stopped. He sat down and relaxed his back, back up against the headboard. Something started knocking, then pounding hard on the headboard. He stood up and came to the basement stairs and called us down there so that we could witness this, trying to make us believe in something that we already knew was there. A couple of days later, Christmas lights flew across the room like somebody had yanked them. A couple of days after that, loud sounds of what sounded like scraping metal across concrete came from the attic. A week later, my brother's sleeping and gets punched in the face. A couple of days after that, my dad's girlfriend sees a hand appear over him in bed. That upcoming weekend, the kitchen chair moved into the hallway while we were all in the living room watching movies. Coffee teaspoons and hairbrushes would disappear and reappear. Sounds of people going up the stairs. Friends who knew nothing about any of this would see what looked like someone walking back and forth from the upstairs bedroom. It got bad. We were all terrified. My dad was screaming into the void. He couldn't protect us or beat the ass of whoever was doing all of this. By this time, my dad was working, probably just to get out of the house which meant he had to take plenty of business trips. While coming home from Virginia, Bate had it that at the airport, he met Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson from the sci-fi show Ghost Hunters. They were coming to investigate a haunted prison for the show. My dad just started watching their show because of all the things happening in our house and only went over to them with the sole intention of getting help for what we were going through. They set him up with contacts to a paranormal group that they knew well for our area. They came, they saw, and they told us that it was definitely paranormal activity. The psychic said that there was a man who liked to hang out in the basement and the living room. A greaser type, with slick back hair and cigarettes rolled in his sleeve, kind of like a young Elvis. Also, he loved my dad's new car. A woman who was reserved and quiet who liked the attic and the naughty pine bedroom was there too. An impatient and angry old woman who paces around everywhere and likes the living room was also there. The team set up cameras, tripods, and microphones around the whole house before shutting off the lights. The only things eventful that happened the night of was a camera and a tripod were thrown to the ground in the attic and everyone heard that metal against concrete scraping sound. It was so loud it sounded like it was in the middle of the room. They left and when they came back a few days later, they had evidence. A woman's voice was caught saying no before the camera and tripod flew forward in the attic. The investigators, while bending down to go through the attic door to set up the tripod, said that one of the cameras in the naughty pine room caught a woman saying, crawl out, you have to crawl out. There were growls. There were snarky remarks said in the basement and a man's voice saying, where is she? The investigators did the whole spiel. You're dead, it's time to go to the other side. It was a lot to take in. My dad, who was raised Catholic, asked if they could set up a home blessing, which we got that afternoon and we all had to take part in. It did definitely settle down after that. There are a lot more things that went on in that house, but I'm writing a novel over here. This house somehow sticks with all of us in my family. My friends still talk about the house. I dream about it all the time. It sounds funny, but there's a definite trauma that lingers when you spend your adolescent years living in a place like that. I think it's so strange, like it still has a hold on all of us. Everyone's pins, passwords, and top secret codes are the numbers of that address, still, and we haven't lived there since 2010. The weird pull that we all have to this house, telling each other when we happen to drive by it, the way we weirdly miss it, it's just strange. In 
In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm going to have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around, taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. 
It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study, where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was all right. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. 
Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13 and 3. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. Years ago, my parents bought a piece of land in the southwestern Colorado prairie, near the Werfano River, deep in the middle of nowhere. I've lost count of all the camping trips that we had in my dad's expansive canvas tent atop what we would later dub as Cyclone Hill. On account of the furious winds we've experienced, camping atop the hill. Some gusts powerful enough to rock our old F-150 back and forth. Immediately upon exiting the car, you feel the land. Call them spirits or psychic remnants, or just the knowledge of so many eras past leaving an indelible mark. The feeling of being watched is instant, constant, and lasting. Below Cyclone Hill is a spiraling labyrinth of arroyos dug out from flash floods over time. What's cool is that the deepest arroyos connect and lead a trail down south to where the road curves around the land and heads west, if you know which arroyos to follow. Usually this road is washed out completely, and instead of hard dirt road, there's about a foot or two of quick mud. As a kid growing into a teenager and then an adult, I have learned how to track animals that use the arroyo trails at night. Most of these are just coyotes, which yip and sing throughout the night. Eerie at first, maybe, but I've always found it kind of cute, listening to them make their way throughout the Arroyo Labyrinth, yipping and howling and singing all the way. There are jackrabbits that are almost too fast to see, lizards that live in the woodpile, and about a billion different bugs. There are beautiful families of hawks living in selected areas. For years, a great white owl lived in an old dried-off chute of the river, near cliff walls that rise on either side of the Werfano, the farther east you walked, and occasionally you would hear this owl screech, and it was the most hauntingly beautiful thing you might ever hear. The only neighbors we had were tarantulas about the size of a frying pan that liked to say hi to you in the morning by climbing up on the walls of the tent. Honestly, they're very friendly. So now that I've established this area to you, and hopefully demonstrated that I know this land like the back of my hand, let me explain, or try to explain, what happened to my dad and I one random day camping at our land. We always wake early to watch the sunrise, which is always worth it. It was summer, and the temperature at midday climbed into the hundreds, so you relished the cool, sweet, dewy mornings. While drinking coffee, my dad, sitting off at our table, leashed to the tent so the wind didn't take it to Kansas, I walked around to the west side of our 12 by 12 canvas tent to where we keep a sizable wood pile for our camping stove. As I turned the corner to walk along and inspect our wood pile, I noticed something odd. And when I looked down, 
I saw a footprint. The prairie dirt was displaced with a perfect shoe print. It was a simple shoe pattern, very oval, like bulky skate shoes, except with a more rounded sole. The shoe itself was maybe a size five, tiny, especially compared to my size 12 boot. I knelt down to look at it, and that's when I realized that there were more, both in front of and behind me. Behind the tent, about 35 to 40 yards, is the road you come in on, that curves westward after sloping down about a mile south. The footprints came from that direction. At this point, in sort of a half crouch, completely forgetting the coffee in my hand, I followed the tracks all the way to the road. They were almost perfect indents every time, and what made me very puzzled was how long the stride was. Imagine your normal step and how long of a stride that takes up. Now take into account height and possible leg length. Now this is possible, I guess, but isn't it odd to imagine somebody with very tiny feet goose stepping along the prairie, making strides that you would see someone making if they were over six feet tall? I certainly thought it was strange as I tried to match the stride and couldn't, even though I'm over six feet tall. Plus, with this strange stride, I could rule out my mother and sister, who A, weren't there, and B, had short legs. Nobody else came here. There are no houses or people, and our land is clearly marked and fenced, about as well as you can fence that land. At the road, the tracks stop. And I don't mean I lost them down the road. I mean, they stopped. There was the road, and then two perfect side-by-side -side prints, as if someone had set their shoes down. Nothing before that. The idea that somebody could drive up to our camp, jump out, and walk past our tent is creepy, but I find it very hard to believe. If you've never been to the prairie, you might have gotten the idea from my mentioning of the wind and animals that nights out here are loud as they are in the mountains or foothill campgrounds with lots of bugs and animal noises, you would be wrong. Yes, you can hear the coyotes, but they aren't nearly loud enough to penetrate the quiet of the night. It's so quiet that the slightest of sounds would wake up any moderate to heavy sleeper, and both my dad and I are light sleepers. The tracks I found by the tent and woodpile literally passed by my dad's head on the other side of the canvas tent. Whatever made them literally could have touched him, they were so close. With the way they were walking, too, I find it very difficult to believe we wouldn't have heard them, considering we've been woken up many times to critters coming to check out our tent. Is it possible that I misread the tracks? Sure, I guess. But bear in mind that I've been doing this my whole life, and I've tracked animals back to their dens before. It's much easier in the prairie compared to the mountains or grassland because the ground is dirt, and displaced dirt looks different than non-displaced dirt. A shoe print is a shoe print, and the distance between them was long enough to make me believe that this person was goose-stepping or just very tall with very long legs and very tiny feet. And that is just very odd. So where do the tracks go? By now I've informed my dad and showed him everything that I have found up until that point, including freaking him out some by pointing out how close the tracks were to him, separated by just a sheet of canvas. We geared up and followed the tracks out past the tent and down. The tracks descended the hill, never breaking the long stride, which is not only hard as hell to do, but dangerous, as the prairie dirt could easily slide on you and send you down the hill face first. I know this from experience. Once down the hill, the tracks descend into the arroyos and to our shock, perfectly follow the arroyo trail. We track these footprints with true trepidation, growing more and more perplexed as the tracks crazily walked up and down the arroyo walls at such extreme angles that whatever made them had to be walking almost sideways at some points. When we reached the road and the washout, we found the tracks stopped once again, just as they had appeared at the top of the slope. Only now, 
We would be able to tell if a car passed through here and picked up whoever the footprints belonged to, but there were no tracks. The washout was nice and flat, free of any human-made tracks. This freaked me out. It's not possible that you could pass through this area and not leave some kind of mark. I made a search in widening loops from the center of the washed out road, covering at least 100 feet in every direction, picking up the original tracks that led to the dead end and not finding them reappear anywhere. They were just gone. I put my hand in the last two tracks, both feet again side by side, like someone had taken their shoes off and stuck them in the perimeter of the mud to make two perfect prints. They were still soft and pliable. The mud hadn't hardened yet, still wet from the evening before. We pushed on toward the Warfano, all the while our eyes fixed on the ground, trying to find even the slightest hint of a track. There was nothing. Whatever it was, its tracks appeared on our road somewhere between 11.30 at night and 4.30 in the morning when my dad woke up, and they walked past two grown men, both very light sleepers, passing mere inches from one of their faces, then proceeded to goose step down a hill, down into the arroyos and run up and down the arroyo walls as it marched on down the washed out road it had just been on, only to then stand perfectly still, feet side by side, and disappear all in the middle of the night, all in the middle of nowhere on a random summer night. To this day, I think about those prints and really wonder what they could have been. The skeptic in me is just as puzzled as the believer in me. I really have no idea how or why this small-footed, long-legged person or thing just casually walked past our tent, down into some arroyos, which at night are dark and spooky as hell, and then disappeared back into the night it had come from. I've discussed this with my dad, and he holds the opinion that it may be a good thing we didn't wake up to see whatever the hell was out there. Because while we've never felt afraid down there, that day, we did. In all the years before and since, we've never had any encounters like that. And while we have had other weird things happen to us down there, involving voices on the wind and other weirdness, nothing tops that for me. And at night, when I'm all alone, lying in bed thinking about this, I can't help but wish I had seen it, whatever it was, because the mystery of it will confound and thrill me until my dying day. I was talking to an old friend about maybe going on an impromptu ghost hunt this month, and during the conversation, we reminisced about some of the creepy stuff that we had experienced over the years. We remembered a particular event that stuck out with us, and it's one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The story begins with my friend, who we'll call T, and myself searching a hidden attic-like space in his house for a supposed stash of money allegedly left there by a previous tenant. Truth be told, I think that was just a story his mom told us to get us off the Xbox for a while. It was the heyday of Halo, and she was probably just sick of us sitting in front of his TV. But whether or not the story she told us was true, we wound up in this small and low-ceilinged attic space, which could only be accessed by a tiny door, hidden in the wooden panels in the wall. We'd known about the door for a while, but had never bothered to go in, mostly because the door seemed like it had been sealed somehow, and we couldn't be bothered with actually using our brains and finding something to pry it open. But the prospect of finding free money in a dusty old room was too much, so we called a few friends to come help search the place. And after a few pries with a putty knife and a flathead screwdriver, we cracked the door open and began to explore. At first, it didn't seem like much was in there. Some old clothes and papers scattered about, and a desk in the corner. But through the gloom and dust, we could see something against the far wall, which turned out to be a very old cot of some kind. 
It was either busted in half or was meant to fold in half, but either way it was folded over on itself, and we could see something covered in cloth and sandwiched between the two halves. Of course, we wouldn't be good treasure hunters if we didn't look at the covered thing, so we start making our way over to the folded cot. I take a few steps forward, and my foot goes right through the floor like it's made of wet paper. Luckily, though T was right behind me, he had very quick reflexes. His hand shot out and grabbed the back of my shirt to keep me from falling forward, and probably all the way through the floor. We took a second to laugh at the situation, and realized that we should probably stick to the sides of the room, as the center was most likely the weakest, and probably the most likely to collapse under our weight. So we tiptoe all the way around the wall of the room, until we get to the cot, where we start unfolding it to get to the covered thing. This is where things got strange. As soon as we touched the cot, the room got very cold, which was odd because we were in an attic in mid-July. At the time, we thought nothing of it. We were certain we had found the stash. We were moments away from being rich. So we unfold the cot, which took all of our combined strength from how rusted and decrepit the thing was. Honestly, I was surprised it didn't just crumble to dust at the first touch. Finally, we got it unfolded and found that it was, in fact, a decently sized wall mirror that had been wrapped in a sheet or a thin blanket. As soon as we uncovered the mirror, the tiny door that we had come through slowly swung shut. Again, we didn't think anything about it. Must have been a gust of air or something. We were a little disheartened by the lack of money, but T's mom had sent us in there with her camera to take pictures of anything interesting so she could see what was inside, since she wouldn't be going in herself. So we snap a couple of pictures of the mirror, the cot, and the random debris lying around. Now here, it's important to note that the mirror's reflective surface was absolutely caked with dust. You could barely tell that the mirror was a mirror, the dust was so thick. Yet the base of the mirror, which looked and felt like it was made of some sort of ceramic, was practically pristine. When I say the base, I mean the part of the mirror in which the reflective surface was set, not the actual bottom of the mirror. I found that to be very odd, as the whole mirror had been covered by the sheet. So why would any of it be dusty at all, let alone just a specific part like that? So we snap the pictures and are about to call it quits when we hear the dogs barking downstairs. That usually meant that somebody was at the door so we carefully make our way along the walls and out of the room to head downstairs. It turned out to be our friend, who we'll call B, who had come to help us search for the supposed stash. After we told her about the attic room, she wanted to see it for herself. So naturally, we took her up and showed her the tiny door. Before we even set foot into the room, we told her about the crappy floor and to only walk along the walls. Of course, she either didn't take us seriously, or she just didn't understand what we had said, because she takes a couple of steps toward the cot and falls almost all the way through the floor, practically right through the small hole that I had created earlier. So she's sitting there with her upper body still in the attic, and her legs dangling down through the ceiling of the kitchen. It was at this moment that I heard one of the most hilarious sentences I've ever heard. Through the now large hole in the floor, we could hear T's mom on the phone with someone when she said in a very flat and nonchalant tone, I have to go now, there are children falling through my ceiling. So we get B out of the floor and have a good laugh about the situation. And once we're sure she was okay, we all agreed it was probably best to just leave the room alone before we caused any more damage. We get out and all the way downstairs when T pipes up that he'd forgotten the camera and a flashlight in there. So I agreed to go back in with him to grab them. We thought it wouldn't take but a second as he remembered setting them both down on the floor close to the hole when we were helping B get out. But when we got there, we were a little confused. We couldn't see the camera or the flashlight anywhere. We looked all over the floor thinking maybe we'd kicked them around on our way out or when we were helping B, but they weren't there. We were about to go check if he had maybe set them outside the door or something when we were shutting it behind us, when T stopped dead in his tracks 
and whispered my name. I looked over, and in an instant, I knew what had made him stop. The mirror was covered up with the sheet again, only this time the outline of the camera and flashlight could be seen under the cover. We stood there and stared at it for a good minute or two before T got brave enough and started making his way along the wall to get over to the cot. I followed on very shaky legs and I watched as he pulled the cover off the mirror to reveal that his camera and flashlight were indeed hidden under the sheet along with the words, help me, scrawled in the dust beside them. It was like something out of a horror movie, and honestly, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it. The nope factor must have been too much for T, because he snatched up his stuff and made a beeline for the door, with me close behind. We slammed the door shut behind us and never went back in. T's mom thought we were making the whole thing up, until we went back and looked through the camera. We had pictures of the cod and the mirror, both before and after messing with them. One of the folded cot with the covered mirror still hidden, one of the open cot with the covered mirror revealed, and one of the uncovered mirror, which showed no writing in the dust. But there was one final picture, which convinced his mom that we were telling the truth and that she should never open that door again. The last picture was taken seemingly from atop the cot and clearly showed the giant hole where B had fallen through, which meant that after T had put the camera down so that we could get B out of the hole, someone else had picked it up from beside the hole after we left, carried it and a flashlight over to the mirror, and snapped a picture after setting it down. That had to have happened very quickly, because we were only out of the room for three minutes at most. T realized he'd forgotten his camera almost as soon as we'd gotten downstairs. The only ones that were there were T, his mom, myself, and B. His dad and older brother were at work, and even if they had come home, they would have had to pass us on the stairs to get up to the attic. There's just no way that I can logically explain the writing on the mirror, and to this day, I still think about what was in that attic with us. I grew up in southern Pennsylvania, not far from Gettysburg. When I was eight years old, my parents decided to build a house on vacant property, surrounded by fields, and it was beautiful. I lived with both of my parents and my two older brothers, who were 15 and 17 at the time. Though I grew up in the area, we only stayed in this house for four years. My first night there was not what I expected it to be. I was laying in my bed and had just closed my eyes. Then I heard a voice that sounded like a soft whisper about six inches from my face say, help, help, over and over, just repeating the same word until I finally fell asleep. I tried my best to forget about it because I thought there was no way the house could be haunted. It was brand new. Certainly I was just tired. About a month goes by and I'm sitting on my bed doing what I used to love doing most, which was read. I glanced up and looked at my doorway because I had seen something out of the corner of my eye. At that moment, I had officially seen a full body apparition of what appeared to be a soldier from the 1800s but he didn't see me. He was just walking by my room very slowly. I still remember every detail of his appearance 20 years later. He was covered in blood and looked like he'd been shot or stabbed. This lasted for about five seconds. Still being creeped out, my curiosity got the best of me and I walked out of the room and searched all over the house, but I found nothing unusual. About a week or two goes by, and I'm in my bed, trying to fall asleep yet again, only to be disturbed before I even had the chance to close my eyes. This voice was very deep and masculine. I couldn't understand a word it was saying because it was speaking in a different language. It sounded annoyed 
and angry. It happened every night at the exact same time for two weeks, before it suddenly and inexplicably stopped. After that, I had a night terror. I am absolutely terrified of spiders. I had woken up in the middle of the night, and I could see what looked like a tarantula crawling on me in bed. I swear it was there. I definitely saw it. I was panicking. My dad came in the room to check on me and found that everything was okay. No spider. Before I could fall asleep though, I heard what sounded like two men laughing right next to my bed. At this point, I was getting used to all the messed up things that were happening. One summer, I stayed up late every night so I could watch Hannah Montana at midnight. One night, when the clock struck midnight, I heard my back door downstairs open. Then I would hear a woman say my name as if she was calling for me or looking for me. I'd hear the door shut, followed by footsteps, and then there would be silence. This happened every night for almost two months. It never failed. It didn't even bother me at this point. I knew it wasn't my mother because she worked 12 hour night shifts at the hospital almost every night. There were no other females around, but one night it too stopped altogether. I was up at midnight and nobody had called my name. I went to sleep and everything felt peaceful for once. I woke up to the sound of someone knocking on my bedroom door. I looked at the clock on my cable box. It was 3 a.m. I assumed that it was one of my brothers and I told them to go away, but then the doorknob started turning but it wouldn't open because the door was locked. I have always slept with my bedroom door open, always, and I definitely wasn't the one who locked it. The knocking and doorknob rattling went on for what felt like forever, and then it stopped. A few minutes later, I hear what sounds like scratching at the door. I think to myself, what the heck, is it my cat? but then the knocking, scratching, and turning of the handle start happening at the exact same time. No way in hell my cat could do all three at once, let alone the knocking and turning of the doorknob. It would happen for about 30 seconds, and then it would stop. It happened at least five times. Sometimes the knocking would be so hard it sounded like pounding, and my whole door was shaking. Whatever was on the other side of that door really wanted to come in. It got so bad that it woke my dad up. He heard all of the commotion, and as soon as he opened his bedroom door, it all stopped, instantly. He called out to me, but I was too afraid to say anything. He went back into his room and closed the door, but the same scenario repeated itself three more times. My dad made me sleep in his room. We never spoke about it, ever. Things seemed to be fine for a while. Then whatever was in my house struck again. My brother had gotten up to go to the bathroom. He turned the hallway light on, noticed that my bedroom door was closed as it was across the hall from the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom and the hallway light is off and my bedroom door was wide open. He looked inside my room and saw me still sleeping. Everyone else in the house was sleeping. He woke my dad and brother and told them what had happened. They searched the house for a possible intruder, but found nothing. More months go by and we are all awoken by our smoke detector going off in the middle of the night. We all go downstairs in a panic just to find out that the stove was on, full blast, big flames on top of the stove, in the middle of the night. What the hell? One day it was just my father and I. My mom was at work as usual. My oldest brother was at work and my other brother was at baseball practice. I'm downstairs, but I hear what sounds like somebody running upstairs. Forgetting that both of my brothers aren't home, I go up the stairs and see somebody run into my brother's room and slam the door. It was loud. I thought for sure it was my brother and I wanted to go in there and see what he was up to and why he would be running around like that. I opened the door and nobody was there. I watched the door close right in front of me. 
I felt sick to my stomach just standing there, realizing that the only other person that was home was my father, and he was in the shower. I continued to see weird things all the time. One day, in the middle of the day, I saw my German Shepherd run upstairs full blast as if she was chasing something, but I never saw what she was chasing. Whatever it was went under the bed, and she was viciously growling at it. At first I thought it was my cat, until I saw him sitting on top of the bed. It appeared that he had been sleeping until we burst in and woke him up. One night, my cousin was spending the night. We were walking through the living room when she saw the reflection of another person on the glass of our big bookcase. Another time, we were in my backyard, and she told me that she saw somebody looking at us through the window. I guess this happened on a few occasions, but it wasn't anybody we knew. My brothers almost never had friends over, so that was not a possibility. I remember one day I was walking down the basement stairs. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw what looked like another apparition, except the apparition looked exactly like my older brother, but it also didn't look human. It was almost white and blue, and his eyes were pure black, like something trying to be him. When he saw me, his eyes got really big, and he looked terrified, and ran away and went into the crawl space. I ran upstairs to find out that my brother wasn't even home. I never went back down there after that. A few months later, I was with the same brother, and we were in the living room watching George Lopez late at night. I'm into the show, but he muted the TV. He looked at me and said, Did you hear that? I told him no, I hadn't heard anything. We sat still for a minute, and then I did hear it. Together, we both heard footsteps coming up the basement stairs. My brother grabbed a baseball bat, and we went to the basement to investigate, but to no avail. The rest of our family was sleeping upstairs. The next night, my mom was up late at night sitting at the dining room table, doing whatever it was she was doing. Around 3 a.m., the shelf in the dining room flew off the wall and put a hole in the wall that was adjacent to it. We looked at the nails in the wall that had held the shelf in place, and they were still perfectly straight. We moved out of that house when I was 12. I still experience paranormal things, but nothing that comes close to what I dealt with in that house. I believe there were a lot of spirits there, and I'd love to know about what happened there previously to cause so much activity. We were a regular church-going family, so I'm sure if there was anything demonic there, that probably pissed it off even more. But I don't know. What do you think it could have been? Ghosts? Demons? Poltergeists? All of the above? What's your story? This happened about nine or ten years ago, but it's something that I've never figured out, and maybe something I'll never figure out, but it has stuck with me all this time. Let me preface this by saying that I do get sleep paralysis. I've had more instances of sleep paralysis than I can count, but I'll say an average of four times a year for the past 30 years. Some years it's more often, some years it's less, but by the time this experience occurred, I was well versed enough to be able to identify when it was happening and to be able to pull myself out of it. Generally, when I get sleep paralysis, I can hear everything around me, but I can't move or make a noise. I've never seen the old hag, and only once have I seen the man in the wide-brimmed hat. He had red eyes when I saw him. And yes, he was pushing down my chest. Not cool. Not fun. I never want that to happen again, but I also knew that he wasn't real as it was happening. So about 1% of the time I've had a visual hallucination. Usually it's just that I can't move or speak, but I can hear everything around me, and somehow I can see the room even though my eyes are closed. But this? It doesn't fit the mold of sleep paralysis, at least not in any way I've ever experienced it. That's why it bothered me so much then, 
and why it still bothers me now. My son was young at the time, five or six. My then husband, now ex, and I drove to visit my grandmother for Christmas. She lives about a hundred miles away from me. She has two extra bedrooms, but other family members scooped up the extra rooms before we could. So my husband and I rented a hotel room a few miles from her house. It was something like a Best Western or Holiday Inn. If I had to guess, I would say at the time it was less than 10 years old. We checked into our hotel room quickly, dropped off our stuff, and went straight to my grandmother's house. We had Christmas dinner with the family. I don't think I had any alcohol at all. If I did, it might have been one glass of wine. It was a long drive down to her house, two hours at least, and then an eventful evening, so we were beat. We left Grandma's house at about 9 p.m. and headed back to the hotel room. We drove around for an extra 20 minutes, trying to get our cranky son to sleep, which made me even more exhausted. The exhaustion is the thing that had me thinking maybe this was sleep paralysis, because that usually does trigger it for me. But again, what happened next is like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. The layout of the room is this. The hotel room door opened up to a little hallway and directly to the left was the bathroom with a tiny closet next to it. Moving just past the hallway, the wall on the left turned 90 degrees and the beds were to the left. To the right, you could follow the wall straight to the corner. There was a dresser along that wall and in the corner was an armchair. From that corner, follow that wall and there was a window facing the parking lot. In the next corner, there was another armchair maybe three feet from the head of one of the queen beds. That was where my husband and I slept. My husband slept on the side near the armchair and I slept on the inside so I could be closer to our son in the other bed. My son fell asleep in the car. I tucked him in and very quickly got changed and got in bed. My husband got in bed only moments later and I shut the lights off. Before I fell asleep, I observed that the light from the parking lot peeked in over the top and around the sides of the window curtain. It was brighter than I would have imagined with the curtain drawn, but I was too exhausted for it to bother me, so I passed out pretty quickly. Sometime in the middle of the night, I hear the click of a door handle turning. It was the lever kind. I was alarmed, but my body was still heavy with sleep. I'm also facing the direction of the door. I watch as the orange light from the hotel hallway slides across the wall opposite of me and then slowly disappears as the door closes again, quietly. I felt like I was passing in and out of sleep, so the sight of this almost had a strobing effect. A young man wearing medium blue baggy jeans and no shirt walked past the ends of our beds. At this point, I'm more alert but I'm laying in bed trying to figure out if this is real or not. It was so vivid. But I also had this feeling that I was still passing in and out of consciousness. From the moment I heard the click of the door handle, I was scared out of my mind, but still so tired. I wanted to get up. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't tell what was holding me in bed, whether it was fear or exhaustion. At this point, the man is behind me. I can feel him looking at me, but I'm absolutely terrified to turn over. If I turn over, will it spook him? Will he attack my family? Right now, I can tell he's not moving, just looking. I finally feel alert enough, and I realize my eyes are closed. What? But I can feel him in the room. I saw him, even though I had no way to. It was the scariest thing I've ever done because I knew I might be facing an attacker in my hotel room, but I forced my eyes open and turned over. Nothing. There's no one in the room. My heart is racing. I mean, Jesus, that was so real. I look at my husband and he's fast asleep with his back turned to me, snoring gently. My son is asleep. Everything is how it was when I fell asleep. I'm still on my back, 
looking at the armchair in the corner at the end of the beds, with the soft white light of the parking lot falling onto the chair as I calm down enough to fall back asleep. I can't tell you how much time passed, but it was dark, and then, all of a sudden, I see the armchair in the corner at the foot of the bed again, but this time, the man that had entered the room earlier was sitting in it. With the light shining from the window, I can see him a little bit better. It's a soft light, but I can tell his hair is buzzed short, and it's a dark brown. He looks young, maybe 18 to 25. He's either white with a tan or perhaps Hispanic. I can't see his facial features too well, but he could be a model. I don't know celebrities well enough to be able to compare him to somebody, but he had strong cheekbones, sort of a perfect straight nose, and a strong jaw. Like I said, it was too dark to see the details, but this is what I gathered from his silhouette. He was just sitting there, calmly staring at me. He didn't feel threatening or menacing, but I was still scared out of my mind, because there's a guy in my room in the middle of the night staring at me. This time, the line between asleep and awake is even blurrier in my head. Am I asleep? Are my eyes even open? I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. I can feel my husband asleep next to me, so I decide the best move is to try to discreetly wake him. He's still snoring with his back turned to me, but my hand is on the bed next to his back, so I decided to slowly move my hand closer and poke him. I poked him a few times, but he's passed out and not reacting at all. I was so pissed. I mean, he was dead to the world. Finally, I decided, F this. I'm not dealing with this alone anymore. So I turned toward my husband slightly, and I lift myself onto my elbow. This is where I'm sure I'm awake, but everything before that was blurry. I was about to grab his arm and shake the hell out of him when I noticed the man in the corner, in the chair, is no longer there. Now I feel crazy. I mean, what's going on? Where is this guy? Is he real or not? I was so tired, frustrated, confused, and scared. This man felt real. The details were so vivid. But as I'm trying to sift through what was real and what wasn't, I realize I can only see or feel this guy when I'm asleep. I pray to myself that this is the end of it, and I finally convinced myself that it was just my brain creating an elaborate lucid dream and that I was safe. I was convinced it should stop now, because it's just a stupid dream, and now that I know it, I have the power. I rolled toward my husband, facing his back. I closed my eyes and started to drift off to sleep. I swear it was only a few minutes later, and this time, I couldn't see anything, but I felt the guy looking at me. This time, though, while sitting in the chair that's three feet away from my husband's head, not the other one. I opened my eyes. No one was there. For the rest of the night, I probably woke up every hour or so. Every time I fell asleep, I could feel this man's presence in the room. He never tried to hurt us. He just watched us. All night. When I finally saw daylight through the curtains, I got up and woke my husband up and I told him we had to leave. I tried not to alarm him or my son. I just got them up and dressed and said we were out. I think we were out of there by 7.30 in the morning. This whole thing had such a surreal quality to it because with the exception of a few distinct moments, it was hard to tell when my eyes were open and when they were closed. When I was fully conscious, and when I was maybe semi-conscious. There were parts that I could write off as a dream if they weren't so damn vivid. And the whole night, this lingering feeling of being watched, even when I couldn't see him, was so unnerving. Every time I recount this incident to myself or someone else, I'm no closer to understanding what happened, but I refuse to go back to that hotel.
This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet. But we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters, but my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, what the hell, while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. 
but I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now, back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside. He's got a handful of stuff and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit.
The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place, a place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one bedroom bungalow. At first we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe, and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor, under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off. Until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days. And I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first I was fine, not scared of anything. Until one of those nights, I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up, and at first I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night it happened again, louder than before. Only this time I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was 5 o'clock AM on the dot, and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him. He turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. 
They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up, until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, Ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there, or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, Is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out, leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces and one was an old lady. She was frowning and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger like she was coming closer to the glass and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on, opening and closing, and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. He looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair. I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. 
His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield, made me think about that old lady's mouth. But it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. This is the story about the night that made me believe. When we were about 20, my friends and I were really big into doing scary trips to haunted roads and things of that nature. This one is about Clinton Road, deemed the most haunted road in America. It's so scary they even made a movie about it. This story takes place before the movie was even a thought. So there was a group of friends. There were three of us that were the closest, and then two more that would tag along here or there. The three main guys, myself and two others, were all huge football players, with the smallest of us standing at about six foot four and 230. So we were never really scared to do any of these things, as we'd looked like a pretty intimidating group of guys. I had to work late on a Friday night, so they decided to go visit this road without me. Most of it sounded like the typical hype and adrenaline scare, but one thing stuck out. They told me when they were there, they received texts from an unknown number stating, why are you on Clinton Road? And the texts even described what my friends were doing and wearing. They showed me the texts, but I figured they were faking it trying to make it sound scary, knowing that I would be super mad that I missed out. They also explained to me a legend that a child died in the water under the bridge on the road, and that if you throw change, the ghost boy would return the change to you, known to us as Ghost Boy Bridge. On top of that, there's a ridiculous bend in the road there called Dead Man's Curve, that even if you're doing a modest 30 miles per hour, you could easily crash and tumble off the cliff. It's said that a ghost truck will chase you throughout the road and try to get you to crash. I called total BS. I then convinced them to take me there the next day, being as I was off of work. It did not disappoint. We get there and immediately I see the road is in the middle of the woods, covered with ritual signs all over the road. I knew that this was not a typical road. We came up to the bridge and parked. As soon as we got out of the car, I checked everyone's pockets so that they wouldn't be trying to pull anything slick, to try to drop change on the road when I wasn't looking or something like that. There were a total of five quarters, one for each of us. We all tossed them in the water over the bridge. About five whole minutes go by in total silence. I decided to break that silence by saying, told you, BS. We then turned to walk back to the car. We get about 10 feet away and cling, 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 the sound of change hitting the ground. We go back to the bridge and there are five quarters laying directly in between the two yellow lines in the middle of the road. Thinking it was one of the other four people there messing with me, I came prepared. So I signed one of the quarters with my initials and we threw them back in the water. About five more minutes go by. And again, I say, see, BS, it was one of you guys messing with us. We then proceed to walk back to the car, get about 10 feet away again and cling, 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 the sound of change hitting the ground again. We turn back around and go see what it was. And sure enough, there were five quarters laying in the road with one of them having my initials in my handwriting. We all were going nuts and decided to run back to the car. After getting back to the car, we decide to keep going to see what else the road had to offer. But keep in mind, we were spooked from the change thing we just experienced. 
About 10 minutes go by, and a few of us had to pee really badly after holding it for the entire car ride. So we pulled up to this random castle-looking building, no bigger than a small house, but you could tell it was extremely old. We decided to just stop there, because there was this little indent in the road where a car could pull over. We all get out to go. I go to my immediate left and do my business. After I'm done, I notice one of my friends is walking towards the castle thing, almost in a trance-like state. We yelled his name to come back, but he kept walking. We all ran up and grabbed him and shook him out of it. After questioning why the heck he'd be walking up there all alone, he said, I was following you. You waved at me to come here without saying anything. The problem with that was the fact that the entire group, including me, had actually been behind him the whole time. We had all sorts of signals as a group, so I would never just wave to him without saying something. I am 100% convinced that he saw a mimic leading him into trouble. The fear level is definitely higher now, so we decide to leave. Like I stated earlier, it's an extremely dark road in the woods, so you can't see much. You have to pass Dead Man's Curve twice, once one way on the way in, and then once, of course, on the way out. We're probably four miles away from the curve when we see headlights behind us. We didn't think much of it, as we thought it was probably just some other kids our age out here doing what we were doing. About a minute goes by after us talking about random stuff trying to ease the mood, and we noticed that the headlights were directly behind us. The headlights looked super old, and you could tell it was a truck because of how high up the lights were off the ground. The thing was, we couldn't see the truck, just the lights, because it was so dark there. Getting more creeped out, we told the driver to speed up and try to get this crazy truck off our tail. But he was sticking right on us, going around bends at high speeds, straight straightaways, everything. We couldn't shake him. The problem with this is that we were in a brand new and modified sports and performance car. If someone were to be driving an old truck, or any truck for that matter, there's absolutely no way that they would have been able to keep up with us for more than 30 seconds. But this thing was on us for what seemed to be miles. Finally, about a half mile away from Dead Man's Curve, it's almost as if the lights shut off and we lost it. So I remember pulling up right after the curve and pulled over so we could find our way back to the main roads. Meanwhile, there's just woods on both sides of us. We're all talking very lightly, just in case something crazy were about to happen, we could hear it and be aware. Two minutes go by. After getting service to our phones, one of the guys got directions, so we were in the clear. Right before the driver put the car in drive, we hear this deafening screech, which sounded like a woman's scream. It literally sounded about 20 feet from us so loud that I actually lost my hearing for a couple of minutes. When we looked over to where the noise had come from, ugh, I will never, ever forget what we saw. I know this is going to sound crazy, and if it didn't happen to me, I would never believe it. We saw a typical movie scene, white dress, black hair figure standing there. But next to that was a clown hanging upside down from a tree, swinging back and forth, smiling at us, moving its head in any direction we moved. The clown was like an old school type of clown from back in the day, like sideshow creeper clown with a big circular neckline. I can't remember much detail about it, except for that damn circular neckline and the chilling old school vibe. Now this totally could have been a prank, but to have set that up as a prank, you would have to have both immense patience for someone to come to that exact spot or balls of steel to be doing that in the woods in the middle of nowhere with just two people. There's just no way. I don't think I've ever been in a car that moved as fast as ours did after that little sighting. We then found the main road and headed back. 
Going home, we did research, and that's when we found out about the legends of the ghost truck and Dead Man's Curve. It was such a rush. By the time we got home, it was probably 2.30 in the morning, and we had already forgotten the feeling of how scared we actually were. So we all decided when we got home, let's do it again tomorrow, which would have been a Sunday, to see who really had balls. We all parked at my friend's house so he could drive us, so we all had to drive ourselves home. I live 15 minutes away. On the way home, I noticed that a rundown church in my town had letters put up on their board. They never use it, so it was really strange to see it. The board stated, you're going to need Jesus on Sunday. About a minute after passing that church, my radio cut out and started playing Bloody Sunday. It's safe to say I made a call to the group telling them we were not going back. It's been about seven years and I refuse to ever go there again. But that night, that night made me believe. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently, everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day, I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, 
and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial, since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable, I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house they left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. 
Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace, and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard, and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just wanna live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired. I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. Back in the early 1990s, I was a kid, around 13 at the time of this incident. And I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot, out in a very rural area in southeastern Arkansas. When I say very rural, I mean it was a series of networked dirt roads to get out to their house. The closest neighbors besides my aunt and uncle, who lived about a quarter of a mile up the road, was over a mile and a half away. This was very backwoods and isolated from most civilization. The closest town was a 10 mile trip. It's in the middle of farmland and mostly woods. They had lived in this house since my mother was a child and had both grown up just a ways down the road. Anyway, there was a general store roughly three to four miles down the network of dirt roads. This was your typical country general store run by an old lady and her husband and its only customers really consisted of the people who lived out there in BFE. One day, my grandmother asked me if I wanted to walk to the general store and get her some milk, eggs, and a few other miscellaneous items, and I told her I would. She gave me some money, and I headed on my way. It was fairly early in the day, and I had plenty of time to get back before dark, which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming about. Things can get mighty creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall, it's a darkness unlike most people who have lived primarily in cities or towns have ever experienced. Me being a 13 year old, I had poor time management skills. I stopped at the bottom of a hill next to this small wooden bridge you have to cross and messed around at the creek catching crawdads and such. And I kind of just messed around the whole way to the store. By the time I left the store, I realized it was quickly approaching dark. This was fall, and darkness set upon the land pretty early in the day. 
I didn't want to be walking those lonely, secluded roads through the woods alone in the dark, so I hurried as fast as I could, running and sprinting as much as possible. But it wasn't enough. By the time I had made it back to the bottom of the hill near the bridge, it was almost completely dark, and there was an eerie sort of glow brought about by a very bright, nearly full moon that was rising. At the top of the hill, the road was perfectly straight and flat, with woods on the left side and a large field on the right. About a half mile up from the top of the hill is my grandparents' house, and you can see it from there. As I top the hill, I can see the faint glow of the lights at their house, and I feel a sense of relief because I was kind of freaking out a little bit. But knowing that I was so close and could see the house offered me a little bit of comfort. The field on the right was somewhat illuminated by the glow of the moon, and my eyes had adjusted to the darkness rather well at this point. As I walked up the road, I heard something from the left, behind me on the wooded side of the road. It sounded like leaves being rustled. I turn to look, and I see nothing at first. But then, as my eyes begin to focus, I see something in the ditch. A black, shadowy shape, slowly moving toward me. At first I thought it was a dog, but then I realized it was much too large to be a dog. And then I realized it wasn't actually walking on four legs. It was crawling, like a person would. I stared for a moment, out of sheer confusion, trying to figure out what I was seeing. And then, a jolt of fear shot through me as it dawned on me that whatever this thing was, it had been trying to sneak up on me. At that exact moment, this thing stood upright out of the ditch on two legs like a person. It had the shape of a human, long arms, legs, and was proportioned as such. It stood roughly seven to eight feet in height and was completely covered in black or maybe dark brown hair. Its face was dark in color, and I can't recall seeing much in the way of features due to it being night. It was no bear, that's for certain, or any other kind of animal that I had ever seen for that matter. I immediately dropped the bag of stuff I had been carrying and bolted as fast as my legs could take me toward my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing, guttural, growling kind of sound behind me, and I heard this thing's footsteps running up behind me on the gravel as it gave chase. I didn't turn around. I was certain that it would grab me at any moment. Then I heard it crash off into the woods and let out an earth-shattering, ungodly scream unlike anything I have ever heard before or since. I'm positive this thing could have easily caught me had it wanted to but for some reason, it let me go. By the time I reached my grandparents, my heart felt as if it would explode from the combination of the adrenaline rush I had, from being scared beyond any type of fear I had ever felt before or since, and from full-on sprinting as hard and as fast as possible for about a half mile straight. I flew into the house and, in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, tried to explain to my grandparents what had just happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but did believe that something had scared me and acted rather weird about the whole thing. She tried to convince me that it was just a dog or some other animal. The next morning I woke up and found my grandpa sitting outside whittling wood underneath the shade tree in the front yard, as he often liked to do. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He was a very rational man, down to earth, and had grown up in and hunted that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of it, mapped into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in those woods, what noise they made, where to find them, how to catch them. I had only been hunting with him for a couple of years, but had been going out into those woods with him since a pretty young age, on walks and things like that. He had passed a lot of his knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what had happened to me the night before, and told him that I knew what I saw. It wasn't my overactive imagination. I wasn't making it up. And it definitely wasn't a dog. He knew that I wasn't just some dumb 13-year-old kid, and he knew that I knew the things he taught me. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eyes, and said, I know what you saw. 
I've seen it before, too. There's things out in them woods that people don't understand and that a person ought not go fooling with. I remember those words clearly to this day, because it gave me affirmation, but at the same time made me realize that whatever I had seen was very real in existence and beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods there are some cliffs and that the bottom of one of those cliffs is a cave. He told me that the cave is where the creature lived. He had once stumbled upon it a long time ago when he was hunting. He said he was standing on the top of the cliff looking at it when a creature fitting the same description as mine emerged and began screaming wildly at him and throwing rocks. He said he took a shot at it, missed, and then this thing gave chase. But my grandpa was on top of the cliff, so in order to get to him, this thing had to go around a pretty good distance and then up, which he said it quickly began to do, so he hightailed it out of there in a hurry. He said the whole way back home he felt as if he were being watched, and he kept hearing twigs snap behind him. He was certain that this thing was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turned and looked back at the woods from where he'd come, and he saw it peeking out at him from behind a tree. Later that night, he said that he and my grandmother awoke in the early morning hours to large rocks being thrown at the house and ungodly howling noises from outside, and this thing trying to get into the house. He said he could hear it walking around the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low, deep, garbled voice. But it didn't sound like a language just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, the thing went back to throwing some more rocks and howling. So, my grandpa grabbed his shotgun and fired it out the front door a few times into the darkness and into the direction of the howling. He said he heard it run back into the woods. He didn't know if he'd hit it or not. He said that was the last he'd ever seen nor heard from it, but over the years, an occasional farmer's cow would be mutilated or someone's hunting dog would go inexplicably missing or someone would have a story about some strange creature they'd seen. He also said it scared my grandmother beyond words, and she has absolutely refused to ever talk about it or even acknowledge that it happened, which explains her odd behavior when I told her what happened to me. I know it's a pretty far-fetched story, and you can believe it or not. It makes no difference to me. I know what I saw, and my grandpa knew what he saw, and neither of us have ever felt the need to convince anyone else of it. In fact, until today, I have never actually spoken of it to anyone other than my grandpa, and he passed away roughly 10 years ago. help breaking this down and I need to feel like I'm not crazy. I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work both in the office and in court and I split my time about half and half. On a Friday in April, I was in the office at my desk. I sometimes also assist customers who come into our office who have questions on certain types of filings. I'm the backup coverage specifically for our records window. In my state, we are considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case, unless it's juvenile, confidential, or sealed by the court. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. on this Friday, so our records clerk could leave a little bit early. No problem. I have no issues helping out when I can. Around 4.15, we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them. This man comes in frequently to get copies of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up because it is a bit important. We are set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens up to a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead, and the DA's office is to the left, and the Clerk of Courts, or COC, where I work, is to the right. You have to open a separate set of doors into our little lobby. 
There's a counter with windows and it's an L shape. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man, we'll call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family's case or whatever he's doing. I don't really know and it's none of my business, but I assume that's what he's doing. He came up to my window somewhere around 4.15 to 4.20 and said that he requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminals, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue, glanced at the document and asked, did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. I wrote him a little slip out with a number of copies and his total owed. I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to the windows four through five for cashiers for payment, and that I would meet him there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed. I messed with that for a minute, counted the pages and took them to the cashier. Then I went back to my counter to help the next person in line. The next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer, it was after 425. My coworker Lynn asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's closet after work. And my answer was, hell yeah, let's go. Right as we're discussing this, I'm in view of the records window, but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to the counter. I went up to the counter and I asked how I could help him. He stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost 10. I replied, no, I'm not. How can I help? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift from my niece, a painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. No, sir. I printed off what was in the queue. So you don't need these four pages? I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip, seven pages total, and I sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30, it's Friday, and we're closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes and then went inside. I beat Lynn there, so I started browsing. She came in a couple of minutes later, stating that she got caught behind a train, so we start shopping and chatting. For some reason, I looked at the door when it opened. There was Joe. Now, I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got Lynn's attention. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? So I pulled Lynn into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short. I'm tall and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store and he looked like he was rubbernecking it the whole time. So he goes to the back of the store, grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them and continues looking around. I continued to watch him and as he moved, we moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind the clothing racks. He moved around the perimeter of the store continuing to just gawk around, looking for something or someone. He finally leaves, and we freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and just chalk it up to coincidence. And then I realized that we were talking about it literally in front of him. And Lynn, she's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened, just in case it was something to worry about, and we ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt so uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what happened and told her that I thought about calling the police, the non-emergency number. I did, and I left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and I explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name, at this point, I recognized him but didn't know his name offhand, and he told me that he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday and left a voicemail. 
Monday was fine. Tuesday, I was out of the office. But Wednesday? Joe came back on Wednesday. He came in at 4.20 to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. For reference, it should have been like a minute. Two, because he needed something notarized. He left and I just had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said that if he comes back Thursday to call and they would come down to talk to him. The police department is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around, no Joe, until 425. He beelined it for the computer in the corner. I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies who work security were notified. Three deputies followed him into my office. I called the PD. Two officers came down and they questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's closet. He said he was shopping for his two young daughters, nine and 11. Problem is they don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, once upon a child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So he had a receipt in his car for once upon a child for 5.07 PM. He denied hearing my conversation with Lynn regarding going to Plato's after work. He stated he left my office at 415 and took his children shopping for clothes. He did not have his children with him at the courthouse or at Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, did she call you? He also stated that he believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office and he has arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's really nothing the officers can do. They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is he could opt into his case electronically, but he made this big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he was having issues, he could call the court support line and they would be able to fix the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay $1.25 a page instead of a one-time $20 fee. Apparently, he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year, his roommate filed a restraining order against him, followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging sexual harassment. I won't go into details regarding the family's case, but let's just say it's more than messy. He's also filing extremely high level types of documents for being somebody representing himself. Today, I was in court all day, came down to my desk at around 4.05 PM, and he came in at about 4.10 PM. I left while he was still at my office. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. The officers can't do anything else. I need another incident outside of my office to file a restraining order. I have ordered home security. I signed up for self-defense classes and I'm purchasing mace. I don't know what else to do. First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room. So that's where I would stay whenever I would visit so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18 and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, 
I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet which had the door closed. She opened the door and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended 
a ride as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear, anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise, and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense, and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us, or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. My wife and I have been having a lot of paranormal activity. After moving into a wooded area just outside of Pittsburgh, everything started. Our house is isolated from the neighborhood. That only makes the fear of something terrible happening even worse. I would like to point out that my wife and I are logical, rational thinkers who are educated to some degree. Since we can't explain these events and we fear ruining people's perception of our family, we've turned to all of you. All of these experiences have happened while sober and within the past two years. There's a lot, so please give us a chance and let us know what you might think it is. Incident 1. First things first, animals dying in the wild is common. Duh. But hearing the screams of struggle and pain, almost as if the animal is being tortured, I don't know if that's normal, but the sound sends chills down my back. This incident happens frequently. Incident 2. When we're walking in the woods, accompanied by my wife and kids, I stumble upon a small clearing in the trees. Under the leaves were children's shoes, shoes that were worn out as if they'd been there for a very long time. Incident 3. This one is hard to believe, and trust me, I know. I was in denial and didn't tell my wife what I had seen for weeks because it just sounded so fake. 
and I didn't want to catch any flack for seeing whatever it was. Smoking a cigarette out of the second floor bathroom window last fall, while scrolling on my phone, I had that feeling as if someone is staring at you. I glanced away from my phone to look. I caught, in my peripheral vision, a humanoid-type being. I use peripheral because before I could really focus on it to see it, it bolted into the woods behind my house on the east side. I was completely caught off guard and terrified. I didn't even watch it run into the woods. I looked straight ahead and acted like I'd never seen it, like a deer in headlights. I acted like scared prey. This creature was not human, and that's why I was so deeply terrified. It was tall and had shoulders and a head, no hair, and a color of skin that I couldn't really make out, but it just wasn't normal, you know? It's weird because my brain didn't know what to do. I couldn't process it fast enough. I just stared completely ahead and stayed straight, completely frozen from fear. Hearing the strides this thing had was unexplainable, and the speed that it had, rilling through with such ease in the middle of the night in the woods, is beyond human. I don't know what it was. Months go by. I was in the same bathroom window where my wife and I tend to smoke when we don't want to go outside at night. We opened the window to smoke, but it sounded like it was pouring rain. Both of us were completely confused because no water was falling from the sky at all. I walked downstairs to go outside to try to understand what was happening. The garden hose was on and the handle was pushed into the dirt, shooting water into the trees above, making a surprisingly loud raining sound. We have no idea how that happened. Incident number five. This is another ongoing incident. Basically, we always feel watched at night. In the daytime, the woods are normal and somewhat peaceful. But at night, it's totally different. You have that constant eerie feeling that you're being watched. Incident six. At this moment, we've become interested and are sitting by our window every night trying to find explanations as to what humanoid thing that was. We were in mid-conversation on a random subject when a loud crack came from the ground right below us. The noise was loud enough and close enough to make both of us jump. We were super scared and locked the window and decided to stop for the night. It sounded like a bat or an axe, maybe, hitting a tree really, really hard. From the humanoid creature to this loud sound, we've become so afraid that we actually have our children sleep in our room. Incident number seven. As we were laying in our bed, my wife woke me up at 2 a.m., freaking out, saying that she smelled burning plastic and thought that something was on fire. We have a two-story house and had our bedroom window cracked. We looked outside where we thought the smell was coming from. That's when we saw a lit up triangular shaped thing in the back of the house, deep into our woods. It was orange lights and blue lights and orbs next to it. You could see shadows of people walking around this thing. We immediately thought of a cult. We were so scared we were about to call the cops, but doubt set in when we double checked the window, so we never ended up telling anybody. Incident number eight. After all of this, we still have to stay active, so we went on a walk one evening with the children around the neighborhood. Noticing that the sun was setting, we headed home. Obviously, this place is weird, so who would want to be outside in the dark? We got to our gravel driveway, which is about a hundred yards, tall trees on one side and bushes and smaller trees on the other. As we're walking about 15 feet onto the driveway, we notice bats flying down left to right and right to left. We'd only ever seen up to this point maybe a couple in our yard, feeding off the bugs, I guess. I started to walk down the driveway. My wife stayed behind, opposing this idea. The farther down I got, the scarier it became. I had completely underestimated the amount of bats. I started running because my children became frightened. As I start running, bats, and I am not kidding, begin to line their flight path with my head. They would turn away probably five feet from my face, maybe closer. This was completely terrifying. 
As I'm trying to avoid these demons, I hear my wife screaming as she flies past me and beats me home. My daughter, on the verge of tears, was saying that she was so scared she thought she was going to pee her pants. Now, before everybody loses their mind, I know that bats are docile and pose absolutely no threat to humans despite rabies. These bats were not acting like normal docile bats, which is why this was so weird. I cannot explain why or how it happened, but it was as though something went off in their brains that just said, attack, or at least make us really afraid. They came in a line at us and then veered off right at the last. I've certainly never heard of that happening, and I know that's not normal. So, we didn't treat them like docile bats because they weren't acting like docile bats. Incident number nine. I didn't personally see this, but it was weird and doesn't add up, so I'll include it. One Sunday, my parents were over for dinner. When I came back down to talk to my wife, I said, Yo, my mom said she saw some chubby girl with a black sundress come out of the woods walk in the tree line and then go further down. This lady came out of the north side of the house, like east to northeast. I know it's hard to picture if you don't know what the property looks like, but that's what happened. The odd part of this is that the northern tree line of the property is pretty rough terrain. Steep hills, torn bushes, loose soil. It would be hard to hike it, let alone in a sundress. Although about a mile and a half north through the woods, you do pop out right outside of a small town. So, I suppose it could be rational, but it still seemed really odd with everything happening. Most people wouldn't go hiking through that kind of terrain dressed like she was. The last incident, so far anyway, is that if either one of us goes to smoke at night at the window in our bathroom, we always hear this kind of bell it kind of sounds like a symbol. Being skeptical, we thought it was wind chimes. We've looked, though, and there are no wind chimes at my neighbor's house. It's the only neighbor we have, for about 200 feet in between each other on our south side. The bells are coming from the southeast side of the property, and this is something else that we cannot explain. We're pretty scared, and as you can tell, it's pretty unbelievable what's going on. We don't really know what to do. All these weird things just keep happening, and we're afraid that it could escalate or take a turn for the worse. It's already overwhelming. So overwhelming that it's the only thing we've been able to talk about for a long time now. Anyway, if any of you have any idea what could be going on, let us know. I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, 
but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement, gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, a hundred percent. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back to the pond, barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast, and how I had ended up in the center of the pond, since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me, and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. 
She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there, staring at her, with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. I'm telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now, these are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced-in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual. But it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. 
I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then, 
She reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression, and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. I studied at a university in Malaysia. I was away from my family, thousands of miles away. This started very early on when I moved there. Our campus was away from the city. As international students, we would be stretched thin for money to get to the main city. So most of my time was spent in my hostel room. One night around seven or eight, two friends and I were coming in a borrowed car when the car suddenly stopped. We got out to see what was wrong. As soon as we got out, the car started on its own. We thought it must be some kind of mechanical issue. We didn't know anything, so we sat back in. The car stopped again. My friend kept turning the ignition, but it wouldn't budge. We decided to get out and push it. Like I said, we didn't know anything and the car felt like it was a cement block. The friend driving got out to help, and as soon as he stepped out, the car started again, with the hazard lights flashing and the lights on full beam. We started freaking out. None of us wanted to sit in it now. We waited until a few cars passed, flagged one down and asked the people to help us. Somehow we got to campus and just went to our rooms that night. I couldn't sleep. I kept feeling like somebody was in the room with me, moving with me, looking at me. I kept looking up suddenly to catch someone, but there wasn't anyone there. In the morning, I asked the others, but they didn't experience anything. So I shrugged it off and come nightfall, I started to feel uneasy again. I played music in my room, but it didn't go anywhere. I showered, I prayed, I tried to sleep, but still the feeling doesn't go. My bed was up against a wall and I slept facing the wall. The whole night I could feel someone standing behind me, looking at me, willing to turn. This keeps going on for a few days to the point that I play a TV show in the background and I would wake up after five or six episodes had passed. No matter what I did, the presence didn't go. And then something happened. One night I'm struggling to sleep when I feel something or someone pulling my sheet away. I scramble to hold it, but my body is paralyzed. I can only blink my eyes. I lie there as the whole sheet is pulled off of me, trying to recite something, but then being unable to. That's when the whispering started, like multiple people whispering in slow, angry whispers. I couldn't make out anything. I even wet the bed and then lay there paralyzed for I don't know how long. My phone's alarm went off and I could finally move. 
this became regular. Then I would have episodes of paralysis and hear these whispers. My grades declined and I was exhausted. One evening, I just picked up my stuff and went to sleep in my friend's room, who was almost always high. He looked at me as I came in and said, who are the other guys? There was no one. I called him a bloody stoner, rolled up and went to sleep. The next morning I wake up for class and he's getting ready too. And he brings it up again. He says, your new friends are weird. They just sat there all night beside you, staring at you, didn't even respond to me. I just looked at him and it did not look like he was joking. At this point, he was sober too. I quietly take my classes and call my dad afterwards. He tells me to take one of those small ayat ul kursis, some lines from the Quran, and stick it outside my door. So I do that. And that's when the shit hits the fan. I don't want to change my room because it's a long process. I'm angry now because this is my space being invaded. I have the ayat ul kursi and I've lost my patience. That night, I sleep soundly until there's a knock on my door. I'm still not sure if everything that happened was real or if I was in a trance. I got up and opened the door and there's a man standing there. I'm not sure if he was old or not. He was very tall with his entire body covered in tattoos. He had no eyes. I'm not sure what they were. He just points to the paper stuck above my door and makes this guttural sound that rocks my literal bones. He keeps pointing at it with this weird scream coming from him. I don't know if anyone else heard it. If it was a dream or what really happened, I just know that I removed the paper and he came in. I remember waking up the next morning in my bed, angry at myself. I started finding these small things in my room, dead birds, old bones of small animals, broken combs, sometimes burnt paper. I would just throw it out because now it was a fight with them. Then one night, I decided to stop sleeping facing the bed. This is my room, my space, and I'm not letting them bully me anymore. So loudly I say in my native tongue, Something that means, do whatever you can, I'm not going anywhere else. I pray and I go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with all of my room lights on, and I see something that I will never forget. It's the same man offering a Muslim prayer in my room, in the wrong direction. He's doing all the same motions. I can hear the sounds, but he's facing the wrong way. I don't know how long I lay there, barely able to breathe and unable to scream until the man sitting there turned around and stretched his arms toward me. But they weren't arms. They were these long black snake-like looking things, like they could strangle me in a few seconds. In my heart, all this time I was reciting something. I could feel my tears on my pillow and I lost all memory after that. I woke up in the morning with scratch marks all over my body, like a bunch of cats had been let loose on me. My bed sheet smelt like old blood. That was it for me. I couldn't go on like this anymore. So I contacted my cousin, who put me through to somebody I could talk to. That night, I decided to go sleep in a mosque. It's common in Malaysia for guys to wear a, I think he called it a dhoti, but I'm not sure, over shorts if you're praying. I prayed, I used mine as a sheet, and I went to sleep in the mosque's courtyard. It's hard to believe the next part, but I'll leave that up to you. I woke up in the same exact place that our car had gone bust that first night. I woke up to these strangers, shaking me awake, asking me if I was okay. Someone suggested calling the police. Some turned out to be my seniors and I got a ride back to the hostel with them. After that, I started sleeping with different friends until the scholar was put through to me. He came and spent a few hours in my room and after asking around a bit, 
we learned that the student before me who lived there used to practice black magic in the room. He even used to write with his own blood on the walls, and administration just painted a new coat on top of it. I don't know what happened to that room or who got it. I was shifted to another one, quietly, on the condition that I would never speak about it. And that was it. No more sleep paralysis, or whispers, or visits, or scratches, or waking up in new places, or the smell of blood. I still have dreams about it, and to this day, I don't look into mirrors for too long. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking or having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith or hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid 70s. My mom was born in 65 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but nobody knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother and my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around, as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There were nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted to something dark. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, 
blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them that it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they really began to panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep inside the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate within them. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at that moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was in fact the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all into the car. They had no care for the things that they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk. Items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or even my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them never to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members, and I mostly lost contact with him outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older and once I learned of all of the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me and this story still haunts me. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I'm one of the only people in my family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. This isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the strangest. I wish I had answers, but 
I hope you all find the story as fascinating as I do. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey, and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board, and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were going to go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall. And I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. 
Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house, where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now, remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day. And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. This happened in the summer of 2019, when I went to visit my cousins in India. They had recently built a new kitchen and two modernized bedrooms in the basement. Initially, I thought it was a sweet gesture that my cousin allowed me to stay in his room and make it my own for the month that I stayed there. Little did I know that I would soon be encountering some unexplainable things. This will be a pretty long story, as I want to explain it thoroughly enough, so you can imagine the situation clearly. The first incident. The home alone incident. 
I was told by my cousin that he needed to go out with some friends and would return in the next 15 minutes or so. No one else was at home except for the maid. I tend to get vibes of areas pretty quickly, and it's safe to say that the basement made me feel pretty uneasy. I was hesitant. However, I had nothing to do upstairs, and the TV was downstairs in my room. So, I went down there with my cousin's dog. The room felt incredibly cold, which is strange for a room in India in the summer. I hadn't turned on the air conditioning, and nobody else had been downstairs, not even the maid. I went to get the remote from the cabinet under the TV. It was a pretty loose cabinet. Sometimes it would swing open by itself, so it felt strange that I was unable to open it, despite tugging on it pretty hard. The dog began to shuffle backward whilst staring at something in front of me, next to the cabinet. There was nothing there, not even an insect. The entire month that I was there, this was the sole time that I ever heard a sound from that dog. He's typically pretty quiet, but the sound he made wasn't a bark. It's hard to describe, but it's almost like he was in pain, almost screaming. It wasn't a pleasant sound at all. The dog then ran back upstairs. He's quite a lazy dog, so it was kind of odd to see him run at such a speed. Suddenly, the room went back to its normal warm temperature, and the cabinet swung open. I nearly fell on the floor from the force that I had applied to the cabinet to try to open it. I put on a movie, and I tried to calm down. My cousin came in around a few minutes later, and I told him what happened. He was also very confused by the noise which the dog made, and he opened the cabinet in front of me with just two fingers trying to show me how easy it was to open. The second incident, the anklets. My cousin's sister and I were both having a late night talk one night at around 2 or 3 a.m. Everyone else was asleep upstairs in their rooms. Suddenly, we both heard anklets moving upstairs, and then we heard it getting louder. It was going down the stairs and coming toward us. Initially, I got excited, thinking it was my other cousin's sister who decided to join us. However, I was confused as to why she would suddenly decide to join in, despite previously saying she didn't want to, and hence going to sleep a few hours prior. My cousin's sister is next to me. We'll call her M. M is very brave and jokey, so I was incredibly concerned when I saw how shocked she looked. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, no one in the house wears anklets, and they don't own any either. I thought it was an intruder. At this point, the anklet noise had just reached the bottom of the stairs and was turning around the bend to enter the kitchen, which was located directly outside the room. I stood behind the wall with M, and we were ready to trap whoever this person was. The anklets stepped up the step, and the sound stopped directly outside the door where we stood. There was no one there. We were incredibly confused, so we checked all over the basement and turned on all of the lights. We then called my other cousin's sister, but she was still sleeping, so she didn't pick up. We went straight back into bed, and I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep that night. Incident 3 the blanket. This happened two nights after the anklet incident. I had finished watching yet another movie and was ready to sleep at around 3 a.m. This time, my cousin's brother said he would sleep on a mattress which was laid across the floor by the end of the bed in order to make me feel better if I was scared, since M was out that night and I was too traumatized by the anklet incident. My cousin's brother was already asleep, and I was about to sleep as well. I'm sure many of you can relate to me when I say that I sleep by curling up. So I did just that and laid on my side. As my eyes were getting heavier, I began to notice that my blanket was being pulled down. 
Of course, this couldn't have been me, as I was curled up, and my hands were gripping onto the blanket at the top near my face. I thought it was the dog, but then I remembered he went to sleep hours ago, upstairs. Everyone's doors are shut upstairs when they sleep, so there was no way that he could have come downstairs, and I would have noticed if he did. Then I thought maybe it was my cousin pulling on it in his sleep. I was too tired, so I tried to sleep again. The tugging happened again, but this time more aggressively. The blanket was actually snatched out of my hand from the force. I also felt pressure at the end of the bed, as if someone was sitting there. I turned my torch on, but nothing was there. You could see that the blanket had been pulled as it was very uneven on that side. I tried to wake my cousin up, but he wasn't anywhere near that end of the bed, and he was in deep sleep. I called my other cousin on the phone. He lives about a half an hour away from that house, and I put him on speaker so that we could both shout my cousin's name for him to wake up, but he didn't. Needless to say, I was stuck there and couldn't sleep, so I sat up with the light on for the rest of the night. I pretty much looked like a zombie at this point from lack of sleep. The last incident, but not the least scary, was the face. So this happened around a week after the blanket incident. M was sleeping beside me again as I was far too scared to sleep alone at this point. I had just said goodnight to her and we were about to fall asleep. Again, this was around two or three in the morning. I actually started sleeping, but then I felt incredibly uneasy. That feeling like you're being watched. I suddenly woke up and directly stared into the face of something pale. Something or someone, who knows. I couldn't see eyes, but the shape looked like it should have been a face. Despite not seeing eyes, I still felt like I was being watched. I let out a small squeal because I was so scared. My voice just abandoned me. M woke up to see if I was okay as soon as that face disappeared. As soon as I began telling her what I saw, we heard the gate crash outside the room. To put this into perspective, if you walk out of the room and kitchen and continue walking straight within the basement, there are stairs which lead to a heavy metal gate so that you can get onto the main road. There was no one walking around on the streets that night. There usually never is, especially at that time of night. Even if a kid tried knocking on the gate outside, the sound would be too deep for what we heard. The gate crashing sound, which I'm talking about, is the sound it makes if someone were to open it and then slam it shut. Sometimes M's dad leaves for work very early in the morning and returns later in the evening. However, later that day when M and I went upstairs for breakfast, he had just woken up and it wasn't him. Even if it had been, why would he use the basement gate instead of the main door to leave the house, which was upstairs? In conclusion, it was a very weird experience. I don't know what I experienced, honestly, but something was up with that basement. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was, so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, 
so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark, and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation, covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom, and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down, and that helped as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open, and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball, and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker. It was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house, a boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child. 
which was now also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. Where I live, we have had relatively few bid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop, as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch right outside. 
I leapt to the front door, flung it open, and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed and thankfully he did. I sat vigil listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this, and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance and in front of it, there was an open empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house to the left and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something. And right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs. Plus there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. 
Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night. I dismissed it as the wind, cliche I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. It started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed a light on it, it disappeared, but the eerie feeling stayed there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day and on some days I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold and my parents were just whipping me into helping her, but it was no use and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again and things got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real. And there were things that were noticed by other people too. 
I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the Whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet search on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through hikers really looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. Though as time went on and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals. No disturbances on the trails or here at the shelter. The rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two-by-four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. 
I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear had left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open and on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, man, I passed out, he said. It's not like there's anything to read in it anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great, now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night, he said. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he said, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the site and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional and saw the same thing independently? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? I am Puerto Rican and I live in Brooklyn. But when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house and Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean-sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink, underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong, and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame, and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley, that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. 
He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain within earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise, and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died, and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass, and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside, late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside, but I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived, it is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. I 
I grew up in a house that was built in 1902. I was born in the late 80s, so the house had been remodeled a few times. It was a two-story house with three bedrooms and a tiny bathroom on the second floor. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs, and my room was across the hall at kind of an angle. My sister and my parents had rooms farther down a long, narrow hallway. For as long as I can remember, I saw a ghost. I called her Pam. My mom told me that I began talking about Pam around the age of five, and that I never stopped. My mom never believed any of this and just brushed it off as my wild imagination. Pam was pink and transparent, a see-through, totally pink little girl, maybe eight or nine years old. She knew that I could see her, and I knew that she could see me. But she never made a sound, ever, nothing. She walked around only the upstairs and never came down the steps. Honestly, I have no idea where the name Pam came from. Growing up, Pam would sit at the top of the stairs, waiting for me to run up to the bathroom after I got home from school. I would walk around her because she was always there, every day. If she wasn't sitting on the step, she would just be sitting on a bed or standing in one of the rooms or the hallway, harmless for the most part. However, if I ignored her, she would mess up my bedroom while I was gone doing my paper route. When I would get back home, my parents would be all sorts of angry over my messy room. But if I just said a quick hi, she wouldn't mess with me. She never touched me. And I also never physically saw her move anything with my own eyes. But I would get really scared and nauseous every time she would destroy my room behind my back. So I learned very quickly to say hi to her every day. At the age of 15, my mom put me into therapy because I was still bringing up Pam here and there. Pam was still always around. I was used to her and she wasn't doing anything. So she didn't come up in conversations as often. Therapy helped, but not with Pam. When I was 17, my parents decided to put our house up for sale. I don't know if it was all the people walking through or me packing up my stuff, but something triggered Pam and it got real crazy. About a month before our new house was built and ready to be moved into, I was asleep in my room. My bed was against the wall and I could lie on my side and see right into the bathroom. While asleep, I had a dream of Pam, still transparent, standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She pointed up and for the first time in my life, I heard her talk. She said, look, that's my mom. I sat up in bed and from the light fixture saw a dark haired woman hanging lifelessly by a rope. Her boot fell off of her foot and hit the floor and I woke up. Holy crap. I couldn't say anything because my family never saw her. They didn't understand. Pam wasn't in their lives like she was in mine. I didn't really dwell too much on it. It was a dream, right? Pam was back to sitting on the top step the next day, life as usual. But two weeks later, I had another dream. It started out exactly like the first one. The bathroom light was on and I could kind of see into it while laying down on the bed. But this time I heard a weird grunting and splashing. I sat up and saw clear as day the woman that had been hanging from the light fixture was not only alive, but was holding Pam, no longer translucent, under the water in our bathtub. She was drowning Pam in our bathtub. I don't have any idea what made me wake up, but I could not contain my emotion. I ran down the hall and jumped into my parents' bed as a 17 year old. It was just my mom in there. I think my dad fell asleep on the couch or something, but I was hysterical. I told my mom everything through tears and gasps for air. My mom didn't know what to say. Then in the middle of my sadness, Pam walked into the door frame of my parents' bedroom. She was transparent again. I quickly laid down really close to my mom and pulled the covers over my head. I just remember saying, oh my gosh, mom, she's in here. I held my breath 
and seconds later, I felt cold, small hands on my back, shoving me against my mom. I kept yelling, stop touching me. My mom could only reply with, I'm not touching you. This went on for what felt like forever, but was probably only a matter of seconds. When she stopped, she just stood there at the side of the bed, staring at me. She didn't move. I pulled the covers over my head again, and I ended up crying myself to sleep while my mom held me. We were both shaking horribly. I moved all of my stuff out the next day, and I slept on the floor of our unfinished house the next few nights until my bedroom was done. I never went back. Shortly after my family moved out completely and before the next buyers moved in, the entire back of the house and the entire garage went up in flames. The official cause was listed as spontaneous combustion. The first people to buy and sell the house after us lasted 10 months there. They called my parents to tell them that they couldn't keep the window or closet door shut in the room with the black carpeting. That was my bedroom. I saw the house posted a couple of months ago on Zillow, and the only picture of my room shows the door open a crack. You can see a bit of the black carpeting, but there's nothing in the room. The rest of the house is furnished. I've tried so hard to find any information about the girl that's in my old house, but there's almost no information at all, just basic architecture and lot line documents. It's the craziest story, but this was my childhood. Part of me feels sorry for Pam, but another part of me knows that there's something strong and dark in that house. I know Pam loved me in a way, but there's no way I would ever go back. Just to start off, I'm not on drugs and I don't suffer from any type of mental illness, so we can rule that out right now. Weird occurrences have followed my family for years. I'm only going to stick to the ones that can be classified as mimicking, starting from my first memory of it. My brother and I are 16 months apart, him being older. We shared a bedroom in a two-bedroom apartment, living with only our mom. We had those metal bunks that you could disassemble and turn into two toddler beds, with the railing going around three quarters of the bed. Before we got our own separate ends of the room, I had the top bunk and he had the bottom bunk. My brother would cry a lot at night and that's why he got the bottom, so he could easily get up and go see my mom, and vice versa. It was normal for his crying to wake me up. One night I'll never forget though. I woke up to him crying, but he was trying to stifle it, like when little kids are done crying and they're just breathing weird. Well, I heard my own voice calling his name in a whisper. I sat there not understanding what was happening. I slid my arm down the gap between the bed and the wall. I would hold my brother's hand that way a lot of the time. He held my hand immediately, and we stayed like that until the sun came up. He told me that's why he cries at night, because he always hears me, but he knows that it's not. At this point, I was about four, and he was turning six. We never told my mom. When I got older, about 14 or 15, I went through an angsty phase like most girls do. I had long straight hair and was really scrawny. By this time, we were living in a different apartment. My brother and I had bedrooms at one end of the hallway, and the doors faced each other with a bathroom in between. I used to sit on the edge of my bed, and when I did, you could see me in front of my door. On multiple occasions, my brother and mom would see me sitting in that spot while I would be in the bathroom or the kitchen. They would always be like, your twin is here again, and we would just go about our day because it was so normal at that point. When I was in my senior year of high school, I went to an independent study program. It was almost a daily thing where I would hear my name being called while I was taking a test. 
we were able to take a test when you finished a packet, and they were stupidly simple. The voice wasn't the same every time, but the tone was, like a sense of urgency. I never said anything, because I honestly thought I was insane. I would look up and look around, trying to see who was calling me, and no one around me acted like they had heard a thing. A year later, I was enrolled in a trade school. I would hear my name being called there as well. I met a girl there who was openly practicing some form of Wicca. We became close. We went to school at night and got out around eight. Close to the end of the course, I was walking her out to the car, and from the dumpster enclosure on the parking lot, I heard my name being called. I wasn't going to act like I had heard anything, but my friend grabbed my hand and told me never to acknowledge it. It really freaked me out. I asked her if she had heard something, and she said yes, that something was trying to be me. Another time, I was at my friend's house watching The Conjuring movie. It was only he and I in the house. We were sitting on the bed in his room with our backs against the wall. Okay, bear with me on this part. In my head, not out loud, I had this thought. But the thought wasn't my own inner monologue. My thought was more of a hearing someone else's voice, but in my head. It was really ugly. To this day, I have bad vibes about it. In a really fast whisper yell, the voice said, Look at the closet. My eyes darted towards his closet, and at the exact moment, one of the doors fell off. He had normal closet doors, the basic two-panel kind. Only instead of the track they slide on being on the ground, his were on the top, and the doors hung about an inch off the ground. Seconds before the closet door fell, my friend had jumped. Nothing scary was happening in the movie. He preemptively acted spooked. We turned off the movie and we were both kind of like, what the heck? Things like this were common when we got together, and it made us have a very strong bond. We talked for a second, trying to rationalize things. But then I decided to tell him about this ugly voice. He then changed his whole demeanor and said, I heard the same thing, only it was your voice. And I had said it so suddenly that it caused him to jump. The only thing is, I had never said a word. Fast forward to two years ago, 2019. I had gotten a home for myself and I lived with my newborn daughter and her father. It was summertime and he was in the backyard grilling. The sliding glass doors were open, but I have thick curtains that were drawn to keep the flies out. I was sitting on my couch with my daughter, sleeping in my arms while nursing. We had been like that when he went outside and told me to stay put. Usually I would go help him. My house is rather small, so no matter where you are, you can have a conversation with the other person, even if they're across the house. So he and I are talking, and then I hear him say, Okay, let's go inside. And I didn't think anything of it. Assuming he was talking to himself or the food, I don't know. He walked in and looked at me sitting on the couch with a look he always makes when he's confused. He asked me how I'd gotten back into that position so fast. If you've never seen a woman breastfeed a newborn, I don't know how to explain the logistics, but there are a lot of them and I couldn't have gotten settled again that quickly. I told him that I hadn't moved and made a comment about my butt being asleep. He was really weirded out and shaking his head. He's very logical and a huge skeptic. Eventually, he was ready to tell me. He said that I had been standing in the doorframe having a conversation with him face to face with my arm holding back the curtain. And then I had turned around and walked away when he said, okay, let's go inside. He was ready to give me an attitude for not holding the curtain for him while he carried in the food, until he realized I had never moved. I'm not sure what's going on, but that was the last double me encounter I've had, although I doubt it will be the last. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. 
I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we live. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times, the longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night, he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house when it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. 
So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. One year, my mother took us kids to a state park for a summer vacation. She wasn't really into going camping, so she just rented a family-style cabin at the park. The cabin was picturesque, with native stone walls topped by brown plank trim, and it featured a small bedroom, a kitchen, a bathroom, and two couches in the living room. One of the couches was a hide -a bed and the other was not. A wall plaque informed us that the park cabins had been built by the WPA in the 1930s. We had arrived in late afternoon and began unloading the car for our three-day stay. I was to hang our clothes in the tiny closet. As soon as I opened the closet door, I got a bad case of creepy chills. Though the west-facing cabin door was open and sunshine was streaming into the room, not one ray of it penetrated the closet. It was like the light just stopped whenever it struck the open closet door. The wood trim along the opening gleamed in the light, but the interior was pitch black. I couldn't find the rod to hang the clothes on. I really did not want to enter that closet to feel for the rod, and there didn't seem to be a closet light. My mom brought the flashlight. The batteries must have been low, but we could dimly see the clothes rack. My sister, 13, and I, 11, would be sleeping on the pull-out couch. My little brother was 18 months old at the time, and he was sleeping on the other couch. My mom was sleeping in the little bedroom. Unpacking finished, we hurried outside to enjoy the mountain scenery while it was still light. That night, Mom left the bathroom light on with the door nearly closed. This made a nice, dim nightlight in a strange place except for the closet next to the bathroom. We had all been asleep for a while when I woke up without knowing why. Something just wasn't right. I hadn't been aware of hearing anything, but still, something was off. I studied the room carefully, nothing. I panned across the room again, and that's when I saw a very tall man leaning forward over my little brother on the opposite couch. The man was wearing a tan trench coat, like in the old Humphrey Bogart movies, and a 1940s era brown hat. 
His back was to me, and he appeared to be studying the sleeping child. I couldn't move. I couldn't even breathe. My little brother's eyes opened. He looked up at the man and began screaming bloody murder. The man just faded out. He didn't leave, he just disappeared. Now mom's up, all the lights are on, brother's still screaming and won't settle down. Sister sits up, rubbing her eyes groggily. What's going on? She asks. Meanwhile, I'm yelling hysterically, there was a man, there was a man in here. My mom checks the exit door next to the brother's couch and it's locked. She grabs a skillet from the kitchen and checks the bathroom, the closet, everything. She goes back for the flashlight because it's dark in the closet. Nothing. My sister gets up and grabs my little brother and he begins to calm down, but he's clutching her neck so hard she says it hurts. A thorough rehashing of events didn't really lead to any conclusions. My sister insisted that I had had a nightmare. I said, okay, but what about brother? Did he have one too, at the exact same time? Mom didn't really have much to say. She just mostly looked thoughtful. She had never allowed us to watch ghost or monster movies for fear that it would give us nightmares. Finally, she said that we should all just go back to bed and we could talk about it in the morning. She tried to put brother back down on the couch, but he kicked and cried so much that she just wound up taking him to bed with her. She left the kitchen light on this time and we finally got back to sleep. The next morning at breakfast, mom explained a little bit about ghosts and how this might have been one. She said that ghosts were lost or confused souls, that it couldn't actually hurt us, and that after our day's activities, we would pray for the ghost and it should go away. Well, it didn't. After our prayer session, mom left the bathroom light on with the door open, just in case. I wanted to go home and brother still couldn't stand the side of the couch. Sister resented the fuss because her sunburn was bothering her. Brother was to sleep with us on the pull-out. I never thought I'd get any sleep, but I finally did fall asleep. Then suddenly I'm wide awake again. I look around and again I don't see anything at first. But then, there he is, emerging from the closed closet door and walking slowly across the kitchen. Again, I can only see him from behind. In spite of the nightlight, the closet area is still completely shadowed. He disappears into the little bedroom where my mom is sleeping. I wanted to call out a warning, but I was frozen with fear. A minute passes, then another. A crashing sound from the bedroom. And then my mother's voice, loud and commanding. Out, get out. Lights on, rerun of last night. Mom said that she woke up to see the man standing at the foot of her bed. As her eyes traveled up from the belt of his trench coat, the figure seemed to solidify. Details became sharper. And then she looked at his face. There wasn't one. An automotive coil shock absorber emerged from the neck of this trench coat and disappeared into the fedora hat. It raised its arms like a Bela Lugosi monster or a priest giving some kind of benediction and began falling forward onto the bed. Right before it hit the bed, it disappeared. The crashing sound had come from mom knocking her water glass and the bedside lamp onto the floor when she went for the light. Mom agreed that we would cut the vacation short and leave as soon as it was daylight. Even though she doubted that the park would refund the unused day of cabin rent, she didn't really care. Sister had to fetch our clothes from the closet as I flatly refused to go near it. She had to use the flashlight. Many years later, I relocated to a town not too far from the park. Lots of locals frequent the park, but of course they don't really rent the cabins there. I have yet to find anybody who's heard of the ghost in cabin seven. I 
I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there, and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. 
thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed the cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in Old House, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, Good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing 
or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantle, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantle. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about 10 shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's and one day she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house. So I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife she's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down 
and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much, and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy, like she did my wife. I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear, that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's gonna be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away and please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below. And on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock. And while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death though, my mother never wound the clock again and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. 
I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click, followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks, and suddenly, the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. That sound I heard before wasn't grinding, it was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell, and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon, though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave. And then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs, and finally all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick-tock, tick-tock. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly, my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh, my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you, too. And we miss you. So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large century house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom, and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff, always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, 
meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat, so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it, and as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, so much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there. For a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could sense supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me, and while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal, so I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard, and I saw out of the corner of my eye my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, 
I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again and the current residents have stayed there the longest. A few years back, one of my best friends and business partner was, and still is, a single dad. His ex-wife was in and out of mental institutions for years, and he had sole custody of his two kids, a boy, age 10, and a girl, age 14. My friend had to travel to New York to oversee the multimedia setup for the auto show for the Ford display. I was back at the office with the programmers during the day, and I would stay with the kids each evening. Their house was a new two-story rental in the Woodlands, Texas. The development was built in a heavily wooded area just north of Houston. Weird stuff started happening the first night I was there. I was watching TV with the kids. The den lights would go off. The light switch was on the other side of the room. I went over and the switch was turned off. I thought it was a problem with the breaker or there was another light switch. But if there was another switch, who turned it off? I flipped the switch on, the lights came back on, and I went back to sit down. The lights went off. I walked back and I found the switch flipped back down to off manually. That disturbed me. This went on for a while. I asked the kids if this had happened before, and they told me that every now and then, the lights would go off. So now I'm trying to act unconcerned in front of the kids. Suddenly, there was a loud crash in the attic. I, we, went upstairs and opened the attic door to check. There was nothing in the attic. It was completely empty, and thus we had no explanation as to what had made the loud noise. I'm thinking that there's someone else in the house. Their mother had shown up unexpectedly before at their old house, but she was in jail at the time and supposedly didn't know this address. Things quieted down and it was eventually time to go to bed. I let the family dog in, a lab, checked all of the doors and made sure they were locked. And then I went up to the guest room, which was between the kids' bedrooms. I left my door cracked and I had just turned the bedside lamp off. As I was laying down, I saw the silhouette of a boy crouched down between the cable box and VCR lights on the other side of the room and myself. I thought the sun was getting ready to try to scare me. So, I turned the bedside lamp on and said, gotcha, but there was no one there. Then there was another loud crash in the attic. This woke the kids up and now they were scared. We then heard a door slam downstairs. I told them that it was a new house and noises happen. I also told them that I would sleep in the day bed out in the hallway. I made my rounds again and we all went back to bed. When I woke up the next morning, the kids and the dog were all asleep on the floor next to my bed. 
I still had four more nights to go. The next day, I got to the house as it was getting dark. The wind was starting to pick up, and all of the tree limbs were swaying. There was thunder in the distance. However, the kids seemed fine. I helped them with their homework and made dinner. No, we're not going to McDonald's again. And we all finally sat down to watch TV. The storm was worsening, and there was more thunder and lightning. The den in the house was huge, with large floor-to-ceiling windows, and the walls went all the way to the rafters. There was an interior balcony on the second floor that wrapped around three of the walls. There was an exterior balcony facing the backyard. You could see through the upper windows out to the lower part of the outside balcony. So now, the rain is coming down in sheets, the wind is blowing, and bursts of lightning are happening everywhere. Suddenly, the daughter says she sees something moving out on the balcony. I look up, and it looks like a pair of legs in dark pants scurry past one of the windows. I'm thinking, do I get the gun out of the master bedroom? But that opens up a whole new can of worms. So instead, I run up the back stairs from the kitchen to the second floor hallway and out through the balcony door. The wind is blowing cold rain right into me and I get soaked, but I don't see anyone on the balcony. I go back downstairs and tell them there's no one outside. Shortly thereafter, I tell them it's time for bed. The son goes right to bed and goes to sleep. The daughter is afraid of storms. The dog won't go into her bedroom and her cat is nowhere to be found. I tell her that I will sit with her until she goes to sleep. I bring a chair into her bedroom and set it on the left side of her bed. We talk about storms and I tell her about being in a tent in the army during really bad storms and how nice it is to be in a house for this storm. We both fall asleep. There's a loud clap of thunder, a flash of lightning, and I see a dark figure about five feet tall standing in the far corner of her room. I jump to my feet, but now I don't see anything. I don't want to wake her up, and so I carefully walk around her room and check the hallway. I slowly sit back down. I eventually doze off again. Later, I hear a noise and I started to look around. The cat is curled up on the foot of her bed and the dog is starting to lay down at my feet. The storm has passed and looking outside her bedroom window, stars are shining up above the tree line. I go lay down in the day bed out in the hallway and just as I fall asleep, I hear a door downstairs slam shut. It sounds like the kitchen door to the garage. I go downstairs. The kitchen door, door to the garage, and front door are all shut and locked. I start to walk over to the master bedroom suite, but something tells me not to go there. I head back upstairs and lay back down. What seems like seconds later, the alarm goes off and it's time to start a new day. I have to get breakfast going and it's my turn to drive school carpool. Most of the days in that house went about the same. All I know for sure is that something was wrong with that house. This is a very long story, but it's worth telling, and I hope I can find some answers. I live in the state of Georgia, in a rural town not too far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides two neighborhoods. It's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. show up seemingly without warning. I should mention that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. 
One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After he tingled, we walked back. This is when I noticed it, or rather heard it, the crunching of leaves. At first I thought it was one of the dozen cats on our property, until I realized that it was matching my steps. If I walked, it would walk. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is, and that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something, and then I saw some creature of some kind. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash. He ran in the door, whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I bolted the door, and I ran to tell my girlfriend what had happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it was probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away, but still nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their many dogs had gotten out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for, but he was curious, so he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was had followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind his house. Gun in hand, we went into the backyard scanning for something. We could hear it rustling, or maybe running, about a hundred yards away in the thick, swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. And then, it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing. And then, bam! All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly at, well, nothing. We never saw it. We never heard it get close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick. Too thick to run in, so what teleported silently in front of us and slammed into the gate? Spooked, we were about to run. But then, we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. A language sounded alien-like, but not a known language, that's for sure. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day cannot explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to the house. Not 10 minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and, of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac, and they all agreed that the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called, and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the report and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. That's how bad it spooked him. The next night, earlier in the day, my mother-in-law and a police officer for a town 40 minutes away installed two motion-activated trail cams along the wood's edge. They were brand new. Keep that in mind. Thinking maybe we would see something, we waited for nightfall. 
Later that evening, I went outside to feed our outdoor cats. That's when I heard it again, rustling. This time, not taking any chances, I ran inside and told everyone what I heard. They all piled by the back door and urged me to go out there and look. Reluctantly, I agreed. I took my flashlight and walked to the edge of the woods. Knowing that there was a trail cam covering this area, I figured if it got me, it would be on camera and my sacrifice wouldn't be for nothing. As I got to the wood's edge, I could still hear it rustling. I'm shaking at this point because I could tell it was maybe less than 15 yards in front of me. Everyone at the door was just watching me and could hear this thing. And then it was quiet. For a moment, it was gone. Or so I thought. Just as I'm scanning with my flashlight, trying desperately to see a normal woodland creature so I can laugh this whole thing off, boom, something fell out of a tree and hit the ground so hard that it shook the soil beneath my feet. It was so close that I was sure it was going to lunge out of the brush and snag me. I dropped my flashlight and ran the hundred yards back to the house in what felt like two seconds. I just kept screaming, Get in the house! Get the F in the house! as everyone was already scampering inside. They had heard and felt the thud too. Our neighbor Dave called my mother-in-law to ask what that loud crash was. For him to have heard it from well over 700 yards away is insane to me. Once the adrenaline died down, we realized that this happened right next to the trail cam. Problem solved, right? We got the evidence of this thing. The next morning, we checked the SD cards on the trail cam. Both of the cams had videos up until 11.47 p.m. The rest is corrupted. They were brand new trail cameras and brand new SD cards. We reset everything and set them back up. And to this day, we've still never encountered the creature again or caught anything on camera. Everything I'm about to tell you is true. Most of it happened between 2003 and 2005, with just a little bit of spillover. In 2003, I was a 20-year-old, recently single mother of a one-year-old son. When the father of my then child, now children, moved out, I had no desire to live alone in my apartment. So my two best friends, Heather and Jamie, moved in. Jamie also had a son who was a little over a year old at the time. The five of us made a little home and things were good. At some point, and I've tried so hard to remember how it all started, but I can't, Jamie, Heather, and I kind of became addicted to using the Ouija board. I had bought this board at Kmart for like $8 one year, and I think it was for that reason that I didn't take it very seriously. But boy, was I wrong. When we first started using it, I remained pretty skeptical, even as it began to tell us some pretty accurate and intimate things. Looking back, I always thought that Jamie was the one moving the oracle. I knew it wasn't Heather because at times she was legitimately afraid. One day, I fought with the father of my sons. Super upset and crying, I hopped in my car by myself and just went for a drive. At the peak of being upset and alone in the car, I said out loud, is this my destiny or am I supposed to fight to save this? I went home to the loving arms of my friends and as we did most nights, we got out the board. The very first thing the board said that night was, destiny changes with every breath. Neither of them could have possibly known what I had just said in the car because I didn't tell them. That was the point when my skepticism started to fade away. We continued to use the board pretty much every night, and it continued to tell us things that would come true. At this point, the entity had claimed to be our collective spirit guide, Ben. One night, we had a male friend at the apartment. He was asleep on the couch behind us as we sat in our circle on the floor around the board. Heather remembered something from that night that I did not until she mentioned it recently. She had felt a cold presence wrap around her arm and then shoot up her nose. She started to freak out, but as I already told you, 
She was the scaredy cat of the group. I was more annoyed than worried or scared. We convinced her to sit back down, and that's when the board said something about not being happy that our male visitor was there. Almost immediately, our visitor sat straight up on the couch and said, What are you bitches doing to me? He lifted his shirt, and he had several tiny handprints all over his chest and stomach. That was likely the point when I realized that we might be dealing with something a lot darker than what it was selling itself as. What I didn't know then is that it was about to get much worse. We went to the local library and got some books on the occult. We brought them home, but never looked at them. Until, one night, the three of us and the two babies had been out somewhere. We came home and put the boys in the playpen. I started running the vacuum. As I was vacuuming, I heard Heather and Jamie screaming hysterically. I stopped to find out what was happening, and that's when they told me that they had heard a very loud thump and then a child screaming bloody murder. They thought one of the boys had fallen from the playpen and gotten hurt, but both boys were still peacefully playing where we had left them when we went to check. As they're telling me this, I was suddenly overcome by the smell of rotten meat. I'm a bit of a neat freak, and therefore, there shouldn't have been anything to cause this smell. I started searching high and low for the source of the smell, but it seemed to keep moving every time I got close to it. Meanwhile, Heather had grabbed one of the roughly five books that we had picked up from the library, opened it to a random page, and started reading. She said, you have to come and read this. Annoyed, I replied, I can't stop until I find out where this smell is coming from. Very sternly, she said again, You have to come and read this. I looked at her, and she was ghost white with tears streaming down her face. I walked over and took the book from her. The first paragraph of the page to which she had randomly opened said, The scream of a non-present child accompanied by the smell of rotten flesh signifies the presence of pure evil. I wish I could tell you what we did in the following minutes. I don't remember. What I do remember is the next day we took all of the books back to the library and got a Bible. We brought it home, left it open on a chair in the living room, and left for the rest of the day. I'm not even a religious person, but it's funny what you'll do when you're scared. We never used the board in that apartment again. If that story is the cake, this is the icing. Fast forward to June of 2004. I had given birth to my second son in February. Jamie and I were living in a different apartment, and Heather was living with a boyfriend. Heather came to visit, and for whatever reason, after what had happened, I truly cannot explain why we chose to do it, we broke out the board. I only remember one question from that day. Heather said to the board, Jamie has a son, referencing me with my name said, I have a son. When will I ever have children? And the board replied, seven for you. So that became a running joke for the next several months. Like, haha, Heather's going to have seven kids. Fast forward again, this time to January of 2005. I live with my children in yet another apartment. Jamie has moved in with her now husband and Heather is living with a different boyfriend. I was laying in bed one night, and seven for you just popped into my head. Suddenly, it hit me. The board had said that in June, and it was now January. July, August, September. Seven months. Duh. Heather is pregnant now. I called her the next day to tell her that she was pregnant. She was very adamant that it was not possible. To shorten the back and forth we did for the next two weeks, yes, she absolutely was pregnant. She gave birth to her first son in October of 2005. Since then, we've done the math. She was only about two weeks pregnant when I first told her. Although we are all still friends, I don't know a lot about what they've experienced paranormal-wise in the years since. I know that Heather has had some pretty scary experiences in a house she lived in up until last year, where a previous tenant had committed side. I lived in the parsonage of a church for 10 years, and we had some pretty strange experiences there too, including a time that my younger sister and I watched a full grocery bag that was hanging on a doorknob lift off the door until it was completely horizontal and then drop back down. 
Even my skeptical mom saw shadow figures in that house. Now we are in a new house, and my son, remember the son who was one in the apartment? Yeah, he's almost 19 now. And my brother are having some unusual experiences in the basement, which is where their bedrooms are. I have pretty regular dreams, too, where I'm screaming at demons to leave my family and I alone. But that's probably nothing, right? Right? Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black, but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel, where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. 
I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse, eventually the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird, bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night, but I could see how they came to that conclusion considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room, and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them, and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general but who knows. I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile, 
deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day, and I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still. The birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent. So I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs, we prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar, to the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know, he whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, 
a low-frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs, and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just gonna pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was, your dad knows, I know, we all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was, and frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange, since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. 
Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, I might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her, because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home 
and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows.